Okay, I'll call to order the June 22nd, 2021 uh, meeting of the Placer County Board of Supervisors, and we will start with a flag salute led by County Council Karen Schwab. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, Karen. Okay, our first uh, item is the consent agenda, which is a list of many items taken together, um, but we're happy to pull any of those for individual discussion if uh, my colleagues or anyone in the public would like them pulled. And I know that Suzanne wants to pull 27E, and then Cindy, did you? 31A. 31A, so we'll pull those and discuss those uh, individually. Chairman. We'll move the balance, oh wait. Oh. Sorry, we may, it looks like we may have to, um, so let me check with these. Elizabeth, are you requesting to have an item removed from consent? Um, no, I am just raising my hand for public comment. Okay. <coughs> Daniel, are you looking to have an item removed for consent? No. All right, Chairman, we can take action. All right, now I will move <coughs> approval of the remaining consent agenda. Second. Motion Gore, second. Holmes, uh, roll call, please. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Why again? Yes, thank you. So let's take up 27E first. Um, and Todd, are you going to? Yeah, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have regarding the letters or proposal of those letters. Um, any? I thought we would just chat about it briefly um, because I think it's important for our community to understand what we're doing along with um, our assembly representatives. There's SCR 5 and ACR 46 that were um, letters written by Assemblymember Melendez and, and Assemblymember Kiley to terminate the current state of emergency related to COVID-19. And so um, I just thought it would be a good time for us to talk about the fact that Placer County is in full support of those letters. And um, I was kind of hoping Dr. Oldham might be here to speak on this because he, I think that- oh, good, He's actually good, on the good. call. Um, Good. Okay. So, 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 Rob, could you maybe give a brief overview of the intent of the letters and um, uh, what uh, the board is doing in effect by, if we approve this item, sending those letters? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually not familiar with the letters. Um, was not asked to comment other than I will say, you know, as far as the question of around emergency declaration, um, you know, emergencies often get declared as a way to access uh, state and federal resources. Uh, so whether an emergency declaration continues often has more to do with the, the nature of resources that are needed and how to best access them uh, really than the severity and scope of the emergency. Uh, so I think, for instance, uh, the campfire, I believe, is still declared as an emergency. Our local uh, tree emergency lasted for years. Uh, so certainly the, the situation with COVID is much more encouraging than it has been at any point in the last uh, 15 months or so. 
um, and we're currently transitioning from an HHS-wide response to one that's really more contained at the program level. So we uh, continue to pay close attention to the situation with COVID at the department level, um, especially due to the emergence of uh, the Delta variant um, is increasingly becoming the do uh, predominant uh, variant in, in the state um, in certain communities with very low vaccination rates, but um, you know, continue to monitor the situation very closely, but also are encouraged by the progress that we're making as a community. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, and then maybe I could just uh, briefly provide an overview on that um, with the um, onset of COVID uh, well over a year ago now, uh, this board um, was faced on several occasions with different decision points, but I think it was consistent amongst the five of us uh, through the whole time that we would have preferred, all of us can speak for ourselves, but I think, I think all of us, I certainly would have preferred local control as compared to state-driven control. And on several occasions, while uh, Supervisor Gore was chair, we sent letters to the governor expressing that and a greater desire to have flexibility to craft policy that would fit our particular needs in Placer County. And that Placer County um, was not the same as Southern California, the Bay Area, uh, and that the state-driven emergency order was predicated on the notion that um, the, the goal was to slow the spread rate of COVID so that medical capacity needed for the severely ill could be treated. And we always also thought that um, we could address that better here specifically. Uh, and if in fact the board did not implement orders statewide, county public health uh, had the authority to, to craft that, that policy. So I think all of us always felt starved uh, for lack of being able to do that ourselves and thus are in support of these um, letters. So um, I, I think that's an overview of where we've been over the last year and a half and um, happy to. Exactly, and, and I'm just wondering if it's possible that the board, we might be able to um, visit this issue at a board meeting more specifically and talk about the possibility or, or where our position might be on whether we would ever become um, a county that requires the vaccine passport or, um, you know, or how we, I don't believe we enforce the mask mandate, or the mask mandate is off anyway, but the uh, county did not enforce the mask <coughs> mandates in the past when there was um, the state mandate. So I, I think I'm trying to get at is that I would like for us as the board to speak out at a board meeting, have it as a, as a topic on the board meeting where we discuss this and put the minds at ease of our county residents that we are not going to um, become the vaccine passport enforcers that everybody's worried about, something it, like that. Yeah. We Maybe can. if I could add in here uh, a couple of things just for, for background. As the board is aware, um, last year uh, the county did um, have a, a proclamation of local emergency. And as the board is well aware, on September 8th, 2020, that was terminated. Um, even when that was in effect, uh, the uh, policy, if I should if that's a correct word to use, but basically there was no enforcement in this county um, when we had the local emergency or afterwards. Um, you know, what these letters are getting at, these are actually budget trailer bills um, because what, what the governor did is he may have taken the tier system away, but he did not uh, terminate the proclamation of state emergency, and that's what these trailer bills are after. Um, the, the proclamation of state emergency is what uh, allows the Department of Public Health in the, in the state to tear off of that for things like mask mandates and the things we're seeing now about if you're vaccinated, you don't wear them, if you aren't, you're supposed to wear them and that sort of thing. Um, so I just want to give a little background on that. As to whether we can prohibit uh, COVID passports, there's no proposal for, uh, for COVID passports. There's been a lot of talk about apps and that sort of thing, but there's no proposal. You know, the, the county as political subdivision of the state can only go so far within the, the police authority that's given to the board by the state. 
So we are somewhat limited. That doesn't limit the board at any point in stating its policy um, regarding any of this. And I did, maybe could add that one of the things the board did was um, request and had uh, testimony that lasted about two hours, um, including a Nobel laureate, um, but the epidemiologist from Stanford that managed for us our seroprevalence uh, study. Um, and we had a wide range of different expert opinions, but all of them expert. Uh, and it was with that, with, we hoped, I think, to craft policy that would, would fit our needs and make sure that we could address taking care of those who seriously needed COVID treatment, which was hospitalization, but also avoid, minimize uh, the excessive uh, restriction driven by state mandates that uh, injured uh, us in other ways, uh, sociologically, psychologically, schools, businesses, et cetera. So um, I, I think there are different ways, Suzanne, that we could perhaps clarify what uh, county philosophy is in light of the current concerns. And I'll point out that the board never discontinued having board public hearings. We continued having those throughout. They were restricted at first just to staff. Uh, socially distanced, but this is the first meeting we've had since we've had uh, more restricted meetings. Um, so it's great to see everybody back in the hearing room uh, behaving normally. And, and just for clarification, what was what we terminated was a pub, local public health emergency, not the local emergency that gave us the ability to identify federal and state funding. So when, as Karen alluded to, we're talking about the public health emergency that was uh, was terminated back in what September. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So just for clarity. Yeah. So the this this item simply is um, uh, consideration of the board uh, approving that. Uh, I sign and we send those letters on. on correct, the, correct. Yeah. And so I thank you for entertaining my. Sure. I just want, thought it would be a good time to talk about our policy, COVID policies in general, because we do have a lot of constituents that are concerned about actions that are happening in other counties that they're afraid it might happen here. Yeah. And I don't want to put their mind at ease that, yep. that it's not going to happen here. Thanks. Um, so is there anyone from the public who'd like to address this item? Just come forward and state your name for the record, please. I have a few things I need to pass out to you guys. Good morning. And, and specifically, the agenda item that we're discussing is uh, the board sending letters or not in support of um, assembly members um, and others uh, requesting that there be a discontinuance of the state of emergency by the governor. So, go Correct. Ahead. Yeah, a few things I have to say actually ties into that and speaks into that. Sure. And um, so let me start off with so the last board meeting i spoke Could you and state your name for the oh i'm sorry my name is jason wedge thank you and um a member of placer county and jim holmes district um last um, board meeting i spoke and i had three minutes so i had to rush through a speech that um i was barely able to get out so i want to start real quick with you guys with a um with a story that i'm sure you know um all you guys uh, can relate to or most of you guys so I'm a parent of four, um, two older children past the um, adolescent years, past the teenage years. And my two older ones, when they was going through those teenage years, you know, there are certain times I had to pull them back in and let them know who is in charge. Anybody that has teenagers well knows exactly what I'm talking about. So here I just want to emphasize that you, that, um, you guys, um, you know, are elected by us for us. And when you look at the county chain is that, you know, we're the ones that's in charge. So I don't mean that to intimidate you, but I mean that because um, we want to come alongside you. Um, we have a, a team of people that's probably going to be speaking behind me that are doing their research, their concerns, like you mentioned, um, the resolution um, or the thing that was passed in Santa Clara County. I have personal friends in Santa Clara County that has been harassed, that are losing their jobs. Their jobs are in jeopardy because of what is going on 
in that county. We don't want that to go on this county. And um, I just want to emphasize the last board of meetings when we brought up the bills that we were concerned with, this is kind of lining up to that that we brought up. And, um, and that same message was spoken in over 15 different counties um, last time. So this is just not a Placer County thing, but it's being spoken countywide across California. And that is something that we do not want here. And as you guys being elected officials, we want to come alongside you. We want to support you. But then again, we need you guys to do, to do your job is to speak out publicly, to come up with resolutions to guarantee us that this is not going to happen in this county, especially business owners here, because they went in business to make money. They're not in business to police their employees, which we're seeing is happening in other counties. You guys have the power to stop that here. You know, we are actually demanding a resolution like you guys talked about to encourage the community that is that is not going to happen here in Placer County. So again, I want to thank you for your efforts and um, continue to um, reach those resolutions that we that we're demanding. And um, and we'll probably follow up and speak to you guys individually on this as well. And then one more point real quick um, for my time ends out is that a lot of issues come up where we talk about funding. And I guarantee in this county, majority of the constituents will choose freedoms over funding. So keep that in mind as funding starts coming down. Thank you. Good morning. People know me as Salam. I, I want to just uh, uh, reiterate what uh, Jason said. I think it's important that the board. If, if Could the, you state your name for the record, please? So I'm going to be known as Salam. So, uh, what Jason said is important. It's not enough to uh, not pass such, you know, pa vaccine passports as they're being called, but to also come out against them. I think it's important f uh, for um, our local representatives to take that kind of stand if it becomes necessary. But what I want to do here is just I want to read from the government code a section that I think is uh, really important for everybody to understand. This was passed back in 1950. It's government code 1027.5, and I think it's more relevant today than it's ever been. Um, and, and I think when you when you hear this, uh, you'll you'll start to uh, recognize what's going on in modern times. Perhaps this is the legislature of this. This is government code 1027.5. The legislature of the state of California finds that there exists a worldwide revolutionary movement to establish a totalitarian dictatorship based upon force and violence rather than upon law. This worldwide revolutionary movement is predicated upon, and it is designed and intended to carry into execution the basic precepts of communism as expounded by Marx, Lenin, and Stalin. Pursuant to the objectives of, world of the world communism movement, in numerous foreign countries, the legally instituted governments have been overthrown in totalitarian dictatorships therein against the will of the people. I'm gonna fast forward here to, to part D, which says, within the boundaries of the state of California, there are active disciplined communist organizations presently functioning for the primary purpose of advancing the objectives of the world communism movement, which organizations promulgate, advocate, and adhere to the precepts and the principles and doctrines of the world communism movement. These communist organizations are characterized by identification of their programs, policies, and objectives with those of the world communism movement, and they regularly and consistently cooperate with and endeavor to carry into execution programs, policies, and objectives substantially identical to programs, policies, and objectives of such world communism movements. One of the objectives of world communism movement is to place its members in state and local government positions and in state-supported educational institutions. If this objective is successful, propaganda can be disseminated by the members of these organizations among pupils and students by those members who would have the opportunity to teach them and to whom, as teachers, they would look to for guidance, authority, and leadership. So there's more to it, but the basic idea here is that um, the modern version of what was happening back in the 50s that is now making this relevant today is this idea of critical race theory, which is permeating all of government and all of our policies, especially at a uh, national me, I, level. I'm sorry, that, that's not the agenda item. Uh, the agenda item is whether or not we should send these letters, and so I, if you could keep your comments specific to that. Uh, we would appreciate it. Well, again, I think it's relevant to any policy that we're going to be considering with regards to the stupid 19 pandemic, which is what I call it. But anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, Wesley Dill, Penryn, and uh, it's nice to pledge allegiance to the flag because it's supposed to mean something. It's supposed to mean we have a constitution that protects everybody against discrimination is the big thing. And all I hear is talk about, not necessarily from you guys, but talk about how government is not going to allow discrimination based on vaccine status and so forth and so on. But in fact, private businesses across the country are even being encouraged in lots of ways to discriminate against people who are not vaccinated, who won't wear a mask. And, and this is happening. We all know this. We can't deny it. So I would like to ask you guys to please take a stand and publicly say and pass a resolution that we won't allow mask mandates any longer. Uh, Fauci has lied through his teeth about whether they protect us against viral infection or not, and they don't. Study after study shows that they do not. Uh, he's lied about the availability of treatment, which is hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, budesimide inhalers, there's all kinds of treatments that would prohibit these vaccinations from being provided to people under emergency use. And then we get in the question of are the vaccines effective? For some people, they are. That's what the studies show. But what's the cost? You know, the cost is we have over 6,000 people dead after these vaccines. And you say, oh, Wes, there's millions and millions getting it. And that's true but we still have a pile of 6,000 bodies of dead people. We have kids with strokes getting permanent heart damage. We have Gillian Barr. We have all kinds of stuff happening, miscarriages. Right now, 82% miscarriage rate for five months or less. The normal rate is 10%. These are post-vaccination. These are facts that you don't see on CNN and NBC and all this stuff, but they're facts. So it's important in my mind that I please ask you guys to step out and risk upsetting some of your constituents who may not agree with the position that we're not going to allow mask mandates, we're not going to allow vaccine mandates, and we're not going to allow vaccine passports. It, I read a story this morning, it's like, in New York, they're going to have a Bruce Springsteen concert, and they're not letting people from Canada and Australia and all that who had the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not approved, they're not allowed to go to the concert. And they're in an uproar. It's like, well, what about the people who have had COVID? Shouldn't they be able to go to the concert? So this stuff's brewing, and there's a big push for to take away our freedoms. And I'm asking you guys to stand up and risk your positions and take a stand. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lori Richards. Um, I live in Penryn. Uh, some of you know Wesley and myself. Um, <clears throat> he's a lot better at speaking than I am. So this is difficult for me. Um, but when we we're doing the Pledge of Allegiance, I said liberty and justice for all. And I don't believe that's happening in our country and in this state at this point. I'm asking you to stop the medical tyranny that is occurring in California and throughout the country and the world. Stop these manda mask mandates for children in schools that are being forced to wear a mask for seven hours a day. And do you know that there were Florida moms who, because their children had rashes on their face, they sent the masks in for a mask spectrometry to see what's on those masks. And you know what they found? Half of the masks had one or more strains of pneumonia-causing bacteria. A third of them had one or more bacterial meningitis on them. A third had dangerous antibiotic resistant pathogens. And you know what they didn't find on those masks? They did not find any viruses. And that's because the virus can pass directly through these masks. These masks are not protecting our children. They're making our children sick. And for us to allow school boards to do such a thing to our children 
is, it's just so hard for me to believe. And I know what is going to happen next. There are going to be, they're not calling it a vaccine passport, they're calling it an app, but I know I will be discriminated against because I choose not to take a experimental vaccine. And under the Nuremberg Code, it says, I mean, they hung doctors for that in, in, in the 40s because of experiments that they were doing on people. That is what is happening across the world now. And we will be, once those vaccine passports or apps are out there, they will do what communist China is doing. They'll have a social credit score system. And if you do anything that they don't like, they will do just like communist China. They will stop you from having access to your money, stop you from being able to be in society. And we need to pass a resolution. Please pass this resolution that we are working on. Hi, good morning. My name is Lynette. I don't have anything planned this morning, and I'm sorry if I get emotional. I'm talking to you from a mother's perspective, and I hope that you listen, and I hope that you had a chance to review AB 262 and AB 389 and CMS 9115-F. Yolo County is now having vaccine mobile units go door to door and Santa Clara County has already passed a mandate that is forcing businesses between a rock and a hard place. They're pushing their employees to get an experimental drug by instituting segregation, discrimination, intimidation, and they're forcing their, their employees that don't abide by this false mandate to wear masks to show that they are not complying. That's not fair. And I know it's happening here at the county. I used to work for the county, and I decided that it was much more important to fight for my freedom and fight for my children, <gasps> excuse me, <gasps> than to work in an environment that is gonna force me to take an experimental drug or to force my children into an experiment. I implore you, to please listen to your constituents pass the, the resolution that we requested you to pass. And if you want to really listen and, and help your constituents, because we're doing this for you, we're doing this for your children, for your grandchildren, declare this a constitutional county and implore your sheriff. implore your sheriff to declare himself and this county a constitutional county. And if you want to abide by something, abide by the state constitution, abide by the United States Constitution, abide by Calgina, abide by the, the laws that are put in place to protect our health information and to protect our, our, our will and our choice and to protect our children. You know, there's ADA laws out there, there's Calgina, there's things that you can look into to protect your people. I appreciate that you're going to send those letters to the assembly, but that's not enough. You have to declare this a constitutional county and you have to let your people know by putting out a statement that masks are not forced. People should not have to wear them. Look at all of us, we're all healthy. You're healthy, nobody's wearing a mask. Does that mean that you've got the shot? Does that mean that that I can say that, you, that you're all protected. Could you wrap up your comment, please? Yes, please, please declare this a constitutional county by putting out a proclamation and have your sheriff do the same. Devin Bell, thank you. Good morning, board. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I just, um, I didn't have anything planned or anything, but 
I did not want to lose the opportunity to address you. Um, Suzanne Jones, I look at you because you prompted me this morning to get up, and I thank you for proposing uh, what I think you said, which is to have a, a meeting specifically for these kinds of concerns to you know, allow us to express our concerns more readily and for us to plan ahead, um, and so that we can work alongside you and support you in what you're doing. We thank you for your work, and um, I, uh, I applaud that you uh, are considering sending these letters of support, and um, what comes to mind is um, Edmund Burke's quote of the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, and you are going to do something by doing this and considering uh, having a meeting, a separate meeting, uh, to address all these other concerns. So thank you so much for your time, and I pray for you that you make the right decisions. Okay, thank you. Good morning, my name is Tina. I live in Roseville, so I'm in this Jones district. So the question on whether the board should sign the letters that have been put forth by Kylie and Melinda's of course you should. Why would you, why would you not? Everyone knows that COVID is no longer an emergency. And we have been telling you for at least a month now, I've been here twice before, and I know that many of us <laughs> have made public comment and uh, emailed and phone called our uh, reps directly, that we are watching the encroachment of tyranny across the country and in California, Santa Clara County, most directly, but now Yellow County going door to door, and we are freaked out, but that the legislation that has been passed in the last three or four years have led directly to this point and that it can be weaponized against us. So yes, as your constituents, we want you to sign those letters. We want the state of California to not be in a state of emergency. That's a really lovely first step but like everyone else has said so far, we want more than that. We want a public declaration from Placer County that businesses should not have signs up that tell people they have to wear a mask. We want businesses forbidden from requiring anything on vaccines, whether it's for their employees or for patrons who are coming in. We want you to make a formal statement to the school districts in Placer County saying that masks are not required, that social distancing is not required, that those stupid plexiglass boxes for the children are not required anymore. We need you to be a leader here in Placer County. We want more than just you telling us nicely that we would never do that here. We want something official, and we want to be part of the conversations that you are having on what that should look like. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Murray from Rockland. I first wanted to say thank you to all you have done over the last year. Um, you've really been leaders in this state and what you've done, so thank you. Um, I request that you sign the support letter to terminate the state of emergency. The emergency started with the false idea that our hospitals be, would be overrun and not until the virus was extinguished. Um, we all know this never happened and we never came close to our hospitals being overrun. The 14-day flatten the curve has come and gone, and another 450 days plus have as well. There is no emergency. It's time to move on. We have to take the power back from one-man rule. Please help to bring power back to the local levels and to the three branches of government in California. Please do sign the letter to terminate the state of emergency. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Skip Myers. I'm representing New California State, and the order of the day is audits. Uh, excuse me, the order of the day, the issue before us is whether or not we send these letters. Um, the comments that you probably are going to make, I think, will not uh, be related to, to the letters that we're considering sending, <clears throat> and those comments would be appropriate under public comment. Uh, the reason I would bring this up is that we are convinced by the evidence that there has been a fraudulent, fraudulent election uh, 
it's actually been perpetrated. And, and again, if you could maybe make your comments on our public comment, which is coming up next, but we've got a very long agenda and we have comments specific to the agenda item and it sounds like your comments are not, you'd be a chance to talk in just a couple of minutes, but not uh, under an item that's not related to what you're gonna say. All right, thank you. Yep. Uh, Jim Davis, Auburn. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would encourage you to sign the support letters and everybody on the, uh, the board that if you take future action regarding uh, anything to do with COVID that you do so to protect our individual liberties. Uh, we don't need to go down the path that Germany did from 1933 to 1945. We don't need passports. We should have our, our own it, it, it'd be up to each individual to decide how they want to handle this. I think we're doing a great job here in Placer County and I would encourage you to continue on. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Paul Gallo, I'm from Rockland. Uh, I don't think the question um, is, is worthy uh, that whether we should uh, have an emergency uh, or not. I think it's obvious from the people in the county who have spoken here today uh, that we don't want this emergency. Um, I believe I know most of you, and I don't think that you're going to vote against this letter. You should not. Uh, if you do, that means you're in favor of a political tyranny uh, versus what the people in this county want, and I don't think any of you will do that. So, I. Uh, I thank you all for, for presenting this, and I highly recommend that you uh, sign and send this letter. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close public comment on this item after the fellow in the purple shirt. Uh, we've had a lot of comment on just whether or not we should send these letters. We still have a very long agenda in front of us, and so if you could get in, keep your comments specific to whether or not we should send these letters, we'd appreciate it. Mine will be short. <laughs> My name is Jessica Hall, and I am a resident of Newcastle, California. And I really appreciate that all of you are taking up this discussion here today. It is so important. Um, and I just wanted to be on record that I am completely against any kind of discrimination, depending on your medical status, um, either to enter a business or to work at a business. I have a friend that works for CBS and they are requiring all their employees to get the vaccine by June 30th or they will lose their jobs. So this is, it's real, it's here. Um, people are being discriminated against every day already. So I would appreciate a formal resolution by the board. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Bill, I'm from Roseville. Um, everyone else, pretty much covered everything I was going to say. I didn't have anything prepared, but as for the letters, it's a good start. So I appreciate if you would sign them and send them. Uh, as Benjamin Franklin said, those who would give up their liberty for security deserve neither. Thank you. Thank you. And we have two callers on Zoom to address these letters. Lori, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Okay, hi, thank you for letting us speak and thank you for taking this up. I would also like to support the Board of Supervisors passing the resolution to support the end of the declared emergency and send those letters. Um, the 400 bed hospital that is currently in Roseville has not had more than seven COVID patients in the last four months. Also, I've gone to restaurants where they're starting to open and letting their customers in, and they still have to wear masks. The employees still have to wear masks, and they said only because of OSHA do they have to wear masks, and that is an unelected body telling them what to do. That is not a legislative body passing any law. So I really, really appreciate you sending these letters to help the freedom of Placer County. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the one, item between... One, sorry, Chairman, one more. <laughs> Margie, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Margie? It's 
technical difficulties. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so the item before the board is um, uh, whether or not we want to uh, approve sending them, and I'll sign them and send them off if we do. I'll, move, I'll move to approve. Uh, motion, Jones, second, Holmes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Our, our next uh, uh, consent item to be discussed is 31A, which is a temporary traffic signal road safety issue, and Cindy wanted that pulled. And yes, I don't know if Peter's here, or looks like not. <laughs> I am here. Great. I had a, a few questions on this uh, item for the Grove Street signal. Sure. So the cost doubled uh, in from the original projection, and I wanted to understand that. I also wanted to understand, um, because we were being asked to, to vote on this on consent calendar, and yet the Resort Association recommendation is coming later in today's agenda, I felt I think these were out of order, and so I think we need to hear that item first before we vote on this, but I wanted to be correct about that information as well. So Karen, can we uh, have, having pulled this, hold it uh, in abeyance uh, until such time that we hear? We can't, and that would be 19A, it's a department item, and we can hold uh, 31A and discuss that at the same, uh, can, at the same time together. So, so don't go far. Oh, sir. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, that completes our consent agenda. Uh, next is the time for public comment. This is the time when anybody from the audience can address the board on something that is not on the agenda, keeping in mind that we can take no action on that. So if you wish to do that, please come forward, state your name uh, for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Okay, Skip Myers again, uh, giving it another try. Sorry for the misunderstanding. No, no problem. Um, and this concerns audits nationwide. Uh, and I'm going to power through this. I may not be able to jam it into three minutes. Voter suppression and fraud are the nation's biggest challenges in Arizona, Michigan, Georgia, Wisconsin, Nevada, and now Colorado. Forensic audits of the November 3rd, 2020 general election are being ordered up and conducted to find the truth. Why? because the state legislatures of these states are doing their jobs to protect the integrity of their respective states' elections. The state's legislatures are charged with everything to do with elections and work with the proper sovereign county officials to ensure a free and fair election for all citizens. And where is the California legislature on the issue of voter suppression, fraud, and massive corruption in the California system? Crickets, and more crickets from the California legislature. Unfortunately for the 40 million people of California and New California for over a year, the state legislature has been absent from their duties, doing nothing to protect the interest of anyone except for themselves. Looking at these states and their audits, it's readily seen their election systems are almost duplicates of the California model. We're all familiar with the phrase, as California goes, so goes the nation. It's clear all the states in the United States did in fact follow California's model for the November 3rd, 2020 general election. After all, the California election model is bulletproof, the very best in the nation, shining star of honesty and integrity. Now these state legislatures are realizing the enormity of California's corrupt election system and are taking action with forensic audits. The evidence is overwhelming that 120 California state legislators have ignored their duties, violated the First Amendment, destroyed businesses, families, failed to educate the children, and misled and lied to the citizens of California while violating their oaths of office. If there are two words that best describe the last election from a national view and from a California view, the words suppression and fraud come to mind. Now it is California's turn to clear the rancid air surrounding the enormous election fraud in California with forensic audits of all 58 counties' election precincts, including Placer. Uh, 
There is an intent to suppress forensic audits. Voter suppression and voter fraud have been prominent features of California's political system as long as the monoparty has been in power. The light is now shining on this illicit activity nationwide. Undeniable forensic evidence of fraud and corruption is being produced and is being prepared to support the case for the decertification of illegal ballots. There are crimes upon crimes that are mounting, but justice is coming. And after all, it was a new California state legislature who at their own personal expense conducted 29 citizen committee hearings in more than 30 counties all over the state to listen to the concerns of the citizens between November 2020 through March of 2021. Uh, the California legislature never conducted any hearings outside Sacramento during the pandemic to hear the <laughs> plight of their constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning again. Uh, I just want to come up and thank you all for unanimously agreeing to send those letters. That's progress. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to, again, echo what Suzanne Jones proposed uh, about having a separate meeting to give us uh, more opportunity then to address the concerns of your constituents that have been expressed this morning. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, could you state your name for the record? Please? Sandra thank you. from Placer County. Yeah. Good morning, Tina, again. Um, I wanted to first say thank you very much for taking all of those barriers off of the chairs and opening the building. That was really encouraging from the last time that I was here when we only had about half of the chairs available. So, it, it was our pleasure you. to do it. So awesome, thank you. I feel like maybe we're being heard and we're communicating, it's lovely. Um, uh, Ms. Wood, yesterday I emailed you with some documents I wanted the board to have, but I know it was kind of last minute. I have hard copies if they were provided to the board and they have them on the dais. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So this was just a resolution that Peter Hernandez, who is a, a member of the San Benito um, Board of Supervisors, is presenting to his board today. And so I thought the wording on this was really strong and perfect, and I'd love to just see Placer County swap out some names and implement this one, but I was just hoping that you would at least include this document in those conversations and um, maybe even just using it as a model so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that was just wanted to make sure that you had extra information there. Thank you. Good morning again, Salam. Um, I want to apologize. I didn't realize that that wasn't public comment before, so. That's why I had made my comment. But um, what I do want to say is it's great. I really appreciate what the board is, has been doing. I appreciate that um, for the most part, they um, Placer County remained open throughout this nonsense. But what's happening is the businesses are receiving pressure from the state. And the corporations, the large corp chain corporations in particular, are the ones that are really being tasked with enforcing what I consider a communist subversion of the principles of this, of this Republican uh, nation, this, re this Republican form of government that we have. And what I think is going to be important going forward is for the uh, counties all across the count, uh, California and the, at the local level or the local bodies to recognize this and to um, pass ordinances that prevent businesses from requiring things like vaccine passports, the continued wearing of masks, et cetera. Um, on the uh, vaccine passport issue itself, I, I don't believe that that's ever going to be an issue here, and I, I, I uh, appreciate that. But uh, I just want to point out that Section 7 of Article uh, of the uh, Article 1 of the, of the Constitution of California, our, our Bill of Rights, Section 7B says a citizen or class of citizens may not be granted privileges or immunities not granted on the same terms to all citizens. So on the face of it, such a thing as vaccine passports in any form that they're presented would be unconstitutional. And so again, I, uh, really what I want to uh, uh, emphasize is that you have the authority at the local level to prevent businesses from mandating these sorts of things and that's the kind of um, action I'd like to see um, that needs to be taken now because this is what's um, 
these, this is what's preventing us from getting, going back to normal is uh, these businesses that are enforcing these mandates that they're getting from, uh, from at the state level or through their, through their uh, corporate, um, uh, corporate boards uh, outside California. Thank you. Thank you. Again, my name is Jason, and um, I want to start off also and thank you for hearing us um, and um, so quickly um, prepare to vote and send out these letters that go against our basic constitutional rights this morning. So I implore you, and I thank you for that. And I just want to regenerate with you guys that um, us as a group, your constituents of Placer County, we don't want to be against you. We want to align with you every step of the way. We are willing to meet with you. We are willing to do the research, whatever it takes, that this county can remain safe and against tyranny. So with that said, um, we have several here that have walked away from careers. We have several here that their careers are on the line. My job is on the line, coming here, taking time off again and again. But I'm okay with that. Um, just a brief history of me. I've been, you know, all throughout Asia as a missionary. My wife is Filipino and served in the mission field for many, many years and has seen and lived and grew up of what we do not want this county to come to. I know not everybody feels the same, but me and my wife and our family, we are willing, willing to put everything on the line to gain everything. We would rather live in a tent in DeWitt Center with our freedoms than live in our house without our freedoms. So keep on being encouraged when we reach out to you, answer us, and um, we want to align with you every step of the way in this county. We believe in this county. We want this county to be the first county recognized in California as a constitutional county. We want we want Sheriff Bell to be recognized outspokenly the first constitutional sheriff in this county. I had the privilege to meet Sheriff Mack last week up in um, Nevada County. A great man, and, um, and I hope that this county can come, come alongside that and Sheriff Bell can come alongside that as well and publicly declare uh, what we want. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Wesley Dill, Penryn again. Um, I am not privy to all the rules and regs and laws and stuff that you guys have to follow, and I don't pretend to be. Um, I know that you don't want to go into private businesses and tell them how to run it, um, and I understand that. And there's a, should be minimalized, should be. However, when they begin to discriminate, whether that's Sutter or Kaiser or CVS or whoever, uh, I think that does warrant intervention, and I hope that you guys would do that. Lori and I traveled quite a bit last summer. Uh, we were in a lot of states where we didn't have the California Nazi lockdown, and then we came back to Placer County wondering what it would be like, and it was like an oasis, a breath of fresh air going, okay, these guys are getting it right. They're actually uh, doing what you know America's supposed to be about, and I hope that we can continue that. Um, and I appreciate it, what you do. I don't always agree, but I do overall appreciate you guys. And thank you. Is there anyone on Zoom? Alex, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, good morning, members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Alex Morolatos. I am the general manager and owner of the Morolatos Lakeshore Resort in Tahoe Vista, California. Um, I have lived here for 17 years and have served this community on many boards and committees. I currently served as a, serve as an elected board member to the North Tahoe Public Utility District, but I'm here today speaking to you as a lodging provider. 
uh, we are now over the year, sorry, over the years, I have watched this board approve significant investments in our tourism economy in North Lake Tahoe. Marketing, visitor information, infrastructure, transportation, and some recent commitment to workforce housing. We are now in a situation where all that investment is in jeopardy. The economic and marketing impact of our current employee housing issue or issues will compromise the progress we have made to make North Lake Tahoe a series of livable, walkable communities where the visitor and community member experience a full set of service offerings. It is June 22nd, approximately 10 days before the 4th of July holiday weekend, and your North Tahoe community lacks the workforce housing to attract and retain our mid-level workforce. Our seasoned employees with supervisory and management skills can no, cannot find a place to live or are paying very high rents, disincented, disincenting them to stay. I'd like to reflect on the impacts of the pandemic on our economy to emphasize my points. The population of full-time residents has increased significantly, and there is no indication demand to escape to this mountain community will wane. Second homeowners have displaced existing long-term renters as they have now moved in, rightfully so. Those same second homeowners also have put their second homes on the market, effectively displacing those same seasoned workers. And this workforce is economically excluded from the buy market for the, for the most part, unless they receive some type of financial assistance. To add to that, the visitor population has expanded and this windfall will not abate. The pandemic has broken the weekend barriers of stay. Lodging saw its largest October ever in 2020. This May of 2021 was outstanding and we are calling June of 2021 the new July. People are coming to Lake Tahoe based on so solely on the weather and less on work and school constraints, as all have learned to telecommute. Businesses are already struggling. Restaurants are the front line. Many have been forced to compromise their offerings, reducing menus and closing on high demand days due to a lack of staff already. I, I'm sorry, Alex, could you, could you, you've been over three minutes now and we've got a long agenda. Could you wrap Yes, up? sir. I would just state to listen to your constituents. There are abundance, there is an abundance of solutions out there and resources available to implement them. We need you to turn towards us and allow us and, and support the solutions that need to be brought forward to address this issue long-term. I appreciate the time, sorry for going over. No, th thank, thank you, Alan. Uh, just one second. Um, do we have somebody else? We have four yeah. more. Okay, we have four people who are called in on Zoom, so I'm going to take those first. Danielle, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak with you this morning. For the record, my name is Danielle Hughes, a community member of Carnelian Bay, a director of the North Tahoe Public Utility District, and a member of your essential workforce of Lake Tahoe. I'm here today to express my concerns on affordable housing and the workforce housing crisis that we are facing. I know that as elected officials, you understand that workforce housing is essential for building strong communities, strong businesses, and a strong local economies. Yet our communities and employers alike are finding it increasingly difficult to hire and retain employees due to the scarcity of reasonably priced housing and the seasonal demands of a tourist-based economy. This has been exacerbated by COVID-19 with already astronomical housing prices, further becoming further out of reach to those who have longstanding history in supporting the vitality of our communities. I continue to hear from our local grocery clerks, pet store owners, restaurants, hotels, and even government staff 
that housing in Lake Tahoe is not an option within their reach. We have a housing market serving the wealthier groups able to sustain Bay Area wages working remotely, second homeowners, and vacation rentals. While those at the bottom of the and middle incomes are most affected, the housing crunch hits every demographic. Land scarcity and other factors such as permitting process encumbered by environmental regulations means an inadequate housing stock in the area. Many of those employees are having to live out of their cars, tents, and RVs in business parking lots and on forest lands or on others' couches, desperately trying to hold on to their place in this community, while others just find themselves having to leave. We are in a crisis, and the time for a creative solutions is now. Our businesses are closing their doors. Our nursery can no longer operate on Sundays and Mondays. Our hardware stores and restaurants have also had to shut their doors on certain days. Our schools cannot find teachers or bus drivers, and many local businesses have moved permanently to other communities because they can no longer sustain the personnel and financial burdens to their businesses going. Yet the increased visitation, changing trends in population not captured in the recent census and the demand continues to increase. Our workforce is the lifeblood of our communities. I urge you to think outside of the box and advocate for solutions that work for our region and understand that we don't fit the typical solutions being brought forth both at the state and federal levels. We don't rank well for, for many of the discretionary funding sources to support housing. We have land constraints and a high visitation demand that create concerns with local services and communities bringing forth additional housing and escalating costs of construction make your job extremely challenging, but we must find a solution to this very complex problem. Perhaps we need would, to would you, consider both temporary and solutions because the impacts of not doing so are affecting us now and will continue to have detrimental impacts that the, the, to those we are here to serve. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Emily, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Thank you very much. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Emily Vitus, Executive Director of the Truckee Tahoe Workforce Housing Agency, representing our member agencies of the hospital, school district, utility district, and airport. I'm calling on behalf of the agency to express great concern for our current housing landscape in the Tahoe Truckee area. And I'd like to start with two quotes from members of our Tahoe Truckee workforce and business community. This is my community. I had both my children in this community. I've lived here over 25 years and have moved 14 times. As a small business owner, I know many people by first and last name, and I always found housing through connections. But now we are looking for housing again since our landlord is selling his home and it's just different this time. And the second, even with moving every two years, it wasn't until now that I've ever thought about leaving the area or felt like I might not be able to stay. I've always found housing through connections and people caring so deeply to help one another out. But right now, no one has anything to offer. Even with caring and connections, there's just nowhere left to live. Now, these are people that help our region run, and there are hundreds more stories just like this. Since the agency founded in early 2020, the housing situation has become even more dire. 25% of survey respondents from a recent regional housing needs survey stated, that they have been displaced in the last two years due to their home being um, sold or the homeowner wanted to use it in a different way. The Workforce Housing Agency knows that this means that 40% of our employees who rent are at great risk of losing their homes at any time. Some of our region's most crucial employees are picking up and leaving, they're living in their cars, they're staying in unsatisfactory housing situations because they have no other options. How do our public agencies continue to perform our crucial service to the community when we can't fill our open positions? Our hospital currently has over 100 positions open and they're struggling to fill them. This is up from an average of between 20 and 30. The hospital needs qualified professionals for the positions, yet there's nowhere to house them. The Workforce Housing Agency and our regional partners are doing everything that we can, but we really need help. We're at a very serious tipping point. I'd like to urge the board to take this very seriously and consider every option available to accelerate housing solutions in Tahoe, Truckee. 
many communities are considering or have implemented emergency housing ordinances or proclamations. And I ask you to please look at what others are doing and consider actions that can help move solutions forward more quickly. This is an emergency and we are already there. Thank you for your ongoing efforts and considerations on this matter. Kylie, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Kylie? Oh, good morning. Good morning, Chair Wygant, members of the board. Good morning. My name is Kylie Bigelow, Executive Director of the Tao City Downtown Association. I'm here today to share some concerns about the current housing crisis taking place in North Lake Tahoe. The crisis is dominating every conversation I have with my board of directors and local business owners. This housing crisis is having a huge impact on our community and the success of our businesses. Despite being busy season, many businesses are closed one day a week or have limited hours due to lack of staff. Cumulatively, this has a huge economic impact. There are hiring signs up and down downtown Tower City in almost every window. This isn't just affecting the service industry, it's affecting teachers, hospital staff, PUD staff, Placer County staff, and it goes on. Homes are selling and renters are being asked to leave and the affordable and available housing just keeps getting harder and harder to come by. Our community is diminishing as locals are being priced out of housing. And at the same time, visitors continue to come to Tahoe in high numbers. We lack the local infrastructure and workforce to provide a welcoming and supporting visitor experience. This is frustrating for everyone. I know Placer County is working on long-term housing solutions like encouraging more ADUs, launching a deed restriction program, taking steps towards a housing at Dollar Creek Crossing, but the solutions won't make a dent in the issue quickly enough. I implore your board to consider emergency housing programs. I wanna share some ideas that have come from conversations with business owners. First, consider incentives to property owners with vacant property to be used for workforce housing now be it lodging, offices, private homes, et cetera. Another idea is designated campgrounds in the area for those workers that are already car camping, living in their vans or RVs to have a safe, clean and dependable location to camp this summer. I'll leave it to the housing experts to provide more short-term solutions. This, is, this crisis is an uphill battle, but we need some help now. I did invite other business owners to be here today to provide comment, but um, I don't expect them to be here because they are covering the shifts for their employees. Um, if you spend any time at a restaurant in Tahoe City, you will see our owners busting the tables. Not like they haven't always done that, but um, it's, a, it's a crisis. Our owners, our business owners are having some of their employees live with them. Um, I've never seen anything like this. So um, we ask for your support. Thank you so much. Tara, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Great, thank you, Megan. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Tara Zawardo, Project Director of the Mountain Housing Council. I wanted to provide public comment concerning our housing challenges as well, and to announce that we will be holding an emergency housing solutions meeting this Friday, June 25th at 8 a.m. in order to brainstorm on immediate solutions. The housing crisis in our region, as others have pointed out, is getting worse year after year, and recent real estate activity has resulted in us losing more housing than ever before, creating an acute situation. A number of locals in Placer County and surrounding areas have been displaced and cannot afford the few homes and rentals that come onto the market. These are just a few of the excerpts from the daily barrage of pleas that we receive. We represent another family being displaced and soon to be homeless due to our current long-term lease of four years being sold. We are longtime locals born and raised here and hate to leave. We have good steady jobs and great rental records, but we are being forced out because our owners have decided to sell. I am a local teacher losing my rental. I will be living out of my car this summer. Our reality is a significant amount of the housing in our region is still unavailable to local employees. As a result, their choice is find rentals far away and commute in, although these rentals are also disappearing quickly, or don't work here at all. This is causing our local businesses to suffer. 
They are unable to prevent high turnover rates. They are in a constant panic that our, their businesses will not survive. They have to create modified work schedules to work with bare bone crews, and they often cannot operate seven days a week and instead have to, no choice but to close. Infrastructure suffers and local services vital to operating our economy and keeping our citizens safe are unavailable as a result. This is reflected in the hundreds of currently unfilled job postings, countless service technical and professional positions, customer service, cooks, painters, administrative workers, some are counselors and seasonal workers, housekeepers, carpenters, teachers, engineers, hospital workers, and so many more. Each individual who has commented on housing today is part of the Mountain Housing Council. Four years ago, the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation launched the Mountain Housing Council as a regional collaboration in order to come up with urgent housing solutions together. We need help and we must act collectively. As I mentioned, this Friday, June 25th at 8 a.m., we will be getting together to brainstorm on these emergency housing solutions with all of our partners. We will explore what other mountain towns are considering, such as declarations of emergency, temporary workforce options, moratoriums on short-term rentals, and more. Thank you, Board of Supervisors, for your continued focus on our acute housing challenges. I hope this provides you with a window into what is happening, but we can, of course, provide you with any additional information as well. Thank you. Okay, Megan. Um, I'm going to take, in light of the lateness of the hour and the long agenda that we have, I'm going to, we have board has a policy whereby if uh, public comment extends too long, we will continue public comment until the end of the meeting. I'm guessing that's going to be four to five o'clock. So if you have public comment to make at that time, uh, we'll be here and be available to take it. And with that, we'll take up uh, our board and county exec reports. I just want to start off by saying that um, Stan to Brian, if he's still here, but our condolences board, we had a, uh, a fire accident injury. Uh, Bobby Breyer was uh, seriously hurt, but apparently is doing very well. So on behalf of the board, I want to extend um, our support uh, to him and his family. And that's all I have, but do any other, Bonnie? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Very quickly, in regards to the comments that were made by our folks up in Tahoe, uh, I had an opportunity to have a conversation with uh, the Placer People of Faith together, and they have been working on how do we address um, housing needs for our community members here in, really, in the mm -hmm. South Placer area. We have a lot of students, like college students from Sierra College, who don't have places to live. So fast forward, Placer People of Faith together, they were able to get funding from the Area Aging, Area 4 Aging Organization. Agency. I can't remember how to say it. But they got funding for this new program called the Home Share, Home Share American River. And the idea is to actually match uh, landlords, renters, or people who have an additional room in their home with folks who are looking for a home to rent and sort of do a match matchmaking process to benefit both the homeowner and those who want to rent. Um, it's going to kick off on July 1st, but I really think that we need to wor work with our housing team and figure out how we could actually do this up in uh, the North Lake Tahoe area because there's a huge need here in South Placer, but even a larger need up in North Lake Tahoe. So I'm going to reach out to them and I think we could look at maybe perhaps extending some additional resources for that program up in North Lake Tahoe. Cindy? Um, thanks, Bonnie. I uh, appreciate that. Um, we do have a company up in North Lake Tall called The Landing that Placer County has contracted with as well to look at home sharing programs. But going back to uh, the, the individuals that called, on June 1st, I sent an email, uh, and many of those were included in my email, requesting this urgency uh, meeting that's happening on Friday. So I'm so glad it's happening. And in that email, I suggested um, temporary <coughs> solutions for summer operations. Um, Ketchum, Idaho has put up a tent city in their city, allowing employees to work uh, to camp there. We, um, I also made some other suggestions of items that we should be talking about on Friday morning. So, uh, But along with that, I want to commend our county staff because Shauna Purvines, Emily Setzer, uh, and others, uh, Crystal Jacobson and Karen Schwab have been working with me on potentially bringing forward uh, urgency ordinances on this issue that you might see hopefully uh, at our July meeting in Tahoe. 
Um, but I did request the initial meeting on June 1st. Uh, I was just going back in my emails as to when I sent that. And so I'm so glad we're getting the community together. It is absolutely uh, beyond a crisis. We've had a crisis for a while on housing, but it has become um, just a, a catastrophe of factors that have come together that home values are so extraordinarily high right now that anybody who had um, an investment property is selling it and there there's just displacing people I know uh, in talking to Sheriff Bell that we are vacant for sheriff's deputies so it, it's affecting all levels of employment um, from our uh, dishwashers up to our Placer County professional staff and employees uh, talking with the Ritz Carlton last week uh, they're busing people in from Reno uh, trying to find employees to keep their doors open uh, the Hyatt and Incline is only going to open for lunch for in-house guests they can't serve the general public because they're short on folks so um, it is really impeding the service levels um, I did have dinner the other night with Stacy Corliss Supervisor Corliss from Mono County and she approached me about the concept of uh, should we be reaching out to the Forest Service about what's available on their lands because so much of the visitation that we experience and need to serve are coming uh, to recreate in public lands. So I think there's a lot of us talking, what can we do this summer? Hopefully some small steps, but definitely um, this is a trend that's not going away and we have to address. So just wanted to give the board that report and more to come. You might see something at our July 20 seventh meeting thanks Cindy. Suzanne no I have nothing to report oh okay sorry and Todd do you have anything um, I don't have anything yep thanks okay with that we'll take up our 915 timed item which is our annual update on it's not funny <laughs> from our <laughs> mosquito abatement uh, district <laughs> Hi everybody, good morning. I'm good Megan Lovano. I'm the Public Information Officer. I'm here with Joel Bettner, our District Manager. Thanks for having us. We're gonna give you our annual mosquito update. Um, so I like to start with just a reminder of who we are, especially for some of the public that's here. We're an independent non-enterprise special district in Northern California, one of the youngest. We're governed by California mosquito and vector control law. We have um, 22 full-time staff. We have a seven-member board of trustees. Um, Mary Holiday Hansen, Dr. Mary Holiday Hansen sits on our board. She represents Placer County as a whole. And then we have representatives from all the different cities. Um, and then we hire seasonal employees during the summer. Our mission is to effectively and efficiently manage the risks from vectors and vector-borne disease in order to protect public health in the county. Um, this is just a map of the entire service area, all of Placer County, and then the different vectors and diseases we handle in the different areas. So in West Placer, we deal with mosquitoes and West Nile virus. Mid Placer, we're still dealing with mosquitoes, not as much West Nile virus, and then ticks and Lyme disease. And then up in East Placer is where we see yellow jackets and then rodents. So what we do, everything we do, we follow an integrated vector management approach. And then these are the activities that kind of fall beneath that. So vector and disease surveillance, chemical control, biological and physical control, that's our mosquito fish program, community outreach, which is what I handle, technology and innovation. We have a drone program we've had for over five years now, and then applied research projects. So everything we're doing to be more efficient and effective. We haven't seen you since 2020, so this is just an overview of our activities from last year. So we did 13 drone applications. We hired four seasonal staff members. We had 57 aerial and ground-based larvicide and adulticide treatments. And as a reminder for you and then also the public, to get those notifications, you could sign up to get emails um, on our website. And we email out the notifications of when we're doing either aerial-based or ground-based treatments um, to the public who are signed up on those emails. We did 92 Good Neighbor Project service requests looking for invasive Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. So in 2019, we detected these mosquitoes for the first time. Um, the importance of these mosquitoes is that they have the ability to transmit diseases like Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, and um, Yellow Fever. We don't have those diseases in the county right now, but the issue is that these mosquitoes can have the ability to transmit those diseases. So we didn't find them in 2019, or we found them in 2019. We did not detect them in our county in 2020. 
although surrounding counties did. So we're doing enhanced surveillance right now, looking for those mosquitoes. Some of our surrounding counties have already detected them early in the season. So we'll be keeping you updated if we do find them in our county. Um, and then last year, we also had 58 positive West Nile virus mosquito samples. A few things we did while we weren't out in the community in 2020, we updated our website. So it's now a lot easier for the public to use, get resources, and then submit problem reports. So that's something we do offer them. Um, we took our school outreach program and made it digital. So we usually go out to um, schools throughout the county doing an assembly-based program. So we ended up recording all of our assemblies and then sending those out to local schools. So we're hoping we'll be back in person um, next spring back with our assembly program. But now we have a whole library of um, different content for these students throughout the county. We also took really complicated information that's hard to uh, explain to the public and broke it down into whiteboard videos. So um, this is about Anopheles freeborni. It's a rice field mosquito that West Roseville really deals with. They don't transmit disease, but they're aggressive biters. So this is just a video we broke down to explain the difference between nuisance mosquitoes and then mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus. So who do you call? Um, we created this slide because we get a calls about all sorts of things at our office, um, but this breaks down the different things we deal with specific, specifically. So we deal with surveillance of mosquitoes, ticks, and yellow jackets, Placer County Animal Services, who you call for lost dogs, cats, and dead animals, Placer County Public Health, that's for your communicable diseases, and then private pest control, spiders, cockroaches, and rodents, and then anything inside your home. Joel is gonna continue. All right, thanks for having us. It's nice to be back. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of skip to the chase in the interest of time. Um, obviously, we're, um, we've been here for a long time and I think we've been fairly successful in protecting the county. Um, I always get the question at the end, so what does it look like for this year? And um, so I'm trying a little different tact. Um, the risk of jinxing us and making it a really bad year, I'm gonna say that's probably gonna be a pretty bad year. Um, with drought conditions, uh, we typically see higher West Nile virus transmission because the mosquitoes and the birds that have the virus and even the people are all congregating around uh, scarce water resources. Um, and what we've seen so far this year is where mosquito abundance curve. So the mosquitoes overwinter in various places depending on the type of mosquito and when the, the water is available and when the heat of the summer is available, uh, which happened about a month early this year, the mosquitoes take off. So we're seeing about uh, two or three weeks uh, ahead of time for uh, mosquitoes. We're expecting to see our first West Nile uh, detections probably this week or next, if I had to guess. Um, and uh, we're, we're ready to deal with it. Um, so um, as Me Megan mentioned, um, our, our efforts are basically to prevent. That is the most cost effective and most actually effective way. So we're trying to minimize the number of uh, adult mosquitoes. Uh, we're trying to um, let folks know what they can do to protect themselves. So wearing repellent and draining water, we help facilitate those things. Um, and then we answer questions since everyone in different county, in different parts of the county at different times of the year, mosquitoes aren't just mosquitoes. They're, there's 30 different species, they're, they're different. So we're here as that resource to help kind of problem solve through that. Um, and then finally, we uh, detect areas that are particularly bad, uh, per, um, creating a risk for the, for the public rather. Um, and we address those by uh, doing some uh, responsive uh, control measures. So uh, we're, we're all ready to go this year, just like we have in the past. And uh, moving forward, I do have to sympathize with some of the comments about housing. And uh, up in Tahoe, we uh, were not able to hire a, a seasonal employee up there. So that's kind of stressing us out or stressing my, my Tahoe staff out a little bit, but we totally understand. Um, and then uh, we are trying to innovate with um, technology and, and uh, trying to basically do, uh, do what, we, what we do better with the resources that we have. So that goes towards our drone programs and some of our data management systems, trying to be a little bit more efficient and, and use our funds as effectively as we can. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Suzanne. Yes, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. This is a little bit off the topic of mosquitoes, mm -hmm. but you're a vector control and I noticed that you address a number of things. Mm -hmm. I'm having constituents contact me um, because of cockroach infestations 
Have you guys also been yeah. contacted? Yeah, we get a lot of those calls. Unfortunately, our, our focus is our vectors, which carry disease that are community-based. So our funding is tied to mosquitoes, yellow jackets, ticks. Um, and then we do some rodent work where it, like uh, we support the state doing plague and hantavirus surveillance, which is very uh, time consuming up in the Tahoe area. But we don't do anything that's inside houses. That is really the, the uh, area for like the paid pest control structural oh, okay. pest control folks so you'd recommend they just contact yep. the pest control yep that would be the best way and we do we do get a lot of calls about you know renters saying my landlord's not helping us this sort of thing and there's not a lot we can do physically but we do uh, we can provide them with some resources um, just since cockroaches came up they seek water and especially during a drought there's not very much so if there's a leaky pipe or your hose bib or something's dripping that's where they're going to go and if there's leaks in your house then you're going to see more cockroach activity when it's all nice and lush and everything's uh -huh. watered out and they're all over the place and you don't see them as much so yeah i have one in particular that came <coughs> that he said their their backyard is inundated yeah and he said at night the lawn looks like it's moving because it's kind of creepy oh crawly oh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, I want people to be on the lookout, um, address it quickly. Maybe if we all get on it. We yeah, not to be uh, not to be dismissive, but uh, there are a lot of things that go on at night in your backyard that you may just not want to know about, like you know, uh, I'm, I'm so, kind of with regard to insects. Uh, that's yeah. all I'm saying. Well, I lived in Clarify. Texas. I lived in Texas for three years, and they had a similar yeah. problem every summer. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Thank you for that. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments by board members? Is there anyone from the public who'd like to address this item? Please come forward, state your name for the record. Hi, uh, Tina again. I am part of several online communities for women in agriculture, and the um, what I'm hearing from them is that ticks have gone berserk this year as well. So um, I heard you speak again about the mosquitoes, but yeah, I'm curious about um, what you're seeing with ticks and then any suggestions. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, ticks, um, as I mean, in the media nationwide, ticks are a huge topic right now. Um, fortunately for us, I'll give, give you the good news first, is most of that is coming from the Northeast and the Northern Midwestern states like Michigan. So that part of the country is seeing huge increases in ticks that carry uh, Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. In California, we're not really seeing that, although we're concerned and we're monitoring it. So in Placer County, what we do is um, we do regular tick surveillance in um, mostly in the in the foothill areas, in um, you know, basically trails that are popular, right? So we, where, where the most number of people are out. Um, we monitor that. We test the ticks in uh, in our lab. And uh, we just try to see if we see any deviations from kind of the normal amount of, of disease load in those ticks. So ticks carry Lyme disease. Lyme disease is here. It's always probably always has been. Uh, but how it gets into the people and what risk it, it serves is a little bit less clear. So what we do is we, uh, we know our baseline is around 2% of the ticks that we collect have Lyme disease. But we don't see huge spikes in numbers of people getting sick as long as those that level is is maintained if that makes sense so what our goal is to basically just monitor and if we see something that looks surprising we'll we'll take steps to inform the public and and do other things we don't do tick control because it's kind of not feasible um, you can't go out and spray for ticks it you'll kill everything right so that doesn't really work very well um, during the summertime, there are also a lot of ticks, the dog ticks, but those don't carry diseases that we currently have in California. So that's a little bit of a different, different species. Um, all of our tick information is on our website, and I would encourage folks to look at that. And um, you can call us, and we will do an ID for a tick if someone has one. Uh, but we don't test ticks for, pe for people that bring them in. We only do our own. Um, but there are resources that you can send them off uh, for a fee uh, that other places can do that if that's something that uh, the public's interested in. Yeah, thanks. Anecdotally, mm -hmm. for what it's worth, I live in the yeah. foothills, and yeah. it's the fewest number of ticks I have ever seen in my life. And I've lived there since I was 10. Yeah, well, like. well, drought's the opposite for ticks. So <laughs> drought knocks ticks back, generally speaking. Uh, at least the, the Pacific black-legged tick that carries Lyme disease. Yeah. 
other ticks, dog ticks and stuff, they're, they have different habits, so. Yeah, thank you. Anyway. Anyone else from the public? Yeah, hi, Sandra from Placer County again. Um, yeah, just curious, you mentioned in your presentation that in the winter, the mosquitoes winterize somewhere. Um, <laughs> Um, is there a way, I mean, is there, are there any efforts to control them there before they come out? And then the other comment was on uh, what uh, Ms. Jones um, presented about the cockroaches. Um, I think in the presentation you also said that you're only concerned with things that are outdoors and not problems that are within homes. I um, actually have noticed um, outside my home uh, there that I have noticed cockroaches. They're not in my home, but they're outside. So, um, and then the report that Ms. Jones gave too, it's like, um, is, is this becoming a problem then that is not necessarily just indoors that we may need to, um, to consider trying to address um, as you address these other, these other vectors? Again, thanks for the question. Um, related to cockroaches, again, for right now, our, our funding does not allow us to go deal with cockroaches, neither does our um, kind of our regulatory jurisdictions from the state public health. So that's just, it's not really an option. Um, if that's something that's a concern, obviously that's a whole other conversation that can be had. But for right now, um, it's up to the homeowners to access those resources through structural pest control. Um, and then uh, in terms of the win uh, winterizing or, or overwintering of mosquitoes, either one works. Uh, but um, yeah, we, we manage about 30 different species of mosquitoes that all have different life cycles and habits and some you know, win overwinter as eggs in the soil and some overwinter as adults in your hedges, you know, in your backyard and so forth and so on. So yeah, we, we, we try to come up with as many effective targets in their life cycle to basically break it up and uh, reduce the number of mosquitoes, but it's not um, as always as simple. But um, yeah, we try. Okay, thanks. Robert, I have mm -hmm. a question. Yep, uh, okay. Suzanne. I have a question regarding mosquito control. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Several years ago when um, I received a briefing from Vector Control, <clears throat> please forgive me, but they said that they used to uh, give people what I think is called mosquito fish. Mm -hmm. If you have ponds or something like <coughs> that, that are, you have a problem with mosquitoes, yeah. do you still do that? Absolutely. Okay, so people just have to contact your office. So people should go on our website and submit a, a report for standing water. And then what, what happens is we'll come out and do an inspection and place fish in there if, if uh, the conditions are appropriate. Great, thank yep. you. Uh -huh. Yes. I just have a, Wesley Dill, Penn, I just have a couple of quick comments and one question. One comment is, uh, as a retired veterinarian, I can tell you that Lyme disease is very prevalent in the canine population in this area. Uh, the heartworm tests, tests for that routinely, and it's extremely common. It's a dime a dozen. The vast majority of them are asymptomatic, so I would assume that uh, people that are exposed to it may have similar uh, resistance. I don't know, but that being said, I did see a lot of hemorrhagic disease related to Lyme disease, thrombocytopenias and all kinds of fevers and so forth, and some of them died from it, kidney failure. Uh, you're right, Robert, ticks like moisture, so they tend to come out in the spring and the fall, um, so people can stay out of those areas. My question on the yellow jackets is I've killed a lot of nest over the years, uh, but I was just curious, what do you guys do or what's I'm not aware of any diseases other than anaphylactic reactions, but I'm interested to know. Yep. So again, uh, yellow jackets are part of our mission. Uh, <laughs> they don't carry disease, uh, but they are a nuisance. And, and what you just said, uh, sir, was anaphylactic reactions, and you know they definitely cause harm in people. So uh, we, um, it, this is primarily not not isolated, but primarily the biggest problem is up in the Tahoe area. So we do, as far as I know, we're the only agency that does regular surveillance for uh, yellow jackets and, and uh, monitor their abundance. So we can, we're trying to be able to protect, predict bad yellow jacket ears versus not bad yellow jacket ears. And we really stepped it up back uh, since what, I think it was 2012 that was like the, the worst yellow jackets ever, right? Um, so uh, we've been doing that for the past three years. We've been working with um, 
You see riverside researchers to try to develop new baiting materials and techniques to help um, manage uh, yellow jackets because there aren't a lot of good tools um, available to anyone and particularly homeowners to deal with it. You're, the little yellow traps work a little bit, uh, but they're not um, super great. So that's why we provide that service. So uh, public can call us up. We can go in. One, we figure out if they're actually yellow jackets or they're, something, they're a lookalike. And then um, our folks have bee suits and are trained to basically hunt them down and get rid of the nest if, if we can. So that's what we do. Thanks. OK. Thank you very much. Great, great, great job. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks. Um, our next timed item is the 930 timed item, which is a sewer connection fee annual update. Robin. Hello, good morning, Chairman Weigat, members of the board. How are you? Good. Good. Um, in the <laughs> interest of time, I will move quickly. Today, the department is requesting your board, number one, conduct public hearing to receive public testimony regarding a proposal to increase the sewer connection fees for sewer maintenance districts two and three, county service area 28, zones of benefit 2A3 and 173, from $9,735 to $10,137 per equivalent dwelling unit to reflect increases in the regional component approved by the South Placer Wastewater Authority. And number two, adopt an ordinance amending section 1312.350 of the Placer County Code to increase the sewer connection fees. For background, wastewater collected in collected in these four sewer districts and county service areas or CSAs that serve the areas of Granite Bay, Horseshoe Bar, Sunset and Dry Creek is conveyed to one of two wastewater treatment plants owned and operated by the City of Roseville. The funding mechanism for these wastewater treatment plants is through the South Placer Wastewater Authority or SPWA, a joint powers authority comprised of the City of Roseville, Placer County and the South Placer Municipal Utility District. Excuse me. Connection fees from all sewer entities utilizing these wastewater treatment plants include a regional component that is used by SPWA to fund wastewater treatment plant expansions. The current connection fee in these four county districts and CSAs is $9,735 per equivalent dwelling unit or EDU, which includes $8,267 per EDU for the regional component and $1,468 um, per EDU for the local component. The regional component of the connection fee is collected by the county and paid to the city of Roseville on a monthly basis as connection fees are collected and credited to the county's rate stabilization fund for wastewater treatment plant expansions. The regional component is essentially a pass-through fee. On July 1st, 2021, just nearly a week, just over a week from today, SPWA will increase the regional connection fee by $402 per EDU to $8,669 per EDU. The annual increase is a, one, a set one year period based on the engineering news record construction cost index as specified by the Roseville Municipal Code and is consistent with the SPWA agreements. In order to adjust connection fees, your board must conduct a public hearing, approve an amendment to the ordinance adjusting the connection fees, and make a finding that the higher fees are derived directly from the cost of providing the service. Staff recommends your board increase the connection fees by $402 to $10,137 in these four districts and CSAs. And with that, I would like to take any questions you may have. Thanks, Robin. Any questions? Um, Bonnie. I Thank you, Robin. Appreciate it. And I think I sent an email to you about this. Yes. This is an annual increase um, based on the index, correct? The cost index, yes. Okay. Um, and I appreciate that. And I know we're going to have, we've had a lot of concerns about cost of fees mm -hmm. and the challenge to do business when fees like sewer connection fees are so high, especially because um, SPWA doesn't have any separation on multifamily housing and the cost for that. So that's a question mm -hmm. I think the SPWA board, um, I sit on that board along with I think Supervisor Wygant, uh, we'll have more um, discussion about mm -hmm. um, as we're looking at how do we provide affordable housing 
actually affordable housing no matter what housing unit you have to build because it's so expensive. Um, so I think that will be a conversation we have with SPWA mm -hmm. coming up, and I, I know we need to do that. Um, so I know that this is normal. I just, it's just so expensive right now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my comment and, and question as well. Well, Supervisor Gore, I will point out that um, we are simply uh, increasing our connection fee by the amount that SPWA is increasing their regional component, but the local component is remaining um, flat for the county. Okay, that's good news. Now we yeah. just have to address it on the SPWA side. Yeah. Good answer, Roman. <laughs> uh, any other questions by board members? Uh, this is a public hearing, so I will now open up the public hearing. If there's anyone from the public who'd like to address this item. No one? I'll close the public hearing and we'll bring it back to the board for action. Second. A motion Holmes, second Gustafson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Robert. Thank you for your time. Uh, now we'll take up our 940 timed item, which is the establishment of a new Agricultural Preserve Williamson Act contract. Good morning, Chairman Wygant and members of the board. My name is Amy Rossig with the Placer County Planning Services Division. The item that I have before you this morning is a request to establish a new Agricultural Preserve and Williamson Act contract for Walter and Robin Fickworth. The project site is located in the Sheridan area. It's located on the northwest corner of North Dowd Road and Watts Road. The project site is 120 acres in size and for the last 20 years has continuously been, been used for production of rice. In January of this year, we brought this project before the Placer County Agricultural Commission for a review and recommendation. Um, during that hearing, we discussed the merits and the contract requirements for an agricultural preserve. These include that a minimum gross income requirement of $4,500 is made annually. The project site has 112 acres that are used for rice production, so with the cost of rice per ton, it would exceed that $4,500 requirement. Um, minimum size requirement, we require 100 acres in size. With 120 acres, it exceeds this requirement. And then consistency with the general plan, we look for they're going to be conserving this for agricultural use, which would be consistent with the general plan. So the Agricultural Commission voted to unanimously support this request based on the historical farm use and the quality of the soil and availability of irrigation water. So with that, I'm bringing before you a recommendation to establish the agricultural preserve and find it categorically exempt. I'm available if you have any questions, and I also have the property owner here if you have any questions for them. Thanks. Uh, questions from board members? See none. Uh, this is a public hearing, so I'll open it up to the public for comment if there is any. Nothing to say, Walter? <laughs> Got to say hello, at least, anyhow. Uh, Walter Fickworth, I farm in western Placer County. Uh, we farmed this property for probably 20 years, and we were leasing it for a while, and then the family decided to sell it. And uh, I was under the impression that it was already in the Williamson Act, but uh, it was not. And so I decided to apply to see if it would qualify. And thank you for your consideration. Thanks, Walter. Good to see you. Uh, any other members of the public? Close the plug. Close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. I'll second. Motion home, second. Uh, Gore, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Our next uh, item is the 950 timed item, which is um, uh, the budget adoption. Daniel. Lots of papers. Good morning, Chair Wygant, members of the board. And Daniel Chatney with the County Executive Office. So after conducting a public hearing to consider the fiscal year 21-22 recommended budget on June 8th, the County Executive Office is here to ask your board to adopt the fiscal year 21-22 budget as presented on June 8th. 
just as a reminder, the fiscal year 21-22 budget for county operating and capital funds is proposed at $1,024,477,507. Proprietary funds at $134,961,171. And special districts and CSA budgets at $34,532,160. As a follow-up to a question asked on June 8th, we want to show this table, uh, which shows a year-over-year -year comparison of general fund contributions to the public safety fund and how those funds are distributed amongst the three departments. So starting at the top left in fiscal year 2019-20, the general fund contingency revenue or general fund discretionary revenue, it was a total of 236.1 million, 122 million four hundred sixty thousand four hundred sixty four or fifty two percent of that discretionary revenue was transferred to the public safety fund within that same fiscal year eighty eight point nine million was distributed to the sheriff's department fifteen million to district attorney and probation received eighteen point four of that total so the sheriff receives on average about a seventy three percent of, of the general fund contribution with district attorney and probation averaging around 12 to 15 percent. Coincidentally, all three of those amounts amount to about 58 percent of the total operating budget for all three of those departments. In fiscal year 2021, the general fund discretionary revenue increased uh, by 14 or by 15 million dollars to 251 million. And again, the, the transfer to the public safety fund was commensurate with that increase, a total of 130.1 million. And again, you can see the distribution of 73% or 94.5 going to the sheriff's budget, uh, which represents 60% of their, their overall budget. And again, in the proposed budget for fiscal year 21-22, an uh, increase in discretionary revenue to 265 million. And again, 135 million being uh, transferred to the public safety fund and 97.2 million going to the sheriff's department and roughly those averages stay about the same year over year but just to show you how the general fund discretionary revenue as it increases so does the transfer into the public safety fund so a duplicate slide from two weeks ago um, intergovernmental revenue is the county's largest source of revenue coming in at 327.6 million or 32 percent of the budget local taxes which includes our property tax revenue is in second place at 271.8 or 27 percent of the overall revenue and financing sources on the expenditure side again the largest county operating expenditure category is salaries and benefits at 384.1 million or 37 percent of the overall budget and just as a reminder, this budget does include nearly $139 million of budgeted capital expenditures uh, spread out between the capital fund, the road fund, and departmental equipment purchases. The original table, uh, th uh, this table is an original table presented two weeks ago, and these are the new positions included in the fiscal year 21-22 budget. There, are, there were 38 positions added between the time the 2021 budget was adopted and then this proposed budget. The funding for these positions, to follow up again on a question raised two weeks ago, is, is displayed in this way. The Community Development Resource Agency was receiving 18 of these allocations for a total of $2,080,722. 1.1 million of that is funded from the general fund. 820,000 from related fees for service and then grants are expected to pick up about $140,000 of that annual expenditure. You can see the district attorney receiving one new position at 130,000 that is 100% general funded as is the facilities management position at 106,000. The treasurer tax collector position also is a general fund budget and general funded position at 156. In Health and Human Services, they received eight or 13 new positions since last year's adopted budget, totaling 1.6 million. Those are all either state or federally funded grant positions, or they were accumulating savings from operating efficiencies or swapping contracted or temporary staff for full-time staff. So no general fund impact there. 
and the Sheriff's Department had received four corrections related positions for the jail based competency training program and at 416,482 that is all grant funded as well. Two weeks ago a few questions were raised regarding our um, our post-employment funding statuses and our OPEB or other post-employment benefits which is retiree health as well as pension. So I'll go through a few slides this morning to kind of show you a little bit more of the background and some, some relevant information there. So this is a slide from our most recent um, summary from our Servit Trust representative. And this, this is a good slide. It shows you the initial contribution in 2008 of 25.9 million. We've made $246 million of additional contributions from then till now. Uh, we've taken 16.8 million in disbursements, CERBIT expenses or um, to, to manage the fund at 2.8 million. We've earned $244 million in investment earnings for a total as of March 8th of this year of $496.3 million and our money weighted annualized net rate of return from inception of or just over 13 years of 8.29% return. So very good. We also went out on a search to compare Placer County to some of our other 58 counties in California. And this chart compares that for our other post-employment benefits or OPEB retiree health. We don't have all 58 counties shown on this chart. Um, there's a couple different reasons for that I'll touch on too. Some counties do not have a Servit trust fund established. So they are on a pay-as-you-go program where they're only funding current year expenses. And then some didn't have current data updated, so we only selected the ones that were more of a like-for-like like comparison to Placer County, which is represented in that green bar in the middle at well over 90%, uh, followed somewhat closely by San Benito County and San Mateo County. But you can see the spread from the, the comparisons there all the way down to Del Norte and Siskiyou were very low. Likewise, we went and did a comparison on our PERS or our pension uh, funded status. And again, we ran into the same kind of predicament where counties aren't always an apples for apples comparison. So, we, some of the, so what we did again is we reported the counties that we could compare like for like conditions with. Um, tw just for background, 20 of the 58 counties in California are, act, are 37 ACT counties, so they don't participate in PERS. So they have different um, reporting structures in there. They're not also not subject to PERS investment rates, nor are there annual adjustments and things like that. Um, other counties had separated the reporting for some of their PEPRA and the multiple tiers within that. So you could see several different tiers of miscellaneous employees versus one roll up of all miscellaneous employees and one roll up of all safety employees, which we've done for Placer County. So you can see our comparison to these light counties running a little bit lower than, um, than probably the average of these counties. Um, I do want to just mention that our funded pension ratio does not include our trust fund, which has 17.7 million in it. But if we included that in our funded ratio, it would actually only increase our ratio by 1%. Moving on to the, the, the new portion of today's presentation, which is the countywide five-year CIP, uh, which was included in your budget package. The uh, county executive office, working with our departments, have uh, assembled this countywide five-year CIP to uh, anticipate and plan for the county's capital needs into the future. It includes all identified capital projects, inclusive of whether they are funded, underfunded, or unfunded at this time, and that total five-year countywide CIP totals $483.6 million. This represents the uh, 11 departments that have submitted capital improvement forms for projects in the next five years. And you can see starting with the department on the left, the total amount of the capital investment, how much has been spent prior to, to today, and then the amounts that are expected to continue into the future years, fiscal year 21, 22, out through 25, 26, totaling at the bottom right there again of $483.6 million in projects. 
On the, the second capital improvement item that's before you today is the capital improvement plan for facilities. And this is a five-year facility CIP that's looking at the major capital projects in the county. Some of those projects you're well aware of are the Health and Human Services Administration Building, uh, the Placer County Government Center Infrastructure, South Placer Jail Housing Units, the, or our SB863 and SB844 projects. Also included in, and in the out years is the Tahoe Justice Center, as well as the crime lab projects. This plan also includes building rehabilitation program, uh, which is our um, about 3.25 million in fiscal year 21-22. And again, those are prioritized projects that need the most attention um, most uh, immediately, as well as building renovation projects, which are uh, generated from department requests as part of the budget process, and that totals 1.1 million in fiscal year 21-22. Those would be more like building remodels and, and interior kinds of things like that. And with that, the requested actions today are to adopt a resolution to adopt the fiscal year 21-22 budget, including the budgets for county operating funds for a total of $1,024,477,507, the budgets for the county proprietary funds in a total amount of $134,961,171. Adopt a resolution to adopt the fiscal year 21-22 budgets for lighting districts, lighting and landscape districts, benefit assessment districts, county service area zones, permanent road divisions, and sewer maintenance, di sewer maintenance districts governed by the Board of Supervisors in an amount of $34,532,160. Also requesting to adopt an ordinance to approving the fiscal year 21-22 uncodified allocation of positions to departments and waive oral reading. This was introduced on June 8th. And finally, adopt the fiscal year 21-22 countywide five-year capital improvement plan, as well as adopt the fiscal year 21-22 five-year capital improvement plan for facilities. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions your board has. Any questions? Jim. I just want to uh, make clear that this is a, an adopted budget. Uh, if there is changes in the budget as we move forward, uh, there will be uh, opportunities to make amendments to the budget, which would require a four-fifths vote. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Thank you. And speaking of that, if I could just add, I know some of us uh, had email conversations with Jeff Darrington, Platzer Land Trust, and uh, uh, Todd and I, uh, over the last couple of months have been talking about how it's probably a great time to talk about Placer legacy and funding post adoption and implementation of the conservation plan. So I think the first next step will be for us to get together as staff and bring in some folks to talk about the history and the policy. And then I think we're shooting to have that come back to the board in October, Todd. Yeah, I believe we're going to shoot for October. Just we want to make sure that all all of you are uh, in the conversation. Uh, so, yeah, our intent is to do that prior to the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year. And I think pivotal time to reconsider that, that policy discussion, which would require budget amendment, potentially. Yeah. Uh, so, Cindy. Um, first off, thank you for the comparison charts with the other counties on OPEB and pension. I think that's really helpful for our tax payers and constituents to see the progress we're making. And um, one addition I'd like to continue to put on there is where our goal is, that we have a plan and strategy in point. We could put a little bar up there showing that over the next three to five years we plan to be at what percentage? Uh, remind me. So 80% is the 80% is our yeah, goal is the and to get yeah. there. So I think that would be a good um, to show our tax and rate payers sure. that we're planning to, to uh, move in that direction. Um, and I, one other, if you could go back to the presentation to slide two. And I just want to make sure uh, I call, yes, this one. Um, so in, so if we look at the general fund uh, change at 1.7%, I do believe our overall operating budget, meaning our salaries and services are only up 0.4%. Our revenues, then, that percentage change is really based on the revenues coming in. 
that 1.7 for general fund, 3.4 for public safety, all those? So the 1.7% the reflects the, the increase in the expenditure budget in the general fund. Yeah. And then obviously, the, the, okay. because we have a balanced budget, the revenues will match that number. So that is the net increase. But that in includes capital and maintenance. And so, so really for me, and this is just me getting into my previous life and career, I like to look at operating budget to operating budget right. without the capital component because then I can really track personnel, staffing, costs. So we, we did exclude that from this chart. Yeah. We pulled the, the capital portion out to try to separate that. Okay. As, a, as an overall, I think the, the to on this slide here, um, the capital equipment purchases, which okay. would be generally in the operating budgets, total 6.6 .6 million, and that's countywide for all of those operating funds. Okay, then going so. back to slide two, then I am correct that our overall operating for general fund is up 1.7 percent. Correct. Public safety is up 3.4 percent, and correct. we want to continue. I think um, Supervisor Gore made that point last time that we are definitely continuing to fund our public safety operations. Um, more than the rest of the county operations in a greater percentage uh, of increase. Um, the HHS Special uh, Revenue Fund does include uh, quite a bit of state and federal funding, am correct. I correct? That's so correct. So that 5.6% increase. But glaring there is the county library fund at 21%. Yeah. So I wanted to ask a bit about that, and I'm sorry I missed that two weeks ago. No, thank you for, for asking that question. Yeah. So this this budget format represents total financing sources, which includes fund balance. Okay. So in the county library fund, they are accumulating some fund balance at the end of this fiscal year due to reduced library hours, reduced staffing, as well yeah. as some, some um some larger capital projects that weren't going to be fully expensed this year. So all of that's carrying over into next year's budget. It's not necessarily an increase. It's just rebudgeting the reserves. Well, I would like and, to, yeah, and I would like to look at that and study that a little more sure. closely as we talk about services and the growth in property tax revenues that are going into the library fund, but we can continue that. Um, and then one other comment from a constituent today that I forgot to bring up previously um, that maybe um, our new forestry person, Carrie Timmer, can help me with is looking at how when we look at a billion dollar budget, what can we do to make sure we fully fund the chipping crews? We can't rely anymore on our uh, offender offenders in minimum custody to operate the equipment. The equipment is sitting there. People have a demand for chipping crews. So, you know, what can we do? What flexibility do we have in funds for that moving forward? Yeah. Let, let me just briefly touch on this because I did have a conversation with Marshall Hopper, our probation mm -hmm. director, uh, yesterday about the specific issue about can he have some work crews can can assist us in this arena. Um, right now, we're he's working with our risk management operation. Um, I think there's some concerns about some folks coming on and working with that chipper uh the piece of equipment itself just from a safety standpoint so what we're looking at potentially doing is hybriding it out where the staff that uh rc uh, would have they would actually be the ones operating the equipment and we'd have work crews that actually be going out and and compiling and, and piling up the material to be chipped um, so they wouldn't be actually operating with the actual equipment so our ultimate goal here really is more about staffing and that's been the challenge that we've had not right. necessarily the financial you know that's obviously a concern but I think our ultimate intent is to have more chipping crews out not only on the west side but I know on the eastern side of the county they are really challenged in that space as well. So you're gonna hear more about this, but Marshall's really taking concerted effort. We're actually can, uh, we've got really expanded in the work crews that he has. It's actually been a very successful program. It's just a little different than what we had previous done with kind of our work release uh, crews. Probation has stepped up and, and we've done a lot of work in this space. So thank you for addressing that because yep. I know there's quite a lag and people are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to keep their homeowners insurance. They're trying to do their defensible space and any assistance we can provide to augment that would be great. Yep, uh, we're working on it. Yep. And thanks again for the comparison slides. Those are very helpful. You're welcome. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, regarding the CHIPPER program, I met with Sarah Brown, the Executive Director of the Resource Conservation District yesterday, and uh, the workload is tremendous. It's been piled up since the last 
during the pandemic. Yeah. But the problem is for them is they don't have the workforce. And so uh, I explained to her that we were working with probation about maybe finding ways to uh, uh, enhance that workforce to get this all this stuff chipped up and out of the out of the <laughs> out of the way. So I don't know where we're going to take it, but you got to you got to move forward. Thank you. Okay. See no other questions from board members. Is there anyone from the public who'd like to address this item? Cheryl, go ahead and mute your mic and give your comments. Hi, good morning, Cheryl Herkema. Um, I uh, also appreciated the operating um, budget, the operating to operating. And I, I feel like what's missing is a comparable to other counties for how many employees it takes to do the same work. So I think that that would be helpful because um, my concern is CEDRA is adding 20 positions. We don't have um any idea of what comparable counties um take to do the same thing i know that with housing um there's going to be a lot of permitting and things but what we don't seem to have is any metrics which talk about success versus failure so um, in terms of housing we have some of the lowest housing fees so basically what i don't see is the cost of doing business we have lowest tree preservation fees, lowest housing fees. Um, and it, it seems like the operating budget, the number of promotions that are um, provided, that seems to be the largest chunk, 37% of the budget with both pensions and the cost of doing legal. What are the operational costs, for example, for the largest department, which is CEDRA, and um, how do we compare to other counties? So uh, I'd appreciate if anyone could share light on that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Chairman, I see no further public comment. With that then, um, we are to take these items one at a time. Um, so we have the five items before us and um, the first one is the adoption of the fiscal budget as discussed, but the budget for the operating funds uh, plus the budget for the proprietary funds. Motion, Gustafson, second, Holmes, all those in favor of roll call. <laughs> Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Why well, Yes. Item two is adoptive resolution regarding the lighting, landscaping districts, et cetera. Motion, Gustafson, second, Holmes, uh, roll call, please. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Why well, Yes, uh, third item is to adopt the ordinance revi uh, adopting the uh, uncodified uh, allocation of positions to departments. Approval. Motion, Gustafson, second, Holmes, roll call. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Why Yes. Item four is to adopt the 21-22 uh, county five-year capital improvements plan. Motion, Gustafson, second, Holmes, roll call. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Why again? Yes. And fifth and last, adopt the 21 22 five year capital improvements plan for facilities. Second. <laughs> Motion, Holmes, second, Gustafson. <laughs> roll call, please. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Why again? Yes. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Board. Yeah. Yep. So our 1020 timed item is our Department of Forest uh, Fire Protection Cooperative five-year agreement. Um, Sarah. All right. Good morning, Chair Wigand, members of the board. Morning. Sarah Poindexter with the County Executive Office and joining me today is Cal Fire Unit Chief Brian Estes. I am here today requesting that your board um, adopt a resolution approving a three-year cooperative fire protection agreement with CAL FIRE for the period of July 1st of 2021 through June 30th, 2024 in a total amount of $38,893,544, the first year being 
or I'm sorry, $12,337,366 for fiscal year 2021 and 5% annual increases thereafter and authorize the chairman to sign the agreement. Um, also, I just want to take a moment to note that the resolution has been updated. Uh, previously, it stated the term was fiscal year 22 through 24, and we've updated that to provide greater specificity of the term being July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Uh, that resolution has been provided to your board um, and to the public for review. So what you'll see now is a map of Placer County and it depicts the different fire agencies that are across the county. Um, it's made up of a combination of municipal fire departments, special districts, and county service area, which is served by Placer County Fire. That area on the map is the buttercream yellow area that you see. Uh, it's approximately 475 square miles and spans about one third of the county. Serving as Placer County Fire, Cal Fire provides fire prevention and protection, emergency medical service, hazardous materials, all hazard emergency incident response and dispatch service to a population of approximately 57,000 people. This also includes administrative and operational overhead, supporting all career and volunteer fire stations, including round the clock chief officer coverage, training, fleet maintenance, communications and logistical support. The CAL FIRE contract provides staffing of 61 full-time equivalent firefighters, as well as management and oversight of approximately 33 volunteer and five resident firefighters, which operate out of Dutch Flat, Page, Ophir, Thermalands, Dry Creek, and Sheridan. Full-time career service is provided by seven engine companies operating out of five full-time career stations in North Auburn, Ophir, Lincoln, Dry Creek, and the Sunset Industrial Area, as well as three fully staffed Amador stations. The Amador stations that I just referenced, they serve as one of the many benefits of the CAL FIRE contract. Through the Amador agreement, fire service is provided through CAL FIRE owned stations, where CAL FIRE has jurisdiction during fire season <coughs> and Placer County assumes jurisdiction in the off season. This allows the county to reduce costs by leveraging existing state and local resources um, at a total cost of $800,000. It's approximately 20% of the cost to run a full-time station. It allows for full-time service to be provided in areas where it may otherwise not be fiscally feasible. Also, um, these three stations are located in Alta, Bowman, and Colfax. They're along the I-80 corridor, so they service a large um, percentage of the calls that Placer County Fire responds to. The county has maintained a contract with CAL FIRE since approximately the early 1950s. Historically, it's been an annual agreement. However, the proposed agreement that's before your board today is a three-year term, which will result in administrative efficiencies for both the county and the state. The total contract is $38,893,544, uh, with the first year being 12.3 million and 5% increases for the two subsequent years. The contract also includes conversion of five firefighter two positions to firefighter two paramedic positions. Uh, this will allow flexibility to meet requirements of new developments that may be coming online during the time period of the contract. And these positions would be filled through attrition. The fiscal year 21-22 contract amount is $12.3 million, which is a de decrease of nearly $1.3 million from the current fiscal year. This is primarily due to a reduction in the cost of staff benefits within the contract. The quoted amount of the agreement assumes all personnel are at full compensation for budgeting purposes. However, Placer County is billed in the rears for the actual cost of service provided. And historically, the cost of service comes in roughly 10% under the quoted contract cost. The full cost of the contract is divided among multiple cost centers, which include the Fire Control Fund, Dry Creek Fire, which is also known as Zona Benefit 165, North Auburn Ofer Fire, also known as Zona Benefit 193, and Sunset West Fire, which is Zona Benefit 97. And now at this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to turn the presentation over to Chief Estes to go over some of the many accomplishments that Placer County Fire has accomplished this year. Thank you, Sarah. 
Well, good morning, Chair Wygant and members of the board. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to speak with all of you this morning. My name is Brian Estes. I'm the County and State Fire Chief. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to, Chair Wygant, I wanted to thank you for your acknowledgement this morning of our injured firefighter. Uh, that means the world to me and to my troops. And, uh, and uh, I think at the end of our presentation, I can um, brief you on a little bit of an event that we have going on today at Sutter Roseville Medical Center. So thank you very much for that. Um, you know, as, as Sarah mentioned here just a few minutes ago, we, we have a, I was reflecting on this last night, preparing for this presentation and, and um, you, you know, um, in your district, uh, Chair Wygant, you know, is really where the history of the, the relationship between CAL FIRE and Placer County FIRE started. And um, in my spare time, I've been digging up some history and trying to, to build that lineage and um, talked with a gentleman who worked for our agency in 1952. Uh, and he started at, uh, at Colfax, um, which was three generations ago from the fire station that currently sits there. But he, he started in the same location, 1952, as a young recruit firefighter but his memory was sharp as a tack and he told me that he remembers distinctly a, a fire station being jointly operated between the state of california and the county of placer and now inside what is incorporated lincoln um and staffed with one person all by themselves uh and, to per and for the record i was a year old <laughs> <laughs> i didn't i didn't say you were staffing the fire engine chair i just said uh, <laughs> i said you were probably well aware of the history so <laughs> But you know, it really, uh, it really kind of brought to attention. Um, it really kind of brought to attention to me the proud history that we have with, uh, you know, with the relationship between the county and the state. Something I'm very, very proud of. So, um, so we did start approximately in 1952, and we've maintained and evolved in a very regionalized response model across a very, very diverse. Um, landscape in our, um, in our 475 square miles, going from the valley floor to the crest of the Sierra, uh, from very rural um, uh, open areas to uh, densely uh, urbanized uh, areas along the 49 corridor. And I think the diversity of our agency and our relationship with the county allows us to really provide a very, a very good service. Can we manage that under a good, solid, unified command and control? But we're really dedicated and always have been and remain dedicated to those individual communities because all of our zones of benefits we service have a little bit different um, flavor to them. And, and one of the things my people are very proud of is, is that connection with those local communities uh, across the county. We do leverage that local control and acknowledge that local control, but leverage the depth of the state resources in order to provide the most effective and efficient service. So as I talked to you last year, as we were coming out of 2019, uh, 2020 provided the same amount of challenges uh, for us, largely in the face of, of COVID. And uh, we worked closely on a day-to-day -day basis with, um, with you know, Becky's team, the, the, the Placer team, as I call it, with, uh, with OES and the fire department and sheriff's office and HHS through 2020, uh, really uh, looking daily at the challenges that COVID presented us as a county while still maintaining emergency services to our citizens and community members. And, and I'm proud to say that we had no loss of continuity in our operations through the entire year. Not one lost day of staffing, not one interruption in service across our county. We responded to over 11,000 calls for service, which averages, averages about 31 calls per day uh, within our jurisdiction and responded to by county resources. Um, as I talked about last year, our, our demands in the River Canyons, Hidden Falls Regional Park, et cetera, did not let up. And we ran 274 technical and swift water rescues in 2020. And our Grass Valley Emergency Command Center, one of our premier dispatch centers uh, in the state, dispatched over 40,000 911 fire and EMS calls uh, and took over 150,000 incoming emergency calls last year. I, I think I'd be remiss in saying that, that anywhere you live in Placer County, the threat from emerging wildfires and damaging, large damaging wildfires is, is probably always um, our number one threat in the county, no matter where we live. And as I talked to you a couple weeks ago in my presentation, you know, the days of just living in the urban interface 
um, versus in the commercial areas and having a threat from wildland fire. Um, really, I think we have to look at it more holistically. Uh, you know, we had a, another fire yesterday down in, in uh, uh, Supervisor Gore's district, and we're seeing more and more of those fires in the flatlands move out of the grasses and right into it's suburban neighborhoods and threaten those neighborhoods. So um, it is our biggest priority, I believe, here in, in uh, Placer County, which is why I really believe in the strength of the relationship between the state and the county and our fire service delivery. We responded to over 700 wildland fires in 2020, and we kept 95% of those at 10 acres or less, which is part of our mission statement as CAL FIRE. It's an aggressive, unified initial attack for the protection of life and property. As you've heard me say many, many times, Placer County has more habitable structures in the state responsibility area than any other county in the state, and that remains one of my pinnacle objectives as I build our evacuation planning with our partners in the Sheriff's Office and, and, and that. Um, because we do have statutory authority. Um, we, we do have MTZ, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide, but that SRA is under the fiscal and jurisdictional responsibility of the state of California. So having, that, having the most habitable structures in the SRA of any county in the state is obviously a huge priority for me on the state side. Mutual threat zones, um, we talked a little bit about that this year, but you know, the fire I referenced in Supervisor Gore's district yesterday was a perfect example. That fire was 100% in the local responsibility area of Placer County, meaning the state had no jurisdictional authority, fiscally or, or jurisdictionally. However, because of our mutual threat agreement and our relationship, we launched a full uh, breadth of state resources, including aircraft and heavy equipment to that fire, and we were able to contain it at about 40 acres. And as you know, fires down in that front country with delayed responses have the potential to do a lot of damage. And while it may be open grassland to some folks, it's, it's ranchers' land and it's feed and it's people's private property. So we take that very serious in the front country. We maintain that relationship across the county in many areas. We have an MTZ agreement with the city of Auburn and, all, and, and of course, with our, our front country in Placer County. And it allows me to bring all the tools of the state to mitigate those emergencies as quickly as possible. Our special operations continue to be one of our biggest focuses in the county fire department. I talked a little bit of our, about our technical rescue team and our impact continues. Uh, in fact, um, we have upstaffed this last weekend and then I let you all know that we upstaffed over Memorial Day weekend. Over the last seven days, we affected nine rescues um, and directly impacted 14 people between Hidden Falls and uh, the ASRA. So um, the, the preparatory planning and hard staffing that team has had direct benefits to, um, to helping the people that, that, uh, that either live or recreate in our community. Our hazardous materials response team, while a low frequency of, of events, the, the potential hazards on the I-80 corridor, as Sarah referenced with the pipeline, uh, the, U, the UP rail line, continues to be an ever-present threat, and we maintain that staffing out of Station 77. We work heavily with our, our partners with PCSO, and I, I really continue to be humbled by that relationship with the Sheriff's Office, um, from the tactical EMS team to just uh, my relationship with the Sheriff and the Under Sheriff. Uh, we really do support each other well, and, and uh, that, that tactical EMS team has been active over the past year. And then some of those state resources that we bring to the table every single time, heavy equipment and air operations. Um, as recently as yesterday, with that fourth bulldozer that I talked about, we're going to place that uh, this year down at Station 70 on Wise Road, which is going to put an initial attack bulldozer right in the heart of, of uh, a couple of districts down in the front country, which I think is going to be a great benefit. I think um, one of the objective and, and tangible um, benefits that I can show you from your commitment to our Lust Reduction Bureau and the Fire Marshal in 19 and 20 was um, our 100 percent inspection and compliance with Senate Bill 1205, which is our mandatory school fire safety inspection program. We have one, we were not compliant on that before, frankly, and we are now 100% compliant and moving through to ensure that we, we keep the, the liability to all of you and to the county at a minimum through fire marshal duties. We performed over 240 commercial inspections, 198 residential inspection, and reviewed over 312 new plan reviews for subdivisions and developments. <clears throat> uh, 
Sarah talked a little bit about the value added benefits and, and I, I would say our cooperative agreement showed that um, last year more than ever. Um, because of staff benefit rate reductions and some efficiency models in the field, um, our uh, savings and refund to the county, our projection is to save um, upwards of 24% back and, re and refund almost $3 million back to the county of Placer, which is a, just a tremendous value and I'm very proud of that. Um, our longer fire seasons allow us to bill on the rears for those Amador stations at a greatly reduced rate. And the reality of those cost savings were was that we put brand new, state-of-the-art, heavy extrication tools on those three stations along the I-80 corridor that are in service now and uh, just doing an amazing job up there. Our assistance by hire on refunding the county for the use of county equipment on the state mission generated over $800,000 in 2020. And our value-added benefit of prevention training EMS and investigation services uh, all provided a great benefit to the county. So as I look forward um, and, and we look at this multi-year contract, first and foremost, I wanna say thank you to all of you for supporting this concept. Um, the mechanics of it really don't change a whole lot, but um, it means a lot to me and it means a lot to, to you know, the troops that are out there doing the job every day that, that you have the faith and trust in us as a fire department, as a service provider, to be in a long-standing relationship, and that means a lot to us. We continue to work diligently on fiscal sustainability. Uh, CEDRA has been an amazing partner to us as well and to the fire marshal office, making sure that our new development um, issues are dealt with appropriately and funded appropriately into the future. And again, we continue to coordinate with PCSO on, uh, on all our evacuation planning. Uh, it, we've completed Colfax, we're moving into Forest Hill and Todd Valley, and our third objective is North Auburn and uh, Christian Valley. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions on some of our successes last year. And, Sarah can certainly answer any questions uh, regarding the contract. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> Jim, then Bonnie, then Cindy. Thank you, Chief Estes. Uh, I want to thank you for your presenter uh, help with our uh, Placer County Ad Hoc Fire Committee. It's very important to have you <clears throat> on board. Um, and I'm happy to see that this is a three-year agreement. Don't get me wrong, it's always nice to see you. But, you know, this will cut down on staff time for both our side and your, your team as well. Uh, but it's, it's much needed to just have a three-year agreement so we, everybody feels comfortable as we go through the next three years. Now, as far as the uh, five paramedics, do you have staff already with their paramedic degrees ready to step into those positions? <clears throat> so, great question. Um, our, our list for our state agency has approximately 850 paramedics on that list. So we have a, a vast amount of, of eligible candidates. And we do have enough paramedics in our unit right now that are not working in class to be able to start to fill those positions. The main reason we wanted to, to put it into the contract was so that as we start construction at Vineyards and Bickford specifically, we can move right into that through attrition. So the answer is yes. All right, very good, thank you. Bonnie. Thank you, Chief. And either Sarah, either either of you can answer this question. Uh, and that is the reduction of the budget this year over last fiscal year was $1.3 <coughs> million. You mentioned benefits. Um, can you explain that and why that is? I know that we have an increase based on the, the contract that the state has with the firefighters of 5% salary increase. But what's the reduction of the $1.3 I'll speak to it briefly and I'll let Sarah talk about the numbers. So the 5%, um, there's a couple things here that we're talking about. The 5% uh, MOU agreement actually caps out this year. So the 5% escalator that's built into that contract is just the standard state inflator that they put into any contract. We have never historically even met the zero mark, let alone gone to the inflator because we operate on a do not exceed bill in the rears. Um, so the main um, reason that we are seeing a reduction in the contract, both in the refund this year in the fourth quarter projections and also in the first year of the three-year contract being less than last fiscal year is, is primarily because the staff benefit rates at the state of California went down so dramatically that those employee costs went down and those costs got directly um, 
passed on to the county. Okay, so to summarize, the state contract uh, changed and therefore our costs changed. Yes, yep. Okay, yeah. thank you. You wanna add anything more? Okay. Cindy. Yeah, following up on that, I wanna thank you, Chief. You thanked us, but I wanna thank you and your staff for the incredible service we received. Um, I think it's important to point out, as, as Supervisor Gore was pointing out, that our contract for this year was 1.9 million, 3 million more. Uh, and even at the end of this three years, we won't be back up to that, even if we do have to implement the 5% uh, escalators. So actually, for the next three years, we're under this year's budget. And I know you've done a great job in using our resources on statewide events, and so we've been reimbursed for a lot of funding. Um, I just want to say, you know, serving on the ad hoc, I have learned a tremendous amount about the fire service, and I want to thank you for your patience and time walking me through so much of it, uh, as well as staff, Sarah, thank you too, and Becky back there. Um, but the, uh, the efficiency we get through this state contract, the professionalism we get through this contract, um, the mutual aid we're able to provide our smaller fire districts within the region, um, the regional services on that Interstate 80 corridor that I know all too well uh, from my traverses, um, it's just phenomenal, the service that you and your staff provide. And, uh, and finally, to you, on your communication with us, I know whenever there's an incident in this county, you're letting us know what's going on, what's at stake, and it's weekends, it's evenings, most of the time that I get those text messages. I don't always respond, but I do read them, and I am so appreciative for that level of communication and service to us. Uh, so that there's no surprises that we hear from you first what's going on and what we need to be aware of so I just really want to thank you for that partnership I know there's been a lot of questions um, and the comparisons that we've looked at in service provision throughout our county um, our contract with Cal Fire is extraordinary benefit to our citizens so thank you thank you very much Super um, and I'll just say, Brian's been a great, I haven't been here since quite 1952, but. Um. I'm not going to live that one down, am I? I, th I meant to say 1972. I'm sorry, Robert. <laughs> that helped, but not much. Um, but, it's been, <laughs> uh, but it's been a great pleasure working with you and your organization over all the years that I have been here. And you offered up an update on Bobby, I think. Um, yeah, um, uh, so I, I just wanted to um, recognize uh, Assistant Chief Brian Mackwood here. He was our duty chief last week through, you know, a, a very significant event for, for our, our unit. And, uh, you know, we did have a vehicle accident with one of our fire engines responding to a, um, a vegetation fire down on Mount Vernon. You know, for the amount of miles uh, statewide that our that is put on our fleet, um, thousands and thousands of pieces of equipment, uh, the amount of responses, um, our occurrence of vehicle accidents is extraordinarily low. And I think that's due to our training levels and our vehicle maintenance, et cetera. But unfortunately, accidents do happen. And when they do, we can just be grateful that, that we don't have fatalities or major injuries. In this particular case, um, we had a, a crew of three people and one of our firefighters, uh, firefighter uh, Robert Bobby Byers, was uh, uh, severely injured in the rollover of one of our fire engines. He's currently at Sutter Roseville Medical Center. Um, youth is on his side, so he's making a very resilient recovery. Um, but he did have a very serious head injury, and, and they did do some surgery on, on him. Uh, he's making a great recovery, but unfortunately, because of some of the COVID restrictions at Sutter Roseville, um, we, we uh, had to get creative. And so we worked with our partners with Roseville uh, City Fire, my partner, Chief Barty, uh, one of Bobby's relatives works for Sac City, so they stepped up, again, that relationship in the region, and uh, Chief Mackwood and his staff put together an event that I'm pretty sure is over right now, but it occurred this morning, and uh, that's his window up there that you can see, and it allowed us to, we took Truck 180 down there, and Sacramento bought a truck company, and we've got uh, five or six different pieces of equipment down there and a whole host of people, all his family that were not allowed into ICU. 
and uh, we were able to greet him outside his window using some of our resources. So, uh, and and you know that that for me as a fire chief, sometimes that's the stuff that uh, is most satisfying. You know. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Supervisors. Okay, we're now going to open this up to the public for any comments or questions. With that, and uh, we have this uh, three-year contract that's just been discussed uh, for consideration before us. Motion home, second Gustafson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll now move to our 1050 timed item, <clears throat> which is approval of a contract to provide uh, services to the city of Colfax uh, regarding a three-year contract um, for fire protection. Okay, I'll take this on, and obviously uh, Chief Essis is here too if there's any specific service delivery questions. So this is really a, a conversation, kind of uh, tag teams with the prior one about service delivery and uh, the benefits that uh, I believe the city of Colfax will recognize, but I, I would think the this county as well and up the I-80 corridor and that uh, continuity of operations. So um, the just for a little background, this would be approval of a contract uh, for to provide the fire services to the city of Colfax uh, for a three-year period. Um, we have actually provided services to Colfax since 2001 in the form of a uh, battalion chief uh, contract for service really to help provide uh, fire services to their volunteer fire uh, department for a number of years and every three years this agreement comes up and uh, we are fortunate to uh, go and sit before their um, uh, city council to really have a conversation about fire service and uh, at the end of that conversation the discussion was made in a request from the county to uh, provide a proposal to uh, actually provide their fire service and bring in their volunteer fire uh, fighters under the Placer fire umbrella uh, that took place uh, between Chief Estes our staff uh, we were able to bring forward a proposal to them about providing that service. I'm going to walk through briefly some of the key components of what this contract lays out, uh, but I think it's been a, a mutually beneficial thing for both the city and, and uh, the county as well. So the contract that would, is being proposed and brought forward today is really a, a level of service that commensurates with the service that you just uh, approved uh, for the three-year period. Um, it actually works out very well because this contract would be a three-year agreement in the same fashion so they tie nicely together. Um, it's a $75,000 a year annual contract with a 3% growth uh, factor, inflationary factor built into that uh, contract. Um, the uh, so, uh, City of Colfax would request any additional service, so in the event that they would like to have any uh, services that are different than what we currently provide under our uh, Placer Fire umbrella, uh, they have the ability to submit a request uh, from the county and we'd identify that direct calculation of cost uh, in concert with Cal Fire and then we'd bring forward uh, that that request. So it would be a direct billing arrangement in the event that they wanted uh, a service uh, greater than what's currently provided right now. All the equipment um, would be transferred to the county, so we'd be taking on any equipment that uh, the city of Colfax has under their fire services right now, and that would come under the Placer Fire umbrella. We'd make determinations about the utilization of that equipment and use those as, as deemed fit. Um, uh, however, the facilities that uh, uh, the city of Colfax utilizes for their fire service right now would remain under uh, the ownership of the city of Colfax. However, they would be having the responsibility to provide maintenance and uh, service to that, uh, those specific uh, facilities as, def as needed uh, from conversation with uh, the fire chief and uh, what we, pr in terms of providing services. So those uh, facilities remain uh, part of the city of Colfax. I think the final uh, piece that I'd mention is the volunteers. They have uh, a couple of volunteers, I believe three at the time, um, and they would be coming over as uh, volunteers of our current Placer Fire area. So we have a number of fire volunteer fires under our Placer Fire uh, umbrella right now, and so these would just be some additional 
uh, employees would come under, they have to do one background check. The contract uh, stipulates kind of a 60-day transition period, so it gives the ability from an administrative standpoint to bring them on. But uh, their background training and education uh, needs are commensurate with our uh, current volunteer system. So I don't think there'll be any changes in that. It should be very transparent um, and, and an easy uh, fit uh, under this current umbrella. I'll bring up uh, and ask the chief to talk if there's anything in addition around services, uh, but I want to touch base on some of the key components around the contract itself and what the provisions state to. So, uh, Chief, I'll ask you if there's any comments or questions you'd like to, uh, or comments you'd like to make about this. Yeah, um, just just real briefly, I want to um, you know thank Todd and um, Supervisor Gustafson and Holmes for helping and assisting with this. Um, um, you know progression I guess and, and, it, and I think it's just really um, bringing things on the heels of my last presentation I think it's just bringing a better efficiency level and bringing Colfax into a much more regionalized service delivery but still maintaining a connection to the community and to their to, to the things that are important to that to that city so um, I appreciate the help from both of the supervisors um, I, I guess the last piece I'll, I'll speak to as part of this uh, uh, contract, it does speak to uh, about the mutual threat zone agreement. This is obviously a con conversation and a contractual agreement between the state of California and Cal Fire, or Cal Fire and the city of Colfax is not directly attributed to this contract, but it is speak to it in this agreement. And I think this is just additional benefit that Colfax would receive. And I think for the county as a whole, they're, uh, their opportunity to mitigate uh, potential devastating wildfires that could cripple them financially. Um, so the contract would be uh, upon your approval today if you so choose to move forward. Um, the city of Colfax would actually be approving this uh, same agreement uh, tomorrow evening at their uh, city um, uh, council meeting. So be open to answering any questions you might have. Thanks, Todd yeah. and Brian. Uh, Cindy. Um, thank you. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to brief the rest of the board and thank publicly um, the City Council of Colfax and the town manager for all of the hard work. We've spent hours going through this contract uh, with them, um, and rightly so, because there were concerns about this significant amount of increase. While it's still a small amount relative to the county budget when you go from 25000 a year to 75000 a year plus increases, um, there was a lot of trust to rebuild, and um, I want to especially thank uh, Mayor Lohman and uh, Vice Mayor Burris and all the meetings that we've held to get through this process, and Chief to you and to uh, our CEO for sitting through those meetings and helping us uh, work this out uh, to the benefit of the, the constituents in Colfax. Any other questions, comments by board members? Um, seeing none, I will open it up to the public. I see no public comment. Uh, with no public comment, then I'll bring it back to the board for action. Motion Gustafson, second Holmes, to approve the three year contract with the city of Colfax for fire protection as discussed. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks. Great, thank you. We'll now take up our 11 o'clock timed item. Um, and this is the North Lake Tahoe Azor Resort Association 2122 contract with Placer County, Aaron. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Aaron Casey here with the County Executive Office to present this item to you this, uh, this morning, I guess. Still morning. <laughs> I also have here today Jeffrey Hens, CEO with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association. Samir Tuma, who is the current chair of the organization, is available, as well as Peter Kratz and Doug Jastro with Revenue Services to answer questions on some of the details of the item in front of your board today. The presentation overview will include the fiscal year 21-22 contract objectives, as well as the performance-based contract elements, some of the resort association's strategies for next fiscal year, the TBID collection services agreement. So there are two separate agreements included in your packet today. The first is the fiscal year agreement to continue the organization's operations. And the second is for the county to retain a percentage of TBID dollars to administer the program. I've also got included in your board packet 
a series of tourism mitigating projects and services, which we're calling Tourism Mitigation 2.0, since your board has authorized expenses or, or the allocation of TOT dollars to projects like these previously. And then finally, requested board action. So the fiscal year 21-22 contract objectives, the first component here is, is that it is a transitional agreement. So your board is very familiar with the TBID, the North Lake Tahoe Tourism Business Improvement District. You approve the uh, resolution of formation for that TBID on March 9th, and collections will begin July 1st. However, because collections won't begin until July 1st, the organization will still require TOT dollars, or transient occupancy tax dollars, for a part of the following fiscal year until they're able to, or we are able to, collect TBID revenues and remit them to the organization. And so that's an important component here. This is transitional in that the organization will be weaning itself off of TOT as the primary funding source and eventually be funded with TBID dollars exclusively, thus freeing up those TOT dollars for workforce housing and transportation initiatives. In addition, the fiscal year contract um, will provide, the organization will provide tourism development services, continue to co-chair the CAP committee and potentially the new TOT committee, which is referenced in the multi-year agreement your board approved on March 9th to recommend workforce housing and transportation initiatives. It also includes funding to contract with business associations on the North Shore, including the Tahoe City Downtown Association and the North Tahoe Business Association. The county has contracted with both organizations for several years. However, they will be transitioning to contracting directly with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association to sort of streamline their operations and enhance those partnerships. And so in order to sort of help frame up that, that new partnership and relationship, the resort association will be contracting with them directly as opposed to business associations contracting with Placer County. And then also work with Placer County staff to develop tourism master plan revenue streams, specifically the renewal of our 2% TOT that sunsets in September of next year the organization will provide, of course, education, as they can't advocate, but will provide education to the community on the ballot measure. Um, and at some point when your board makes that decision on when it'll go forward, there'll be more details to come there. But nonetheless, the organization will provide that support. The scope of work summary, there are six tasks outlined in it. Many of them are consistent with prior years, although there are a couple of changes per the organization's evolution as a result of the TBIT itself. Task one, including organizational management and admin, down to tourism master plan implementation into tourism development programs and services, visitor information, capital improvement planning and infrastructure, and then of course management of the business association agreements as I just mentioned. Some of the strategies include positioning North Lake Tahoe as a year-round destination, but specifically increasing visitation during our non-peak periods, and that has come up a lot this past year, a lot of visitation in, in the Tahoe area. So the organization has really shifted um, into focusing on those uh, times of uh, day, or excuse me, during the week. We have a lot of visitation on the weekends, but people don't tend to stay through the week. Uh, and then we obviously have our peak period and shoulder season. So really trying to focus in outside of those peak periods because we have a lot of people come to the area but want to create a little bit more balance so businesses can rely on some of those uh, shoulder seasons for revenue as opposed to really just relying on Fourth of July and other key periods or key times of year when people are coming to Tahoe. Increasing the length of stay so that would support the objective I just outlined continuing to engage stakeholders and community members on a number of initiatives, identifying tourism, excuse me, partnership opportunities, and then on the tourism master plan implementation side, this is TBID related work and CAP committee and TOT committee focused work. A little bit on the freed up TOT, I also wanted to mention that you'll note in your board packet that there is a budgeted amount for the Resort Association and Business Association contracts, but the Resort Association is not anticipating spending that full amount because there will be TBID revenues coming in in this next fiscal year. And so the fund, the difference between what's been budgeted and what the organization proposes to spend 
is $848,592. And that is considered the freed up TOT. So that would be reserved for use in workforce housing and transportation initiatives. I did want to mention this is a conservative budget. So it's quite possible that the organization will require fewer TOT dollars to sustain its operations, which will then add to that freed up TOT dollar amount. This is a performance-based contract as it has been for the last several years. There are indicators and tasks and subtasks outlined in it consistent with the county's approach to contracting. There are biannual progress reports required. Invoices are also required prior to payment being made. And the freed up TOT I did also wanna mention will remain in the county treasury. The organization will continue to have its advisory role as designated by your board in the five-year agreement but those dollars will stay in the county treasury as opposed to being remitted directly to the resort association. Moving on to the TBID services collection agreement. So again, this is the second component and the second requested action. So the county will collect assessments for the North Lake Tahoe Tourism Business Improvement District, as you know. The county will retain 2% for program administration that's outlined in the management district plan, which governs the TBID itself. So that's the agreed upon amount that the county can retain for that service. And resort association also will continue to provide services consistent with the management district plan. So this agreement not only spells out how much the county would retain, but also what the county's expectations are of the resort association as it implements the TBID itself. The county may also conduct audits, although they are not required, but it is at your board's discretion should you choose to audit the organization in terms of how it's managing those TBID dollars. And then resort association will provide an annual report to the county per this agreement. There is an existing agreement that's very similar to this one between Placer County and the Squaw Valley Alpine Transportation Company, or SATCO. And so the agreement in front of you today was modeled after that agreement as well. So it is consistent and aligned with that contract that your board has authorized previously. And then finally, a series of tourism mitigating projects and services. There are three projects outlined in the staff report for your board's consideration today. A resort association acted on June 11th of this year to recommend transient occupancy tax for additional tourism mitigating projects and services. Specifically, there are three projects as I mentioned. The first one is a temporary signal at Grove Street, and I'm gonna provide a little bit more detail on this one in a moment, and I do have Peter Kratz here to answer any questions you might have on this item. The second are restrooms and trash bins on Donner Summit. We've had several conversations and meetings with the Forest Service and other agency partners, Nevada County being one on the summit as well, to try to strategize on how to address some of those issues up on the summit. And so this would be a partnership with Nevada County and the Forest Service to address that immediately should your board approve and authorize these funds. And then finally, pedestrian infrastructure on the west shore of Lake Tahoe. This has already been partly funded by the county in addition to the Tahoe City Public Utility District. Um, this would allow for us to complete that project in partnership with that agency. And again, this is something that Peter can speak to in more detail should you have more questions. The total requested allocation for these um, particular projects and services is $215,000. And that would come out of the TOT reserve funds that your board has allowed the resort association to recommend how those dollars get spent. So the same pot of funds that your board authorized on May 9th, 1.1 million and several projects, including microtransit among many others. So same funding source. And then these are all the action items, but I am gonna back up just a moment and give you a back, bit of background on the temporary signal at Grove Street. So that project was actually, we brought that forward on March 9th, seeking $150,000 from your board for that project, which your board did authorize. Staff then um, received bids, DPW staff received bids that were significantly higher than the original anticipated cost. And so that is why we're here asking for additional funds for that project. So what is the project and why are we doing it? 
Um, there have been a lot of discussions about how to treat this, this intersection in Tahoe City. This is the Grove Street intersection. It is one of the most heavily used intersections by pedestrians. There are definitely significant impacts um, to traffic and traffic flows as a result of that. People continuously crossing. There is no pedestrian crossing beacon to try to manage that in any way. We have tried to address it with crossing guards in the past somewhat successfully, and that is an option moving forward. When we've had conversations with the community and Caltrans on how to solve for those issues, Caltrans is very committed to and focused on fully signalizing that intersection. And when that's been talked about with the community, there's been a fair amount of concern about signalizing that intersection. So the temporary signal that we're proposing today is intended not only to manage crossings over the period of time through the summer, but also for us to collect data and run a variety of scenarios to understand the best way to address that particular intersection. Our hope is that by collecting that data, we'll be able to demonstrate to Caltrans that there are more options potentially than fully signalizing that intersection. If we're able to successfully do that, we may be able to put, for example, a pedestrian crossing beacon there, which might make more sense, but Caltrans is very uncomfortable with that at this time because they've had a few incidents on the South Shore with pedestrian crossing beacons that they're concerned with. But we feel that if we can test a number of scenarios, we might be able to um, demonstrate to them and really draw some support for additional options that we think that will be more palatable for the community in addition to that, if we were to fully signalize that intersection, there would likely be county costs to do so, and it would not be in an expensive endeavor. There is a significant difference in cost for building or fully signalizing an intersection to a pedestrian beacon. So while this is not an inexpensive endeavor, there are very few vendors that provide such a service, and the real goal here is to collect as much data as we can running a number of different scenarios so that we have more options in terms of addressing that intersection. Right now, we're pretty much stuck with fully signalizing it or leaving it as is and, and trying to address it that way. So I did want to provide that background because I know it is expensive, it's quite costly, um, I had a bit of sticker shock myself, um, but I do, in talking with community members and, and understanding some of the challenges that we have faced in, in trying to get Caltrans to think more flexibly, more broadly about options, this is, is maybe one of the best strategic paths to get there. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and conclude my remarks. Here are the three requested actions in front of your board today, and as I mentioned, there are Resort Association representatives here, as well as Peter Kratz with Public Works, if you have more questions on the projects I just covered. Thank you very much. Uh, and just uh, reaching back to the beginning of the meeting, this is the connection to the yes. putting in abeyance or whatever uh, the item that was on consent 31A. So. I, that, I'm going to have Peter discuss this because uh, there's, there's the connection, but not. Not, completely. And, Not and then, completely. And then maybe before There's we start. There's three items on the agenda that yes, are interconnected exactly. here. Right. And one was on consent, this one, and then one action. So there's part of my confusion. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Peter Kratz, Assistant Director of Public Works. And before you start, one question I have so you can answer. with um, Caltrans, the concern, of course, I understood about signalizing it. Um, so would they require that if it was signalized that it would have to be that way every day, all day long, not just peak hours? Correct, okay. just a traditional signalized intersection from my right. perspective. Okay. Um, a little bit maybe to address the confusion, the, I was not here this morning, I apologize, but the item that was pulled was the under consent, the procurement item that goes to awarding uh, the contractor to deploy this temporary signal. There is a public works department item that talks about enhancing crosswalks throughout the county including one on Grove Street up by the school, which has nothing to do with this item today. It's just geographically coincidental. So I apologize, we apologize for that. I hope that helps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I mean, are you done with your question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> um, so, so the other item, which I believe is 19, 19A, 19A 
Um, that is funded with the Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program, and you're uh, funding that through those state, or those federal funds for that enhancement of that crosswalk further up. Correct. And in this situation, we're using 100% TOT funds for Correct. this one. Right. I just Correct. want to make clear, we're using local dollars for this one, the one up by the school we're using federal dollars for. Um, and whether or not, you know, I, this was heard by the Resort Association Board and they supported it. Um, I, Peter, when was the last time we talked about the full uh, intersection signalization in the community? Because I'm thinking it was a number of years ago. It was. It was, it was at least five or more years ago. Yeah. And yes. so I'm not sure that the appetite is still the same mm -hmm. uh, about opposition to a full signalization. I know now being a resident of a county building on uh, the main street, it is very challenging to get out and make a left-hand turn. Uh, whatever time of day or night you're in that building. Uh, and so some sort of traffic control at that end um, might actually benefit, but I don't know. I'm not opposed to uh, trying this. I just wanted to call out that it's a lot of money for two and a half, three months of trial on this uh, program. And I don't know that the community sentiment is so opposed to a full signalization as it was then, because I think it was more like 10 years ago that we You're had a serious conversation about it, and mm -hmm. we've certainly seen that influx. So that was my only question on that. I right. do have a question on the tourism marketing. Yeah. So Real quick, and, that, yeah. and, and I think Aaron described it really well in terms of just, um, it's really looking for a long-term solution yep. and maybe saving dollars and getting back to Caltrans with data to show that hey, maybe a different uh, long-term solution like a pedestrian hybrid beacon, which was originally proposed about five years ago and Caltrans supported it, and then they backpedaled because they deployed one down at South Shore. They didn't, it didn't work very well, but it's a different location. Really, we really wanna try hard to look, what is the best solution kind of economically, safety, mobility, right. you know, that's the project purpose. Will it help? flow for a few months this season that'll be great that'll be like the icing on the cake but yep. hopefully it helps us with that and those of us making left turns will Absolutely. benefit coming out of zaws or going down from the school you'll benefit when the they stop for the pedestrians that's when you can finally get out onto the main road. exactly <laughs> so you know yep. <laughs> the pedestrians right. uh, help us maneuver exactly. in our vehicles so. thank you peter i thank appreciate you, that thanks a lot um and then this question might be for aaron or jeff on uh slide five of the presentation where we talk about increasing visitation during non-peak periods. I don't have to tell both of you how concerning our com concerned our community is about increased visitation and those that we can't control. Is there an opportunity for you to better expound on the types of visitation you're looking at, a la destination visitation, and I assume. Um, because I do think it's very hard for the community right now to think that anybody is being paid to market for more drive-up business right. for Tahoe. And yeah, so well that, Supervisor Gustafson, thank you for that uh, question, and I'm happy, to, uh, Chair Wagant and Board of Supervisors, thank you for the opportunity to address you this, uh, after, I think it's still morning or maybe it's afternoon now, but uh, certainly marketing North Lake Tahoe is one that uh, requires some sophistication. Um, yes, we know we have a, our peak seasons only getting peak, in peaker, I, I say, it's, it's getting busier. And our goal and our effort um, is to only uh, really drive where we need that help, which is shoulder season and midweek. And since I've been on board now for just over 16 months, uh, knowing that we've gone through uh, the, this COVID crisis, now that we're back uh, looking at budgets, marketing, and what we call promotions and consumer outreach, the one area, and as you know, we have a cooperative relationship with the Incline Village team. And so we co-brand North Lake Tahoe. The key area there that we're working on, and Andy Chapman, who's uh, my counterpart at Incline, um, we are, are dedicated to find every way possible uh, to what we call target market and find the way to drive what we call midweek business and shoulder season business. And uh, with the commencement of the T-bid, that is going to be even more of a focus because that is where we have to really allocate a lot of our focus, and that is to ensure as a deliverable, as a key what we call performance indicator, is to get uh, the people 
reallocated into those shoulder seasons of midweek and that's what we're, we're dedicated to do that and that requires a number of things it it's looking at more fly-in markets we certainly pull back on what we call drive markets and even then we'll target those drive markets that we feel will be strongest and have the highest percentage of success to drive that midweek and shoulder season as well as you know key demographics so um, hopefully i answered that question for you supervisor gustison i'm happy to uh, also elaborate more. Um, yes, I, I just want to make it really clear to the community, Jeff, that, that we're not paying for you to bring more drive up visitation to North Lake Tahoe. We all understand that what, where we're focused is in those shoulder seasons, and that doesn't necessarily mean drive up. I think a lot of the efforts from my experience and knowledge of what you do have been in the flight fly-in markets. That's correct. And I think we can't say that enough. The other thing you might address is what you're doing in stewardship yes. and educating the visitors with these dollars, because I think that's critical for the community to understand. And thank you for bringing that up. I was just going to add on to uh, what I was going to, uh, to talk about in terms of not only is our responsibility to make sure we're bringing the people here when we need them and when our business community needs them and not put stress on our community, but the folks that are coming up, and there's a, there's a, a, a percentage of people that visit our destination, it's called the day drive market and it's actually huge when you compare it to other destinations ours exceeds 40 percent sometimes it can exceed 50 percent these are folks coming from the bay area sacramento or reno as reno grows and that puts a ton of strain on our community um, overall our destination is committed to becoming a destination management organization more so than a marketing and what that means is we're going to be doing a better job and a more double down focus on what we call influencing the visitor, influencing those folks who are coming here and visiting, excuse me, influencing their behavior. So we have uh, put a lot of effort and time and resources into creating a know before you go. And we're now putting together our sustainability pledge, which we launched back on April 20th. And that is helping educate our visitor on the responsibility that they have to our very sensitive destination and community, not only respect to what North Lake Tahoe is, but also the people that live there. So that will continue and only be a big focus for our community, for our DMO and our destination management organization. I, I appreciate that. I know so much of the impact of day visitation is creating the anxiety in our community of uh, visita uh, visitors uh, not taking care of our community. And unfortunately, I do think um, that the day visitor is the one more impactful in the community from what we see and, and feel. And it's not the destination visitor, and yet they're getting tied together. And so that anxiety is creating huge tension in our community, as you know, and we've had a, a better part of two years now working on how to educate our community and how to educate our visitors and our second homeowners and <laughs> our destination visitors. But um, that tension is, is palpable everywhere we go and everyone I talk to, whether I'm in the grocery store or farmer's market last Thursday or <laughs> wherever I am. Um, people are just maxed out and, uh, and angry. And so the more we can guide that, I think it is critically important to the success for our community's well-being mentally and physically. So. And I agree. And it, we also have some great partnerships around the basin uh, led by uh, Take Care Tahoe, our organization, Incline and South Lake Tahoe. We've particip we're participating in educational billboards in those key drive up markets coming from the west or from the east side. So that's, I think, another good example of how we're doubling down on making sure we do everything we possibly can to influence these day drive visitors who do put a tremendous amount of stress on our region. Thank you. Okay, um, I think I need to get some clarification though. Uh, <laughs> what the heck, I gave up on the time part of it. Um, so we need to take this item, then 19A, then the item that was deferred on consent. Okay, everybody understand that? So, um, but I'm just following instruction, you know how I can do it. Good thing to do. So, so, we have um, item 7A, 1, 2, and 3. That's what we're dealing with first. Yes. And so we will now take public comment if there is any on that item.
Seeing none, I'll uh, bring it back to the board for action. We have approval. I'll second. Motion comes to send the second quarter. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aaron? <laughs> Are you going to do 19A? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so next we then will take up 19A, which is the public works item that was referred to earlier, uh, which is the crosswalk enhancement uh, bid. And Kevin. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. Uh, I'm Kevin Ordway with, with the Department of Public Works. And 19A um, actually doesn't relate to the temporary signal at all. <laughs> um, we understand that. OK. <laughs> uh, it is our crosswalk enhancement project, which is funded by the Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program. And we have two items we're asking you to do. The first one is to reject our first bid from Baldoni Construction. Um, from bid number 20172. And we only received one bid and it did not meet the requirements of the federal funding. So we had to reject it and rebid. Um, <coughs> we received three bids on our rebid and uh, we did receive a successful low bid um, and we've issued our notice of intent to award and we're in the protest period. Uh, we're asking that you adopt a resolution authorizing the director of public works or designee to award and execute a uh, construction contract um, up to an amount of $650,000 and to execute changes to the contract up to an additional $45,000 consistent with the public contract code section 20142 and the county procurement policy manual. And the reason we're doing this is because we had to rebid it. We're later in the construction season and we want to make sure we can get all these sites done before winter. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, any questions? Is there anyone from the public who'd like to address this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Move approval. Second. Motion, Gustafson, second homes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And now we will take up uh, consent item 31A. Good afternoon, supervisors. Brett Wood with your, your purchasing manager. This is the temporary signal. <laughs> um, <laughs> what we're requesting from your board is the approval of a competitive award number 20186 to Road Safety Services, Road Tech Safety Services of Shingle Springs, California for the temporary to traffic signal services in the total amount of $247,320 for the period of June 22nd through September 30th of this year. Also approve the cancellation of the remaining portion of that bid which was not able to find a successful vendor for it. As a bit of background for your board, we originally bid these services together under bid number 20177, and we were not able to find any vendor that was willing to respond to the services. So we then subsequently re, um, restructured the bid into, into independent components, and hence we're here today with a recommendation to award just the traffic signal element of that. Um, with that, happy to take any questions your board has. Cindy. <laughs> well, since I made this whole mess this morning, thank you everyone for bearing with me. But you've canceled the striping portion of this, and that's my confusion with the previous one where we were doing striping and crosswalk enhancements. Yes, ma'am. Um, and so that won't be done, or it will be done in another manner is kind of... We are looking into, the Department of Public Works and Procurement are looking at different options right now okay. to continue to provide those services, but we're trying to move forward with this component now while we attempt to find a resolution. For so them. we may come back with striping later. And if it is above 100,000, yes, ma'am, we would. If yeah. it was below 100,000, we, yeah. we, yeah. we would award that. OK, thank you. OK, uh, anyone from the public like to address this item? Seeing none, pleasure move, of the board. Move approval, second. Motion, Gustafson, second. Gore, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And thank Brett, you. since you're here, uh, we're going to launch over to uh, now I have two department items off of my agenda and I feel so relieved that I have a little bit of therapy in that regard since we are so far behind time. But could you take item 18, please, since you're here? Yes, sir. Um, one moment. Here I get to the right spot. Item 18 is a request from uh, a request for your board to approve a contract or to approve the cancellation of RFP number 20057 for dispute resolution services in accordance with the procurement policy. 
Also, uh, to request your board to approve request for proposal 20183 for dispute resolution services to Placer Dispute Resolution, Inc. of Rockland, California in the maximum amount of 175000 for a two-year period effective July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2023 and approve the option to renew that resulting contract on a year-to-year -year basis for two additional one-year periods in the maximum amount of $75,000 annually and delegate the signature authority for that for the required documents to the county executive officer subject to risk management and county council concurrence. As a bit of background for your board, in 2019, we originally issued an RFP for dispute resolution services, which, product, or which service has been in place since the early 1990s in Placer County. We issued that RFP in 2019. The responses were due in January of 2020. They were reviewed and evaluated, and um, a recommendation was being prepared at the time to bring to your board, and then COVID happened and it delayed that presentation until March 30th of this year. When that was presented to your board, there were questions that were raised in public, from public comment that hence resulted in a review and a recommendation, or that was, item was delayed to April 13th and then continued off calendar until to be determined. During that review process, it was determined that we should reissue the RFP uh, to make sure that it was fully compliant with the Dispute Resolution Act and the requirements thereof, as well as because it had been over a year since we originally did that, that there were potentially other interested parties that could respond. And that is standard practice for RFPs. If they're over a year old, we traditionally will reissue those. Uh, we reissued that RFP under 20183. It was distributed again to the community at large. We received more people in reviewing it there were, there were additional firms that reviewed it, and we ultimately received two responses, two, com two com comprehensive responses to that proposal. We had an entirely new evaluation panel. Uh, we had one repeat person from our courts team that was on that panel, but we had a, the rest of the panel was comprised of new people that evaluated that, and we uh, conducted interviews, and then are making a recommendation to move forward with Placer Dispute Resolution, Inc. We did receive a protest on that recommendation. Uh, that protest has been reviewed and denied. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that your board has. Any question, Jim? Uh, was there anybody from the CEO's office on that evaluation team? No, sir, there was not. Okay, thank you. No other questions? I'll open it up to the public for questions or comments. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I'll move approval. Motion, Gore, second, Jones. All those in favor say aye. 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 Roll call, please. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Why again? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Okay, we'll now take up our 1120 timed item uh, Parks and Open Space, Granite Bay Parks. Andy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Andy Fisher, Parks Administrator. Good afternoon to you. I'm here today to request this action that you conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution confirming the diagram and assessment and ordering levy of assessments for the fiscal year 2021-22 for the Granite Bay Parks, Trails, and Open Space Maintenance and Recreation Improvement District, uh, what we call for short the Granite Bay Lighting and Landscape District or Granite Bay LNL. The Granite Bay LNL is a property tax based assessment district. It was approved by the voters of Granite Bay in November of 2001. It's been collected annually on property taxes since that time. The district includes about 8,000 parcels that generally coincide with the Granite Bay community plan area with some additional uh, parcels within the Sterling Point subdivision to the north of the community plan area. The purpose of that assessment is to pay for parks and trails in the Granite Bay area, specifically Granite Bay Community Park, Douglas Ranch Park, Franklin School, Miners Ravine Nature Reserve, Ronald L. Feist Park, Sterling Point Park, Tree Lake Park, Tree Lake Terrace Park, along with about 50 miles of dirt and paved trails in Granite Bay. The formation documents of the Granite Bay LNL called for a method of annual uh, COLA increase not to exceed 3%. 
It prescribed the, uh, the specific index that we look at for COLA increases every year. And indeed this year, the index is calculated to be 3% or slightly above, so taken down to that, that top of 3%. Uh, if approved by your board, it would increase the assessment $2.67 per year for a total of $91.67 uh, cents per benefit unit or dwelling unit within that district. There's a total budget next year, if approved, of $818,000, just over. Uh, of that, the fees collected, the assessments would generate $707,000, or 87% of the total budget, with the remainder being considered general benefit coming from general funds and fees collected for rentals within that district. This is the third in a three-part um, trip to the board every year for to comply statutorily with the levy of the Granite Bay L&L assessment. Uh, the first of those was on February 9th where you directed the preparation of the annual engineer's report by uh, SCI consultants. In April, your board elected to continue the item uh, with some very good changes about the content of the engineer's report and those changes uh, included in the edited report uh, were some updated description of services. We described that some of the original uh, amenities that were to be paid for construction-wise in the beginning of this district had already been completed, so now we're more in maintenance mode within the district. It also provided improved detail on the map so people could see where they live versus where the facilities are better. <coughs> And then on May 25th, we return to your, to your board again to approve that engineer's report and set today's hearing. Uh, and with that, I would return it to your board for questions and the hearing. Thanks. <clears throat> Any questions? Board members, seeing none, I'll open it up to public for questions or comments. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Okay. Okay. Second. <laughs> Motion, Jones, second girl. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you. We'll now take up our 1135 timed item, which is Bickford Ranch Specific Plan Phase 1 Backbone Infrastructure Services. Good afternoon. Rebecca, Rebecca Tabor, Hi. Deputy Director of the Engineering and Surveying Division. This item before you is a consultant construction inspection services contract with Ghirardelli Associates in the amount of $960,850 for inspection of backbone infrastructure to support the first phase of the Bickford Ranch specific plan project. The developer, Bickford Improvement Company, will pay the full cost of this contract, as well as county staff time to manage the contract. The Engineering and Surveying Division solicited quotes from the county's approved qualified list and selected Ghirardelli as the best firm to perform these services. The scope includes inspection of the phase one rough grading project, backbone roadway improvements, and about one mile of off-site sewer main to connect to the existing sewer in Highway 193. The construction staging area is being set up now off of Sierra College Boulevard. The rough grading project is ready to begin. Backbone sewer and roadway improvements are scheduled to begin in the August timeframe. Off-site water improvements will be starting in the fall. They are targeting the first building permits as early as winter of 2022. With that, the actions requested of your board are one, to authorize the purchasing manager to award contracts under the existing MSA for construction inspection services involving Bickford Ranch specific plan phase 1A backbone infrastructure with an aggregate amount of $960,850 and to execute, execute contract change orders in an amount up to 10% of the contract amount. Two, approve the author and authorize the Community Development Resource Agency Director, or designee, to execute a construction inspection services agreement with the constructing developer, Bickford Improvement Company, to fund both consultant construction inspection services and a portion of county staff time for inspection to manage the contracts. And three, approve a budget amendment to increase appropriations by $960,850 to the fiscal year 21-22 CEDRA final budget with the offsetting revenue provided by the constructing developer, Bickford Improvement Company. And I'm available to answer any questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Any questions, board members? Seeing none, uh, excuse me, with that, I'll open up to the public for questions, comments. Seeing none, uh, uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Move approval. Second. Motion, home second, Gore. We need a roll call on this and that it involves a budget amendment. Um, Gore? Aye. Holmes? 
Gustafson. Aye. Wygant. Yeah. And if we can, could we, thank you. Thank you. Uh, jump to item 15B, which is the Betstolt building. Is that the right one? Yes, thank you. Um, Before you start, yes. I need to announce I need to recuse on this item. My husband's engineering firm works for uh, Tahoe City Lodge, and they're involved with the easement. Thanks, Cindy. We're going to see um, Megan is Eric on. I can speak to this if he isn't. He's not. Okay. Um, oh, here he is. Oh. Yes. Yes, he is. <laughs> he made it. Hey, you can grab my water, Megan, so you may not have bailed me out if I start choking. I apologize. Here, here. Take this. <laughs> Eric, I have, I have never seen you move that fast. Yeah, I don't normally move that fast. <laughs> His ears were burning. <laughs> Okay, we all set? Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. There we go. Eric Finley, uh, property manager for the Department of Facilities Management, Real Estate Services Division. And I'm here to discuss and present to you the uh, opportunity to buy. <coughs> all right, I'm gonna grab Todd's water. <laughs> Yeah. You're gonna be here all day. This is great for me. Thank you. In fact, on your way out, could you um, could you order dinner for us? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the opportunity to purchase the Bechtold Building property in Tahoe City for four million dollars. I'm going to read the action request. The request is to adopt a resolution to approve the purchase and sale agreement for the acquisition of the Bechtold Building at 243 North Lake Boulevard from Sierra Northwest Properties and authorize the Director of Facilities Management <coughs> to execute the agreement and take all act, uh, actions necessary to implement the agreement. We are requesting you approve budget amendments for FY21-22 that will transfer general fund capital reserves from facilities and infra infrastructure cost center <coughs> to Capital Project Fund Budget, uh, PJ01723 Bechtel Building Acquisition. And we request that this get added to the capital assets list at once acquired. So the Bechtel Building is a 10,000 plus square foot building, two stories, commercial building with a full basement. It's on approximately 0 0.71 acres, and it has 95 to 99% hard coverage or impermeable coverage, which is very rare actually, so that the site is entirely covered, which is good, it makes it uh, very versatile. It has 35 parking spaces, and it has a critical road access and utility easement um, along the eastern boundary that has utilities and access to surrounding, excuse me, properties. There are currently six commercial tenants in the building, and then the owner has also a commercial suite that he currently occupies. So the importance of this property, it's strategically located in uh, areas that will access public recreation with the Tahoe City PUD golf course and also for uh, economic development and the adjacent Tahoe, uh, Tahoe Lodge project redevelopment uh, project, excuse me. It fronts North Lake Boulevard. It's near the Y in Tahoe City and it provides critical access to those areas behind and the adjacent commercial redevelopment area. Um, county's ownership of the property will provide improved access and circulation. <clears throat> the 35 parking spaces will help the county address parking needs in Tahoe City and will provide opportunity for shared use parking agreements. And again, the 95% to 99% provides a lot of opportunity for the property should anybody have a future use or design. I mean, it's just, it's very versatile having that amount of coverage. Um, it is zoned mixed use town center, which provides a variety of opportunities for a variety of uses. There is a large vacant um, commercial space that was vacated by Plumas Bank that could be used by the county if so desired or for economic opportunity for somebody else. 
excuse me. Um, the county is not proposing at this time to do any changed use in the building. We will assume the leases for the existing tenants. So there is no plan changed in the community of what we are doing. But ownership will address the uncertainties regarding the easements and community access through the property. And the county will work with the adjacent uh, Tahoe, Tahoe City PUD and with the Tahoe Lodge project to confirm and manage the access. So the deal points, um, it's a $4 million purchase. Um, we are requesting the budget amendments and authorizations for $4 million and $40,000 to cover all acquisition costs, uh, reports, investigations, uh, escrow. The county is covering the escrow costs and title insurance. There is a $100,000 refundable deposit that will be due within 10 days of executing the agreement. And this will be a very quick close. We will have a brief investigation period, but our, the agreement provides that close of escrow will occur within 30 days of executing the purchase and sale agreement. So may, may hopefully happen ha faster, but within 30 days of signing the agreement, we will close escrow. Um, again, we will assume the county leases, or the, I'm sorry, the tenant leases for the existing tenants. And the building owner that currently occupies a suite will uh, be allowed to remain in that suite until October 2021 at no rent, but they will be required to pay utility fees. And with that, I will take a breath and see if there are any questions. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> um, are there any questions by board members at this time? Uh, Suzanne. Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> ask, thank you for that. Yeah, sorry for the rest presentation. I guess maybe yeah. <laughs> appreciate that, but. In our board docs, it says on the second page here that the potential exists that uh, Tahoe City Lodge project could later purchase the Bechtel property and incorporate this property into its potential development plans. I just wondered if you could. Um, I think that potential exists. I think we would have to make sure we follow any um, laws as far as sale of property once required, whether, and I would have to defer uh, to council as far as whether there would be surplus land act requirements or there, but if there's an, uh, a possibility that it might be incorporated in the project. I think that's something that could be pursued in the future. Okay, good, thank you. And just one other Plenty. question. Mm -hmm. um, and to clarify, uh, this, you said coverage. So this property could be utilized at some point for commercial, um, hotel, um, residential, or maybe affordable housing, workforce housing, all sorts of uses um, that the county could either utilize it to develop or sell the the land correct correct so that it's mixed use you could do anything pretty much on that property uh, in the town center mixed use zoning and it's just the fact that the coverage is so extensive you, you know you normally have to design or there's 25 percent coverage and then you have to design around and allow enough of, this is essentially 100 percent covered so you have a lot of options as to what you would do on the property uh, and be able to construct if you so chose and again we're not proposing anything at this time thank you Okay, any questions from the public or comments? See none. Um, I, Cheryl, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, right, thank you, Cheryl Berkema. Um, the, the, uh, the presentation um, that addressed the questions that it could be sold, so, that, so basically the county is um, taking, proposing taking four million plus dollars, and rather than put that towards workforce housing, which is desperately needed, we heard from multiple directors this morning about the dire situation for workforce housing, and now because it's desired that we have something that could be economically feasible, where is the due diligence in? how this money is going to be spent and what it's going to be spent on there were in the housing element there were multiple properties targeted for workforce housing and for affordable housing why is the four million dollars not more appropriate for the plan that was laid out for affordable and workforce housing this seems like a, a carrot just hanging there just because something is desired doesn't mean that there's a plan, it's economically feasible, or 
that it's addressing the needs for the community. We heard those needs this morning. This seems rather frivolous and rather um, beneficial to potential private developers. So I, I hope that there would be some sort of an act actual plan on paper as to why this purchase is necessary other than it's desirable and South thinks it's desirable. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? No further public. <clears throat> okay, so with that, uh, bringing it back to the board, but uh, we need, to, there are four items. Uh, the resolution for the purchase and sale agreement, two budget items, and uh, the authorization uh, regarding the addition of the property to the county's comprehensive capital asset uh, list, and we have to take them individually. So. Which is the adoption of the, for the resolution to approve the purchase and sale agreement. I'll second. Uh, motion home, second Gore. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, we need, no. we need we, that's okay. Right. So on item two, we have to uh, approve the budget amendment and a roll call vote regarding that for, for the uh, 2021 budget in the amount of 4040000 acquisition cost, including the cost due diligence, et cetera. I'll second. Motion, home, second, Gore. Uh, roll call, please. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Why again? Yes. And the uh, third item is also a budget amendment, but related to the capital fund budget. Second. Motion, Holmes, second, Gore. Uh, roll call, please. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Why again? Yes. And the last item four is to authorize the addition of the property to the county's comprehensive capital asset list. Second. Motion, Holmes, second, Gore. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to our 1140 timed item, uh, which is the Mason Trail Subdivision County Service Area 28. Will, there he is. Good afternoon, Will Garner, Public Works Department. Uh, and yes, this item is the annexation of the proposed Mason Trail Subdivision into existing zone of benefit 224 for transit services. Um, in 2017, your board approved and uh, uh, zone 224 for transit services within the Riolo Vineyards um, plan area, uh, but it did not include this proposed subdivision. So this subdivision, which um, is adjacent to what's already in zone 224, is, uh, had, was approved for a um, tentative map earlier this year in January, and to uh, be finalized, it needs to annex into the existing zone of benefit. This zone of benefit pays for uh, a portion of the future transit services to the entire West Placer area, including um, Riolo Vineyards. Um, and in, in order to do that, um, we must take a couple of actions today. First is to open a public hearing to consider any protests. Um, and then number two would be to adopt a resolution an annexing Mason Trails and imposing the annual assessment, which is um, would be $50.76 per uh, individual unit uh, within the subdivision. So with that, take any questions. Thanks, Will. Any questions by board members? Seeing none, I will open up the public hearing. Consider any protest? Seeing none. Seeing none uh, the clerk will please tabulate the... We received one ballot in favor. Thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, we have the resolution before us. Pleasure of the board. Move approval. Motion Gore, second Holmes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thanks, Will. Okay, thanks. And our 1150 timed item is our affordable housing task force, Shauna. There you go. Good afternoon, Shauna Pervines, Deputy Director, uh, Community Development Resources Agency. Um, by way of just a brief background, um, what brings us this item today, um, it was back in 2018 where we began setting that foundation for our housing program um, today. And that included the development of the housing strategy and development plan. Um, that included a, a, a deep review of our uh, housing capacity along with our housing needs and identified some best practices um, for our program. That information has been um, embedded in our annual work programs going forward. 
Um, to get there, we worked with stakeholders to identify ways to increase housing supply of affordable housing, and we identified housing opportunity sites. Um, we recognized we also needed the analysis of a housing funding and investment strategy. And as part of that analysis, we determined that the gap was so steep that we would not be able to do it simply with uh, the requirements of new development, um, including housing as part of their projects. Um, so we looked at the uh, public-private partnership, um, and that is uh, when we uh, began to support the development of a private housing trust. In 2020, we worked with the Building Industry Association uh, to support the development of Housing Trust Placer. And um, as part of that um, effort, we identified the need for an advisory council to help uh, with the county's investment in those public-private uh, opportunities. So uh, this year, on uh, February 9th, your board uh, approved the framework for the Housing Development Task Force. Um, that included, uh, comprised of nine members uh, with expertise in housing development. Um, and uh, that uh, effort also, oh look, there it is, all good, there. Uh, the task force would also uh, be uh, held, re hold regular public meetings and um, would be subject to Brown Act to consider housing development proposals. Um, research possible affordable housing projects, primarily looking at the housing opportunity sites that we've already identified, and many um, have been included in the recently uh, adopted housing element update. Um, and also provide funding recommendations to your board for the development of workforce and affordable housing. Um, this is a strictly recommendation uh, body, um, and their terms are anticipated to be uh, roughly two years, with the first round being a two, three year split, just so that we don't completely um, uh, turn the board over in that first two year term. So on February 22nd, uh, staff released the announcement that the county was accepting applications for this nine-seat uh, nine housing task force. To our surprise, we received 37 applications for this. Um, it was That was a pleasant surprise um, to see so much interest. Um, and so we, um, we had uh, the uh, difficulty of, of looking at, you know, bringing that a recommendation to your board for uh, nine people to sit on this. Um, each of those applications did uh, self-select their expertise. Um, and so in some instances uh, where we only receive one application, those are the recommendations that are being brought for you. Um, in some, in two categories, we received a number of applications. One was building experience and the other was um, housing advocacy. So we, the, the next step uh, staff took was to look geographically at where these applicants um, either uh, spent, uh, worked and or resided so that we could best represent um, all of our unique communities uh, in uh, Placer County. Um, you will note that there are not representation from the uh, Tahoe area and that's because we are working on a separate effort in the Tahoe area with the Mountain Housing Council and with the Tahoe Truckee Workforce Housing Authority as part of their JPA. Um, so these representations are primarily on the west side and it's the, uh, the vision of this task force that they'll be primarily focused in on the west side. So with that, staff is recommending um, uh, for the nine seats, we have Linda Timbers for building uh, and infill development, Sue Thompson as community foundation, Jackie Hoyt, residential broker, uh, Tim on, on Durko for commercial broker, Ryan Hensley, mortgage lender, Maggie Tides for attorney, um, Todd James, student housing, he is actually uh, employed with Sierra College and working on their housing. Um, effort and been a good partner with us. Um, and then our two at-large um, housing advocate is Jamie Knack and realtor uh, Gary Mappa. Um, I want to stress that for all of the applicants, we reached out to them and encouraged them to continue to participate. Um, they will be noticed for all meetings um, and we will continue to ask them to be there. Uh, the expertise of the 37 applicants is something we desperately need to be a part of our solutions going forward. So with that, staff is asking uh, your board approval um, for the uh, applicants to fill the nine seats of the new Placer County Housing Development Advisory Task Force um, that is outlined in Resolution A of your staff report. Any questions, comments by board members? Uh, Cindy. 
Thanks, Shauna. I know that we had tremendous applicants, and Amazing. and just looking through those, I need, I know a couple of them are out here in the audience, and I'm I'm so pleased with the feedback. Anything we can do to keep them all participating would be great. I'm sorry we had to limit it, but it would be unruly to have 37. So uh, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. But um, I I hope you all know that there were some really great applicants, and thank you for your volunteer. Uh, time and to all the applicants for their um, being willing to serve on this really important committee. So, uh, Jim, I'm just looking, just looking forward to moving forward some progress on this. Um, we've got a wide range of applicants, and it looks like we're headed on the right track. So, I'm looking forward to moving forward, and I would be pleased to make a motion to approve this item. Motion, home second, Gustafson. But before I do that, I'll open it up to the public. For any comment if there is any. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Twilight, you, you just have the one item, correct? So since you've been so patiently uh, sitting there, uh, we'll take up item 16B, Community Mental Health Services Block Grant Application. Thank you so much to my um, favorite chair this morning. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> this afternoon. All right. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, only the chair, though. You guys are my favorite supervisors. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, Twyla Abrahamson, Director of the Children's System of Care, for the record. And I'm here today to present this item on behalf, uh, behalf of both the children and adult system of care. So the Federal Community Mental Health Services Block Grant has funded services to children, adults and older adults with serious mental illness in Placer County for the past 20 years. The Children's System of Care leverages these resources to help deliver counseling, social skills training, and peer support to youth from either probation or child welfare services who have come into a uh, been at risk of entry into foster care. In fiscal year 2021, 140 of these youth, many of whom would otherwise require ex extensive and expensive psychiatric hospital uh, care, have received these resources. For the adult system of care, in collaboration with the Advocates for Mentally Ill Housing, they utilize this funding to provide secure, stable housing to adults and seniors with serious mental illness, as well as support services, such as psychiatric assessment, referrals, and counseling. This support aids clients in proving, improving skills that allow them to live independently and become financially stable while reducing the need for costly inpatient hospital services. So in fiscal year 2021, 232 adults have successfully obtained stable housing and or received community referrals, outreach, and assessments for additional services. So we are requesting that the board take the following action. Adopt a resolution ratifying the application for the renewal of the Community Mental Health Services Block Grant for fiscal year 21-22 in an amount not to exceed $816,077, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign and submit the application in all resulting documentation, including reports, agreements, and certifications as required to accept the funds, and to sign any subsequent amendments not to exceed $81,607, consistent with the subject matter and scope of work, with risk management and county council concurrence. These are federal re revenues, and their associated expenditures are included in the department's 21-22 budget, and so no county general funds are required. So thank you for your consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions by board members? Seeing none, is there anyone from the public with questions or comments? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the board? Second. Motion home, second core. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank Opposed? you so much. Thank you. So with that, I think we will adjourn to... Okay. Um, what item is that, Jim? Do you, oh, that's item 16A. So come on, Vicki. We'll, we'll finish you up, and then we'll break. Sorry, Amy, you have to wait. I, you have too I, many items. The problem, Amy, is that you're here for two or three days, I think, so we can't stand up that long. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're my favorite, too. I was trying to be patient like Twyla. I know we're entertaining, but... Uh... <laughs>
Good afternoon, board members. My name is Vicki Grenier, Deputy Director of HHS Administrative Services. I'm here today to request the approval to adopt a resolution authorizing the Director of Health and Human Services, or designee, to execute 48 identified agreements for various HHS services pursuant to the terms contained in the resolution, also known as the HHS Annual Contract Resolution, in the amount not to exceed $8,284,765. HHS administers over 600 contractual agreements, mostly requiring Board of Supervisor approval. These services include vital and often mandated services, such as inpatient psychiatric services, prevention and early intervention, and family resource services. As a significant efficiency improvement 20 years ago, the Board of Supervisors approved a single resolution process for expenditure agreements. The following criteria for this cycle include recurring agreements with an annual contract amount of less than 400,000 each, agreements which were originally approved as a standalone items by the Board, agreements to be executed with the effective beginning dates during fiscal year 21-22 with a term no longer than two years, agreements that do not currently require competitive or bid or proposal process, and the execution is subject to concurrence with risk management and county council. The attachment identifies all 48 agreements listed at the current contracted amount. The requested amount includes up to 10% increase to allow for possible changes within the existing scope of services plus a 10% maximum for potential amendment authority. The services for fiscal year 21-22 are already included in the adopted fiscal 21-22 budget. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the HHS contracts team, Kelly Barton, Alexis Madera, and Joey Wadowitz, along with staff services manager, Nancy Baggett, for their hard work on all HHS contracts. Their dedication and diligence do not go unnoticed and they have demonstrated unwavering service to HHS, particularly throughout the last 16 months. I would also like to thank Joel Joyce, Renju Jacob, Risk Management and Procurement for their continued effort, efforts working with HHS on all contractual agreements. HHS has the ability to execute hundreds of agreements annually due to this team's excellent contribution along with the board's approval. I'm here to answer any questions you may have and I appreciate your consideration adopting this resolution requested for these valuable HHS services. And thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vicki. Any questions uh, by board members? Is there anyone from the public that'd like to address this item? See none, what's the pleasure of the board? Second. Motion home, second Gore. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, now we will Mr. Listen. Chair, I, I don't know if you don't mind because Andy Fisher has one item which should be very brief and then it allows him to leave as well if okay, you don't mind. Okay. I'm sorry, but <laughs> if that's okay. He was, I, yeah, I know I feel her. <laughs> yeah, but she's got like 15 <laughs> items and Andy has one. <laughs> and, and we will try to get out of lunch fairly early, uh, Amy, so. You're the greatest board ever. <laughs> know that. That's, that's why actually much. why I did it. I was looking for the comment. <laughs> you get it. You get it. Thank the you. The correct comment is that uh, we're so entertaining, you're disappointed that you won't be able to sit here and I watch us. Still and stick around. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, being thrifty for that grace you just gave me, I'll get right to it. Andy Fisher, Parks Administrator. Uh, the item before you today is to approve the award of competitive request for proposals number 20127 to Kegwin and Dorward Landscape Contractors, LLC of Roseville, for park and landscape maintenance services for the period July 1, 2021 through June 30th of 24, in the maximum annual amount of $1,232,655 for this coming fiscal year with cost of living adjustment increases of 2% per annum for the two subsequent years. Secondly, to approve an option to renew, so following those two subsequent years, uh, the resulting award for three additional one-year periods to include negotiated COLAs for those years, uh, provided the renewal amounts do not exceed 12% of the original aggregate award, and finally, to authorize a county executive or designee to sign all those required documents. Uh, so we're here really on behalf of three different departments, Parks, Public Works, and telecom all use this contract, but Parks is the major user with 88 different sites that we use. And, and this, uh, the maintenance service contract is really the backbone contract for our, what we call our production uh, maintenance services in our parks, in our um, 
along some of our trails, along landscape areas, along the different campuses of our different office buildings. Um, and this uh, service provides for, for prescribed mowing, fertilizing, weeding, irrigation, simple irrigation repairs, trash pickup and restroom service and general cleaning. So that's what the contractor does. The remaining staff that we have also uh, has moved into where, where they're involved, particularly in contract oversight, uh, customer requests and problem solving, more complex repairs, what we call porter service, kind of filling in the gaps and looking at the entire site, seeing what may not have got caught on the days that our contractor is there uh, and taking care of open space and uh, fire risk uh, vegetation. Um, control in a lot of our sites as well. This has become a very efficient model for us um, and has allowed us to continue service delivery for uh, with very modest increases over the last 10 years. Cagwin and Dorward has been our contractor for the last four years. They really became kind of fully integrated into all of our sites within the last two years since 2019. We've been very uh, happy with with Cagwin's work and um, at the end of, a, of the solicitation process, we we're recommending a continuation of this contract with Cagwin and Dorward. Um, I do want to mention some about the procurement process itself uh, for this contract, and Brett Wood is also here who was involved in that procurement process for any questions that may come up. The RFP was distributed to 267 potential bidders, uh, but we only received three proposals out of that solicitation. Uh, again, this will serve 88 sites for uh, parks, uh, landscape and park sites. Uh, in addition to telecom uses this service for some of their big antenna uh, property and uh, DPW uses it for some uh, median road, roadway medians and, and, and landscaping. So uh, in closing, if this is awarded, this initial three-year contract would begin in July 1. Uh, the beginning value would be $1.232,655,000. Uh, for the initial year with the pre-prescribed uh, COLA increases thereafter. And all of the funding for this contract comes from the various uh, corresponding operating budgets. Some of those uh, general fund, department budgets, uh, county service areas, and we make sure that this is invoiced in the, in the correct way, categorized to get into the right buckets to get paid for with the right funding. But all of that funding is included in the budget that was approved earlier today by your board. So with that, I'll return uh, to your board for any questions uh, and approval. Hopefully. Thanks, Andy. Any questions, board members? Uh, Jim. Oh, I, do, I don't have a question. I just, I've just i seen the work that these folks do uh, around this facility, and uh, they're in pretty early and try to get it done, and they have more than one person or several people coming in and uh, doing a good job. So I just appreciate the work they do. Thank you. I'll pass that along. I'll appreciate that. Suzanne. Hi, Andy. Um, just curious. Is this one of the um, maintenance uh, companies that does maintenance in the Granite Bay area as well, our parks system? That's correct, in, almost, in all the sites in Granite Bay. Okay. That's right. Good. Thank you. Any questions, comments from uh, public? With that, I'll bring it back to the board. Move approval. Second. Motion, Gore. Second, Holmes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'm going to take one more item. <laughs> Bill Hardner is here. Uh, we're going back to 15 Atherton Tech Center improvement projects uh, regarding the clerk recorder improvements. 15? Then we're leaving for sure. No. <laughs> I don't care what anybody else says. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> and um, hello to the board. My name is Bill Lardner. I'm with Facilities and the Capital Improvements Division. So the item I have here today is uh, requesting your approval of the plans and specifications for the Atherton Tenant Improvement Project in uh, uh, 3715 Atherton Road in Rockland. Um, this will become and has served already uh, as the elections warehouse for the clerk recorder. And uh, at the completion of the project, it will become um, the main offices for the uh, Placer County clerk recorder and registrar of voters. And so with your approval, uh, we would go out to bid and uh, you know, but not authorize a um, uh, delegated award of contract. It would be just for bidding. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is that we would like to know how much it's going to cost, which is a difficult thing to ascertain right now. Uh, 
So we've established a range that we think it will cost. Uh, we're hoping it'll be around 11,400,000. Um, and we will return to the board with our bids uh, when those are uh, obtained. So um, the uh, uh, schedule for the project is that hopefully we'll get a very good award and uh, be able to start our contractor off in August of this year. Uh, that might be a little uh, uh, optimistic, but we're still thinking that we can do the first phase, which is the elections warehouse half of the building uh, in six months, and then proceed to phase two, which would be the rest of the building in the following six months, so that we should be complete by the end of August or middle of August in 2022. So, uh, yes, the fiscal impact is going to have to be determined, and um, as I mentioned, we're only partially funded right now with a uh, $4,503,345 from the general fund. So, with that, I'll take any questions, comments? Questions by board members? Seeing none, is there anyone from the public? What is the pleasure of the board? Second. Motion. Second. No, no, go ahead. I put it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting we're getting punchy. <clears throat> motion Holmes second Jones. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We will now Thank you very adjourn much. To, to lunch and closed session. Thanks, Bill. The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider one item of existing litigation and one item of anticipated litigation. Thank you.
Okay, the board has returned from closed session and lunch and county council will report out. The board met in closed session to consider one item of existing litigation, that being in Ray Cherish Rogers. In this matter, the board heard a report and authorized settlement. The board then heard a report under anticipated litigation, potential exposure to litigation. The board heard a report and provided direction. This concludes the report out of closed session. Thanks, Karen. <clears throat> okay, the board, um, our next timed item is 2.30, so we will take up department items. We'll start with item 20A, report on the American Rescue Plan Act. Daniel. Good afternoon, Chair Wigand, <laughs> members of the board. Daniel Chatney with the County Executive Office. Pleased to be here talking about something not budget. But <laughs> <laughs> kind of. But, but kind of related. So. so this item today is a discussion regarding the American Rescue Plan Act and an introduction to the major component of the act as it applies to the county and to seek the board's input on next steps. A little bit of background. The American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, was signed into law on March 11, 2021. It established the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. And this was a $350 billion package to provide fiscal relief for local governments, 65.1 billion of which was designated for counties, and 77,370,739 allocated to Placer County. These funds apply to costs incurred after March 3rd, 2021. Funds must be obligated by December 31st of 2024 and funds must be fully spent and projects completed by December 31st of 2026. One of the first things we have on our list of things to do is an interim spending report that's due August 31st of this year. And then also that day is our first annual recovery plan performance report that will be due. The funds, um, the CSLFRF, funds are currently under the authority of an interim final rule from the Department of Treasury, which is still subject to further change in guidance as it becomes available. But there are four general categories of eligible uses included in here. Uh, the first one is to respond to public health emergency and negative economic impacts from COVID-19, to address public sector revenue loss, to address premium pay for essential workers, and finally, for water, sewer, or other broadband infrastructure uses. So we'll go through each of those four categories in a little bit more detail. The first, responding to the public health emergency. So this would be supporting such items as contact tracing, vaccination support, assistance for quarantined individuals, addressing the mental health impacts caused by COVID-19, or to address deferred public health measures, including childhood vaccinations and things like that. Also in that broad category is addressing the economic impacts, or the negative economic impacts from COVID-19. These would be uh, more geared towards households or businesses that had a direct negative imp economic impact from COVID-19. And this is measured by first considering whether an economic harm exists and that it was caused by the pandemic or worsened by the pandemic, and then addressing how this uh, program or process will support that uh, recovery. The next major category is public entity revenue loss. So this is revenue loss for the county uh, measured relative to the revenue collected in fiscal year 2018-19 or the full fiscal year before the COVID-19 public health emergency. This is to be measured entity-wide which means we'll be calculating this as a whole for the entire county and not specific to any specific revenue sources or budget units. So for example, we won't be able to pick out sales tax or public safety sales tax, but we'll be looking at it as countywide revenue. The, the amounts that we calculate as public entity revenue loss and we claim against the 77 million can be used toward the provision of any government services. So it is in, in effect the most flexible spending option that we have under the this act premium pay is uh, for eligible workers that have, were performing essential work during COVID-19 
This would require regular in-person interaction between people or regular physical handling of items handled by others. This is one of the only categories in the act that applies retroactively before March 3rd of this fiscal year. And then water, sewer, and broadband. So the, the objectives for infrastructure spending to improve access to clean drinking water, to improve wastewater and stormwater infrastructure systems, or to provide an adequate and, and to provide an adequate minimal level of service for broadband services. So going a little bit more into that, here are some the the guidance uh, from the Treasury at this point outlines that projects should be necessary unlikely to be met by private sources of funds, and that the projects are in, alignment, are in alignment with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund program. So as long as the projects mirror the types of projects that those two sources would fund, um, the projects would generally be considered eligible. Um, we do, the county does have flexibility to meet the needs of, of our local community with this. And here are some examples of some of the projects that might fall into that category. Replacing lead service lines, consolidation or establishment of drinking water systems, providing cybersecurity for these infrastructure systems, constructing publicly owned treatment infrastructure, facilitating water reuse, and managing or treating stormwater. Oh, sure, sure. Before you move on. Um, Great um, slides on all this, Daniel. I just had a question, and broadband, and nothing there talks about broadband on that particular slide, and I was looking at these earlier, so. So broadband, we actually just received new specific okay. guidance on broadband within, I think it was just this last week that we received that. In general, it's providing broadband where there's, um, to, to bring it to a minimum level of service, it has to meet a certain low level of service or no service and then you can bring it up to a minimum standard and there's the megabytes and all that that go into that calculation the upload, download speeds yes. and all that yes. okay so so more we've been asked to weigh in on that because i think the standards are too low for yeah. most people's services so so we, we can we can cpuc asked us to weigh in on that just in our meetings with sudden link so yeah yeah okay guess, so we just received that guidance last week and didn't incorporate it into the slides yet but we can follow up as with the new the new rules there um, again the, the flexibility so the interim final rule allows local governments to transfer funds to other government agencies private entities and special purpose districts any transferee will be considered a sub recipient and and then be responsible for their their own reporting to the federal government which does not absolve us from managing those sub recipients and also reporting on our behalf of their work there are specific restrictions or ineligible uses within the plan or in the American Rescue Plan. Some of those are deposits into pension or any rainy day funds. We are allowed to, to make regular pension payments for those employees that are predominantly responding to the COVID-19 pandemic still, but not making a lump sum payment into pension or rainy day funds. Um, not allowed to use for debt service or legal settlements and not to be used for matching funds unless they're specifically allowed by the federal program. Um, offsetting tax cuts, that's a state level um, ineligible activity. It doesn't apply to us, but, and then general infrastructure outside of water, sewer, or broadband. So the, the, our, one of our first reports due August 31st is the Re Recovery Plan Performance Report. This is to include descriptions of projects funded and information on performance indicators and objectives for each award. The initial report will recover activity from the date we received the funds, which was the middle of May through July 31st of this year. The report's due August 31st, and then subsequent reports will be required annually. Also on August 31st, we're, we are required to produce our, um, an interim project and expenditures report. And this is an interim report, a spending report to cover the cost or the, the money spent between the time we received the money, again, middle of May through July 31st. It's also due by August 31st. It will include county expenditures at the summary level, and then subsequent reports are due each quarter uh, through December 31st of 2026. So t part of today's conversation is to focus a little bit on 
determining spending priorities. So those are the four major categories. And this, and then some specific types of spending activities or um, specific priorities under each one. You can see under infrastructure, water, sewer, and broadband again. Under COVID response, that can address affordable housing. It can address physical and mental health issues. It says parks and trails as it may relate to um, mental health issues and providing opportunities for people to recreate and, and improve their well-being that way. Revenue loss, which would apply, allow the opportunity to address any government services. And then premium pay for eligible essential workers. And this is merely an example of how funds can be distributed. Certainly we have the maximum flexibility to address one or all of those categories and in whichever um, uh, amounts would make sense to our community in, in, in recovery. So for board direction, we're seeking some consideration of, of whether to address and how to address external requests for funding. Um, perhaps forming an internal subcommittee for the process, defining criteria for projects and programs, a format for requests for proposals, uh, just to provide some standardization and consistency in, in the types of applications we receive, review and recommend, uh, and to review and recommend any of the awards um, from there. Also be looking to address any internal uses in defining the criteria for our internal programs, services, and other staffing needs. And then determine whether there's an interest from the board um, to, to set amounts for each category um, as we get closer to our first reporting requirement date of August 31st. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it to back to the board for questions or comments or just to begin the conversation. As I mentioned, we have a, our first reporting is due August 31st and generally it would be in broad strokes of how we expect to spend the money um, and which is going to be revised quarterly as we spend it and then annually again with the performance plan report. So thanks Daniel. Questions, comments, board, Cindy. I hadn't even hit my button I know, yet. I know. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying not to be so vocal today, but a lot of items. Um, thanks, Daniel, and great report. Um, um, we, I've already been approached, um, and I think Todd has as well, by a couple of the water providers in North Tahoe about, and I'm sure um, they'll jump in and comment on this as well, on some of their requests, so external organizations. But I wanted to talk a little bit about our internal needs as well as the, the housing uh, topic. Um, when we talk about affordable housing, have they defined that any, is there any more detail on that? Because we heard a lot of public comment earlier today on the crisis uh, in housing and how, how we might be able to assist in that. And I think it is legitimately driven by the pandemic and the, the exodus of people um, from other areas to our communities driving up prices. So trying to see if there's any more data there, I'd love to see that. And then also just looking at our own uh, governmental needs uh, as well as a, as a top priority for the county to make sure that we're serving all of the county as equitably as possible through, the, through this process. The cities also receive an allocation. That's correct. Yes. And so it's really the unincorporated areas that we're focused on. Yes. So can I well, yeah. add on to that? Yeah. Um, so we got money based on the population of 400,000, <clears> right? And then each of the cities got an amount for their residents based on their population. But the county also serves the entire county, including residents within the city. Right. So as we look at this, I think we should be mindful that it isn't just the unincorporated areas that we're right. serving. Uh, because if we're talking about affordable housing or mental health, uh, that we get funds for all the residents within our community. Right. And I want to make sure that we're not just allocating funds solely on um, things that only um, address unincorporated community members. No, I, I, I agree maybe with if that. I, could I just, just, I just want to make. <laughs> I just, but I, I also don't want to maybe double it. Yeah. Resolve that is if we could focus on where we might want to spend monies in incorporated areas, being based on the services we provide to the incorporated areas, not 
not the services that the cities provide. So right. So we don't duplicate that. Yeah, that was my only yeah. point, yeah. not to say it all goes there. I realize we received it per capita. And then the other thing that I, I know that we've been talking a lot about and we're hoping that potentially this was the source of funding for was any efforts in forest fuels, mm -hmm. in biomass and in that infrastructure. So I know that isn't outlined here. Maybe there's other types of infrastructure associated with that, but we've also had a pitch on creating a biomass facility in, in the North Tahoe region uh, to deal with our forest fuels. And that doesn't appear to meet necessarily these categories. So, so I can answer and, and provide some more information on, on some of all of those questions. So on the affordable housing um, situation or perspective, in the guidance, it allows for supportive housing, improving access to stable, affordable housing, um, affordable housing development, and for to increase our supply of affordable and high quality living units, as well as going into housing vouchers, residential counseling, or housing navigation services. So kind of a broad spectrum of different ways to address um, affordable housing and homelessness um, that may have been exacerbated by that thing. Um, and on the biomass, the, part of the, um, the guidance as well addresses um, climate change and the impacts of climate change on our communities and being able to address projects or programs that, that respond to that as well. And that may fall into that category as well. Biomass may fall into there. So um, there, there are avenues in there. I think that, that these are, again, very broad strokes on the uses of them. Um, that can be incorporated as long as the, the board and the county sees that nexus there. I, I think the other piece is, you know, we're looking at the revenue loss um, component. And in the event that there is revenue loss calculations that would, uh, would uh, afford those dollars to, to be freed up, they can actually be used for any purpose, any government purpose. So your ability to potentially use them for those specific needs if they're not directly outlined has has merit to it and i think we're doing some calculations daniel right now is that right. fair um so i think we have a lot of flexibility in this space i think the question is do you see where infrastructure being a critical piece that we'd want to at least start with investment because our general intent is to come back to you uh, most likely the last uh, meeting in july the first meeting in august leading up to the 31st we have a meeting on the 31st but We'd like to have, have things a little more dialed in so we can do our, um, our report to the feds. Um, so this is really a more of a question of kind of prioritizing what buckets would you like us to see in? And if you want us to keep open the idea about external partners or external people, uh, uh, groups, nonprofits, et cetera, asking for funding, uh, we'd like to come back with a program or some sort of idea that how that would work. And, um, you know, supervisors, we've talked about there's way more projects out there externally than we have dollars amount right now. So most likely there would need to be some sort of, how much would we put towards those and putting a dollar amount because it could get fairly fairly right. broad and, and could be used up. And you, know, you just don't have these opportunities anymore. And so I, I think for, as I look at it and Daniel and I've talked, it's all about being strategic and what's the biggest investment that we can make for the greatest um, group of residents and obviously infrastructure is one of those opportunities. Absolutely and, and I'll just weigh in while I still have my light. <laughs> um, that I do think um, that when you when you divide it and get I mean when people hear 78 million of course earlier today we talked about a billion so you know 78 million but when you divide it by per capita and you look at the dollars it doesn't go very far. Um, and I, as I said from the very beginning, I want to be strategic and where we have opportunity now to address issues that have long-term impacts and benefits to our community. And one of the things I'm so proud of we did was put so much of our CARES Act money out there to our business communities and our nonprofits. Millions and millions of dollars from this county went to those areas. And now we have an opportunity to be a little more strategic. I just don't want to get too far out trying to make everybody happy and not accomplishing anything meaningful. So that's my concern. It's not that there aren't tons of projects with merit, but making sure that whatever we do has long-term benefit uh, because this type of funding doesn't come very often, so. Uh, Bonnie, then Jim. 
Uh, oh, I have. Um... Go ahead. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll think about it. Well, thank you. Thank you for the, this opportunity. Uh, I, I agree with Supervisor uh, Gustafson about uh, biomass. The discussion throughout Northern California is uh, elevated. Uh, a lot of counties want to try to do this. I think we have the opportunity to enhance uh, biomass uh, utilization. Uh, so I'd like to see that. <clears throat> also, there's several sites uh, within our uh, housing uh, plan about workforce housing, affordable housing. I'd like to see some uh, water and sewer infrastructure to those sites, particularly in North Auburn, where there's land available to do that. So I think that would be a good use of those dollars for that. And also, I'd like to see, you know, we have the Placer County Fire Station. Some of those need to have uh, improvements. Probably not, you know, a couple million dollars probably wouldn't, would probably go a long way to help those, um, <coughs> those facilities uh, be upgraded. And that's just my thoughts for now. Bonnie? Now I have some thoughts, thank you. Uh, a couple things, so I do really wanna make sure, I, I agree with infrastructure and I wanna look at where are the areas that had a huge negative impact from COVID. So economic development, you know, we've lost jobs, um, and, and looking to address future needs. Um, so I agree with infrastructure that can address housing, additional housing, infill housing, jobs. I think that's a terrific way because our folks have been hurt dramatically because of COVID when it comes to uh, loss of, of housing, especially um, homelessness. And here's an opportunity which we've got a, a huge crisis and an issue we've got to address. And, and we know that people have ended up homeless because of um, COVID and the lack of housing. People haven't built enough, people have moved out, et cetera. So I think that that's an opportunity um, as well. And then just, I think some issues like mental health and things that we're going to experience the ramifications of COVID for a long time. Um, and I think the homelessness, mental health issues, and even substance abuse, um, those numbers we know have gone up in our community because of the shutdown. And I think we need to be aware of that. And if we see a need, we might wanna make sure we've got dollars available to help address that as we move forward. Suzanne. Yes, hi, Daniel. Um, I'm just curious, how, how are, are you all going to go about deciding these things? Are you gonna have committees? You're gonna have, how are you gonna go about doing this? I mean, we're all gonna have a gazillion ideas. <laughs> they don't have enough money to give to everything. No, no it's a great question because I, I do think it's, there's a lot of uh, players. I, I think our, our initial intent is to take a look at the projects. We have listed someone on our five-year CIP plan. Obviously, with housing, we'll probably reach out to Cedra and Shauna Purvines, talk about what is some of the affordable housing pieces are. Um, you know, you could probably eat up the entire amount on the, an affordable housing project. Um, but there may be opportunities where we say, our investment in affordable housing may be the infrastructure to support that that development versus doing the whole project and maybe you meet multiple needs. Um, so I, I guess our general intent is to reach out to individual departments. Um, if you have an interest in hearing from external partners, we'll probably reach out and have a discussion with them um, based on some of the criteria that's kind of outlined that, that they, or, uh, Daniel attested to. Our initial thought is we'll put together some level of projects and that's why I've kind of thought we really need two meetings to work through this. One is to kind of sit down and walk through the initial projects. The second is kind of the follow-up because there may be some things that's left off. Um, uh, but what we want to do is say hey, if infrastructure is important, obviously it sounds like COVID impacts the COVID would be in that same uh, vein. And, um, and then we have, you know, see what the revenue loss is, which would free up general f or dollars to do more flexible things. Um, that's kind of how we're gonna work through this. I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I do think that's why we're trying to take a month and a half or so to come back to you. So we're gonna, we'll, you know, this is kind of the first blush right. for y'all. Right. Um, I generally, expect that we're going to be meeting with you all individually 
um, leading up to this. Right. Um, I do want to mention a couple of other things. It kind of concerned me that it talks about providing an adequate minimum level of broadband service when COVID was really the thing that exposed the lack of, of internet service that families had, especially when they were trying to educate their kids at home. So it's a little disappointing when they say minimum level of service. So is that when minimum level is that you can you can get your internet on, but the fact that it shuts off and cuts you off and drops you all the time, is that considered minimal? I mean, it'd be nice to know what they mean by minimal, because um, even in my own community of Granite Bay, some of the areas that were built, old, older communities, they do not have high-speed internet. Mm -hmm. they, have, they don't even have 25 megabits or whatever they yeah. call it so and the other thing too is they do mention an awful lot about and improve access to clean drinking water and um, facilitate water reuse no it was this the consolidation or establishment of drinking water systems I've never heard that we have a problem with that in Placer County do we we do we do we do okay. we have we definitely have some aging water systems uh, in different yeah. areas I, I will and tell a you a lot of smaller private developed yeah. water systems that were taken over uh, uh, yeah. both in the Tahoe area but also in the foothills and Dutch Flat Alta those some of those areas yeah. okay I, th I think the other one I, I'll just fail to mention was there's a time frame for the expenditure of these dollars yes. and Daniel kind of spoke to that that will be somewhat of that criteria too is yeah, you know, these may be great projects, but if we can't get them done or completed within that time frame, that right. makes it a challenge too. So, I think there's a number of factors at play here. Great, I, thank I you. I thought of one more sewer, <laughs> and yes. what we might need to do with um, the expansion and treatment options that we have. Make sure that we can move forward with housing in those areas and yep. making sure they're adequately but I, I do think my other thought was um, Bonnie to our discussion earlier making sure that um, we distribute the funds in a manner that um, does improve lives and support for communities throughout the county so that there's some broad nexus to that versus targeting it all in one particular area or another yeah, and, and my comment about, um, you know, considering cities and everything, some of us have a lot of unincorporated areas in our district. I would be a little concerned about duplication of funds if we try to cover, I mean, they've given everybody money to spend for this, right? They've given cities, they've given counties and everything else. So I would just be a little bit leery about duplicating expenditures depending, all right. Is our money based on per capita? What did they base the funds that we gave? So per cities capita. are getting the same per capita as the county is? Yes. Incorporated areas? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, I'd only add that <clears throat> clearly I look at this as being uh, the county's policy of one time revenues being spent on one time investments, not subsidizing ongoing costs. And, uh, just emphasize Cindy's comment about how I thought we did an extraordinary job of reaching out with our CARES Act, trying to keep as many businesses and nonprofits alive during that period. That time has passed us, so I think now uh, if we look at where we can make investments and where they might have an economic development impact, I think that would be a uh, prioritization also. But I, other than that, I don't disagree with anything else any of my colleagues have said. So seeing no more lights, is there anyone from the public who'd like to comment on this? Sean, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Thanks, Megan. Good afternoon, Chair Wagon, members of the board. Sean Barclay, General Manager of the Tahoe City Public Utility District. And I'm here today representing both the Tahoe City PUD and the North Tahoe PUD. Uh, I want to pass along uh, Brad Johnson, the General Manager of North Tahoe PD's apologies. He couldn't attend uh, the meeting today. But I'm here to, today to ask for your board's consideration for use of some of the county's uh, American Rescue Plan funds to establish a competitive countywide community grant program to provide match funding for public agency water infrastructure projects designed to improve the delivery, distribution, and storage of drinking water and to bolster firefighting capacity. 
Collectively, these critical infrastructure improvements will strengthen our resilience to climate change impacts and help reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfire throughout Placer County communities. Municipal water agencies throughout Placer County, supported by their local ratepayers, are investing in their systems to improve critical water infrastructure to support safe and reliable drinking water, as well as enhance water availability for firefighting. Specific to the Lake Tahoe Basin, the majority of water systems along the north and west shores were developed between 1930 and 1950 to serve the domestic water needs of summer seasonal cabins. Over the years, special districts providing water to residents in the eastern part of Placer County have consolidated many of these small formerly private water systems and improved the water infrastructure. However, significant portions of eastern Placer County are still served by a patchwork of small, geographically isolated and undersized water systems that generally lack the capacity and infrastructure to meet the needs of the growing communities. To underscore the need, the TCPUD and NTPUD together have identified $43 million worth of projects for improving water availability in the county for firefighting in the next five years alone. Many of these projects are shovel ready and include those that increase water storage and distribution capacity through the acceleration of replacement of undersized water lines, construction of water storage tanks and installation of fire hydrants at appropriate intervals. These are projects that will have a real impact and benefit to the residents of Placer County. As you've heard today, the federal government passed the, the act uh, without dedicated funding for special districts. However, authority does exist under the act wherein states and local governments receiving these funds are explicitly empowered with the authority to transfer some of these funds directly to special districts. The recovery uh, or the ARP specifically authorizes local governments to transfer any of its allocation to a spe special purpose unit of state or local government and as you have been discussing, uh, allows for investments specifically in water infrastructure. We recognize and appreciate the magnitude of needs within Placer County and greatly appreciate your willingness to consider and discuss how water infrastructure for firefighting communities throughout the county might be prioritized in your discussions as you move forward. This funding could provide a unique opportunity to provide countywide benefit by building community resiliency against the devastating impacts of catastrophic wildfire from the lives of our community members to the economic viability of our county. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? I see no further public comment, oh. Chairman. Okay. Um, with that then, I, we don't need a motion, I don't think, and I think uh, we'll see what happens. Go forward. Robert, can I, can I make uh, one sure. other comment? Yeah. It, it says here that um, we're, provide, we're supposed to provide direction to the staff on next steps in determining the priority use of funds. I, I don't imagine it would be convenient to have another workshop where the board can get together and talk about this stuff. I know we can't do it at a board regular board meeting, but some kind of a workshop where we could all be together and have exchange of ideas and everything. I don't know whether that's feasible or not. And perhaps after you guys get together and uh, maybe have a list of examples and or specific projects and we could yeah. I mean if you, if you are open to a workshop we can mm -hmm. definitely do one I, I think we have some substance we can bring to you um, that actually may not be a, uh, a bad idea personally yeah. I think yeah I would support it and I also think that um, our housing summit that we're holding with the cities next week will be very informative as well as to the needs that we might have yeah Okay, I'll uh, I'll work on I'll work with you, Chair, to work on a date that works. Excellent. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy, you can't imagine how guilty I feel. <laughs> so, so <laughs> why don't you come up and do like a couple of items? Then we'll be a little bit late for our two thirty, but then you know you'll have fewer to get through, and hopefully we can get stuff in between sure. two or three items. See how it goes and. And I'm and doing I, my best to be as brief and as expedient as possible. Thank you very much. Yes. So good afternoon, Chair Wygant and members of the board. I am Amy Ellis, the Director of the Adult System of Care. As you know, I have about seven items to present. So um, I know we won't do them all at once, but I will be really brief. If you want more information, just ask for it. Otherwise, I'm going to be really concise. 
Perfect. So our first uh, action item is to approve an agreement with a, Compa a Compassion Valley LLC doing business as Garfield Wellness and Recovery Center to provide adult residential treatment services and medication support services for mentally disabled adults for the period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 in a total amount not to exceed 949,000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign agreements not amendments not to exceed $94,900, consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Compassion Valley LLC uh, opened a new six bed adult residential facility in Citrus Heights, California. It's approximately 10 minutes from our Kirby Hills clinic. We've already been able to utilize them six times and they've done very well with some challenging cases. Their goal is to transition individuals to lower levels of care within 18 months through providing significant service levels, which many of them are Medi-Cal billable. So it's a great partnership. This agreement includes 75% in federal funding and 4% in state funding and 21% in county general funds. And it's been appropriately budgeted. Any questions? Thanks. Questions? I see none. Anyone from the public? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? Move motion, Gustafson, second. Holmes, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item, please. Amy Ellis, uh, Adult System of Care, for and with an action item for your board to approve a contract with Nevada County Behavioral Health to provide 24-7 telephone triage services from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2023 in an amount not to exceed $1,366,272 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the contract with Risk Management and County Council concurrence and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Placer County has contracted with this provider for these services since August 1st, 2009. Telephone <coughs> access to the public is provided 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and includes information, referrals, brief support, and linkage to most of the services within adult system of care, pr primarily adult protective services, in-home support services, public guardian substance use services, mental health, and crisis. These services have provided, um, it has provided services to about, for many, many uh, calls. Uh, Anyway, expenditures under this contract include 60% in federal and state funds and 40% in required county general funds. All has been appropriately budgeted. Any questions? Questions by board members? Anyone from the public? Pleasure of the board. Second. Motion home, second Gustafson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Keep going. Okay. Um, to Amy Ellis with ASO Adult System of Care again, two action items this time to approve an agreement with North Valley Behavioral Health to operate a 16 bed psychiatric health facility in the amount not to exceed 5,300,000 from July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Second, to approve the associated lease agreement between the county and North Valley Behavioral Health from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022, with the option to ex extend annually and authorize the Director of Facilities Management or designee to execute the lease agreement with risk management and county council concurrence. Our PUF at Kirby Hills fills a critical component of the, con the continuum of various mental health services provided to county residents. Um, during fiscal year 1920, there were 358 admissions onto the PUF, and this really helps us be able to save money. So uh, funding for this contract includes 67% in state federal funding and 33% in county general fund as, and is included in the department's budget. Any questions? Questions by board? Uh, comments, questions, public? Seeing none. Motion Holmes. Second, Jones, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item, please. Okay. Um, Amy Ellis, a Adult System of Care, um, with two action items for your board's consideration. First, to approve an agreement with Respad Health Corp Red in Red Bluff, California, for the periods of July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2022, for psychiatric health facility services for a total amount not to exceed $600,000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the contract and any subsequent amendments up to $60,000 consistent with subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Second, to 
approve an agreement with Respad Health Corp. Reading, California for the period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 for psychiatric health facility, serv facility services for a total amount not to exceed 600,000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the contract and any subsequent amendments up to $60,000 consistent with subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Both of these facilities are puffs. So when our Kirby Hills facility is at capacity, we use these as overflow to be able, and they are able to bill Medi-Cal, which keeps our costs low. So um, we have been using the Red Bluff facility for quite some time, but the Redding facility is new to us. And so will give us more flexibility and op options for placement. Uh, both facilities are 95% uh, funded with state and federal revenues and 5% in county general funds. Any questions? Question, uh, Suzanne. Yes, I do have a question. Hi, Amy. So are you saying that the, uh, if the facility on Kirby, Kirby Hills is over capacity, then we transport people either to Red Bluff or to Redding? Is that and, and several others. We have some in Yuba, et okay. cetera. And there we have about five or six contracts for puffs. Okay, so this is just kind of adding to our inventory of places we can send people. Correct, yes. Okay, it's a long drive. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, questions, comments by the public? Bring it back to the board. Second. Motion home, second Jones. All those in favor say aye. Motion carries. Uh, item G. Okay. Amy Ellis again with the Adult System of Care with an action item to approve an agreement with Sierra Mental Wellness Group to provide mental health crisis services, specialty mental health services, and child welfare couples counseling services in an amount not to exceed $1,100,000 for the period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Sierra Mental Wellness Group is a longstanding partner with us who provides our crisis uh, services mainly and then some, uh, some therapy services to um, our child welfare population and some adults. So they also are our only crisis provider in the Tahoe region. So we, um, let's 68% of this contract is funded by state and federal sources and 32% in county general fund. All has been budgeted, any questions? Questions? Any comments, questions by the public? Motion, uh, Gore, second Holmes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Item 16H. Okay, uh, Amy Ellis with Adult System of Care with two action items today. One, to approve a renewal grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to receive Adult System of Care permanent supportive housing grant funds, known as APSH grant funds in an amount not to exceed $488,819 for the period of December 1st, 2021 through November 30th, 2022, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $48,881, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Second, to approve a, re a renewal grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and, and Urban Development to receive funds for shelter plus care, permanent supportive housing, fiscal year 21 to 22, in an amount not to exceed $406,364 for the period of June 1st, 2021 through May 31st, 2022, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $40,636, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. These are two grants that we have been receiving for about 10 years. Both of them provide rental subsidies, a majority of which are scattered site approach where people are able to live within our communities with these subsidies with various landlords that we've built relationship with, with over time. The only difference is one has a little bit more of the supportive services covered under the grant and the other one we use other funding sources to provide those, those uh, services. Any, um, let's see, the program costs are, are all in our budget and there are no general funds. Any questions? Any questions about Suzanne? Yes, hi again. Yeah. Hey. Um, my question is for uh, about the shelter plus care permanent supportive housing. You know, I have constituents that are concerned with the per purchases of permanent supportive housing. So we were told originally that all of the people that reside in those permanent supportive homes pay some degree of rent. So is any of this going to go to purchase additional permanent supportive housing? Not this particular grant. 
These are subsidies that are mo mainly tied to that individual who qualifies, that then we help them find places, like with like any apartments or things like that, low-income places throughout the community. Mm -hmm. We do have six of them, which are called project-based, where they're attached to um, long-standing projects that we have, two facilities that they would have to live there in order to use the subsidy. But that's how we use these particular dollars. They would never be used like cumulatively to then purchase a home for permanent supportive housing in that manner. Okay, but it's used, but the money's used to subsidize the people that are in the permanent supportive homes to subsidize their rent? But yes, but um, it can be anywhere. It's not necessarily in the homes of question. Okay. So it's not, they're not to be used in like, we have other ways of funding those, other right. subsidies, other types of grants that help right. offset the cost of the rent in our, in our supportive housing homes. This particular program, um, it just it just provides supportive services and some funding to then go and find it could be anywhere like there's they're all in different places okay would it be possible at some future date for me to learn more from your department sure yeah we would love to sit down we're actually developing um, a couple of visuals to try to help uh, make it a little bit easier for the it's confusing it is I'm yeah. I'm missing Kathy I'm still learning and get confused <laughs> so um, so I I firsthand know how confusing all of this is so happy to help you uh, learn it with me great <laughs> thanks so much um, any other questions comments board public pleasure of the board Motion Jones, second Gustafson. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And 16 aye. This is the last one. Amy okay. Ellis with the Adult System of Care with an action requested to approve an agreement with Willow Glen Care Center Incorporated to provide adult residential treatment services for mentally disabled adults for the period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 in an amount not to exceed $600,000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $60,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So, um, we've been contracting with Willow Glen since 1999 and they um, have provided excellent services for us and they are one of our only facilities that takes folks over the age of 65 or who have wheelchair uh, needs. So this agreement is funded 60% in county general funds and 40% in federal and state revenues and all has been budgeted appropriately. Any questions? Uh, Cindy. I do have a question, and that is because all the other ones are about 60 to 70 percent federal or state funding. This one reversed it and put more on the county. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to understand why. So that's why when I present like the the puffs and I talk about how if they stay under 16, we can build Medi-Cal to receive those state and mm -hmm. federal funds, but some of our other placements don't allow for that, okay. but yet we still need them and they provide the continuum. So like some are short-term care, some are longer-term cares, their size, the type of services that they, they offer all depend on the split of cost. So we try to really mm -hmm. look at the needs of our clients plus that that um, the cost and do a placement strategy that really maximizes both both okay. needs if that makes sense I appreciate that I know that we do receive a lot of state and federal funding you know something I never knew till I was up on this in this seat how much was federally funded of all these um, programs that we provide so thank you for all the work and making sure we can serve people the best way possible okay and Jim Thank you, Amy, uh, for your diligence in hanging around. Uh, these items, it's not a question, it's a comment. These items before us uh, demonstrate the critical need for mental health uh, facilities. Uh, the problem is growing. There's more and more mental illness in various degrees. Uh, and it's increasingly difficult, difficult to find places to house these folks. And so. Uh, I think maybe we might look at some of those funds with the American Rescue Plan, maybe utilizing some of those for infrastructure to a facility, something of that nature. <clears throat> but it's an ongoing problem. We don't have enough psychiatric health facilities, particularly those such as uh, Sutter Psych, 
uh, or heritage oaks in uh, down in uh, Auburn Boulevard. Uh, we really need some more facilities. So just wanted to make that comment. And I move approval. Second. Motion home second. Gustafson, all those in favor say aye. 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 So thank you. You deserve accommodation yeah. today. Obviously, you've been keeping busy, but, uh, <laughs> but we appreciate it all. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. We will now take up our 2.30 timed item, uh, which is a continuance of the third party appeal of the planning commission's approval of a minor use permit, Bennett, for AT&T, by the way, AT&T Assault Zone. Good afternoon, Chair, Board of Supervisors. I am Bennett Smith-Art with the Planning Services Division. The next item is the continuance of an appeal of the planning commission's approval of a minor use permit. Uh, one note I wanted to make, before my uh, presentation was on the board packet, uh, page four, 441, there was an incorrect date. It needs to state June 22nd. Just wanted to clarify that right quick. Uh, so going into the, the presentation, the appeal uh, was first heard by the Board of Supervisors on June 8th, 2021. Uh, the board granted tentative approval of the appeal and directed staff to prepare findings to support the granting of the appeal. Uh, one thing I want to note, uh, since our last hearing, the county and AT&T have agreed to extend the shot clock, allowing additional time to consider the project. Uh, we did discuss that kind of at the end of the presentation uh, on the 8th. And additionally, AT&T is requesting a continuance. Next, I have a site plan available if any questions were to come up, but you know, just kind of a refresh, you know, our project site is at the intersection of Miller Town and Wise Road. Therefore, uh, the recommendation uphold the appeal filed by Sierra George in the Miller Town Community Group, and to deny the Planning Commission's decision to approve the minor use permit supported by the findings stated in the staff report. I'm available if you have any questions. Uh, open up to questions this time by the board. I see none. Uh, any questions or comments by any members of the public? Sh sure, come on up and skip. Hello, uh, my name is Jared Kersley on behalf of AT&T. Uh, I am the applicant. Is this the appropriate time to speak? You bet. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, appreciate you having us here today, Chair and members of the board. Um, as staff has uh, uh, stated, uh, AT&T has agreed to a tolling agreement to the date of July 27th, 2021 uh, to hope further uh, give a better presentation of alternative site analysis maybe improve the design where we can, and to provide a detailed uh, written statement of showing, uh, describing the design RF requirements for this, this area. Uh, we had a lot of community members saying that they had adequate services by AT&T. Um, AT&T still feels that they have a coverage gap in this area and wish to elaborate on that gap to kind of close the gap, because as of now, we have demonstrated through a depiction of a coverage map and uh, we believe a written thorough written report uh, summarizing the needs for this area would um, help the board uh, see that there is a gap in coverage and the need for this this uh, wireless facility so with that uh, we do request in the continuance to July 27th we understand that's uh, I think a Tahoe uh, hearing so if it moves to the second Tuesday of August, that is perfectly uh, acceptable by at and and we could just simply revise the tolling agreement to state, uh, reflect that date. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I yep. could make a, a comment, a procedural comment. Um, our office was contacted by at and last Friday regarding um, a shot clock, um, a stay of the tolling of the shot clock. However, I made it very clear to the legal representative that any request for a continuance was at the discretion of this board and was not uh, contingent on that tolling agreement. So um, the continuance has been requested and it is really at, at the discretion of the board whether you wish to do so. But there was no connection and guarantee that the tolling agreement would suddenly allow for a continuance. Any questions, colleagues, on any of the procedure, the 
first question before so yes Jim oh, I don't have a question. Is there else no, no I'm gonna get to that but oh, okay. I want to make sure that might resolve any questions there's that procedure in front of us so is there anyone else from the public who'd like to address the item seeing none so the first question before the board uh, would be to consider the continuance um, so I'll just take it back to the board and open it up for comment and uh, Mr. Chair, I'm comfortable with the findings in the staff report, and I would vote to deny the appeal, the continuance. So motion, Holmes, second, Gustafson to deny the request for a continuance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And so then to complete the agenda item, we would need to uh, complete the items listed under 12, 1, 2, and 3, which is the third-party appeal, grant third-party appeal, and overturn the Planning Commission, and want to state that more specifically for us I would imagine I, I request that you do each one separately okay so the first part is to consider the final action on the third party appeal by the Sierra by Sierra George on behalf of the Middletown Road community as uh, delineated in two and three move approval second. motion home second Gustafson all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed second item is to grant the third party appeal fired by Sierra George on behalf of the Middletown Road community Move approval. Second. Motion home, second Gustafson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion opposed. Motion carries. And third, overturn the Planning Commission's decision to deny the appeal um, zone administrator's decision as per the discussion. Move approval. Second. Motion home, second Gustafson. All and those for the record, just to clarify that that motion also includes the uh, findings that are set forth in the report corrected to be uh, dated June 22nd. Right. Acceptable by the maker in the second? Yes. yes. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Now we have to wait a couple of minutes for our three. <laughs> wow.
again. So this uh, next item is a height or an appeal of a height variance. Let's see. The uh, the pro subject property is located at nine uh, seven nine five one Walt Wise Road. It is nine point eight acres. Uh, in February of 2020, the property owner installed a 100 foot by 200 foot cover over an existing horse riding arena in the south central portion of the site. Uh, the arena cover is a pre-engineered, uh, prefabricated engineered uh, structure. Uh, it includes, um, the interior of the horse arena cover it includes uh, light fixtures that hang from basically the ceiling of uh, the cover. The height of the cover is 44 feet, two inches. This property is zoned farm, so the maximum height limit for structures in a farm district is 36 feet. So that puts the structure eight feet, two inches over. Uh, with, uh, we do have uh, alternative options to approving um, structures that are over height. One is the administrative approval. So that allows for an increase of height of no more than five feet or 10%, whichever is less, and that may be gruited with the approval of the administrative approval. Uh, so with the approval of the administrative approval, that would allow for a structure of 39 feet, six inches. So we have some photographs of the site. Um, so the large picture on the left, right in the middle is the horse arena cover. Uh, to the left of that, you see a round pin. To the left of that, you see uh, horse stables. These horse stables, it's a two-story structure. So you can kind of tell the size of this horse arena cover compared to a, a two-story structure. On the t top right side, if you look in, you can see the lights on the, the top, uh, near the top of the structure. So that's one of the, the complaints we have received is, is the glow. So wanted to point out where the lights are located and those are LED lights. So the project so site is located on Wise Road just west of Crater Hill Road. The property is zoned farm 4.6 acres minimum and is surrounded by um, agriculture and farm zoned properties. So this is an aerial of the site. Uh, as you can see on the bottom central, there's a large white structure. This is our subject horse arena cover um, is located on top of the existing uh, riding arena and next to all the various agriculture structures on site. A little more clear is the site plan. Uh, as you can see, the, the placement of the arena was in proximity to all the, the horse related and agriculture related um, I guess horse related structures on, on site. Prior to construction, the property owner informed Cedra front counter staff about plans to build the Harina cover, but it did not discuss the proposed height. There's an active code compliance case. The first complaint was received February 13th, 2020, and the initial notice of violation was sent on February 26, 2020. A total of 11 complaints have been filed about the unpermitted structure. On May 27th, 2020, the applicant requested approval of a variance uh, to exceed the 36 foot height requirement for the uh, farm zone di district. Uh, so with this graphic, I wanna provide you, I know it'll likely come up, the portion that's within the, that exceeds the 36 feet is kind of the tip of it. So in purple, kind of the purple blue color, you can see the portion of the uh, cover that is over the 36 feet required by the farm district. The variance request went to the August 20th, 2020 zoning administrator hearing. Uh, prior to the hearing, comments were received from 23 members of the public. Uh, 13 of those were in opposition and 10 were in support. During the hearing, public comment was provided by nine neighboring property owners and user, or users of the facility. Concerns raised by the public included neighborhood compatibility and aesthetics. Supporters noticed the inconvenience that reconstructing the arena cover would cause. The zoning administrator determined that there were not any special circumstances that warrant the additional height and there was 
no information on the record to support the height increase. Uh, so the zoning administrator denied the variance request. On August 27, 2020, the appellant filed an appeal to contest the zoning administrator's denial of the variance. At the November 12th Planning Commission hearing, comments were received from 31 members of the public prior to the hearing. Uh, 20 of those, 21 of those were in opposition and 10 were in support. Public comment was provided by two neighboring property owners. Concerns raised by the public included neighborhood compatibility, aesthetics, and property values. The Planning Commission discussion included the arena covers, impacts on aesthetics of the surrounding rural community, whether modification of the structure would reduce visual impacts, and whether the contractor should have ensured that the arena cover received proper county permits. The Planning Commission considered the public testimony and associated documentation it received and took action to deny the appeal and uphold the zoning administrator's decision to deny the variance request. An appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of the variance was received on November 13th, 2020 from Phillips Land Law Incorporated on behalf of the property owner, Gary Matranga. The appellant cited the following issues as the basis for the appeal. One, the structure's height is dictated by site conditions. Two, the height is reasonable and not significant. Three, the design of the structure provides benefits. Four, relocation or modification of the structure is cost prohibitive. Five, findings can be made to justify the granting of a variance. So going into the first one, uh, the first one was the structure's height is dictated by site conditions. So staff's response, if the property owner would have applied for a building permit, staff could have advised them of the maximal allowed height. If any structure or foundation so soil issues existed, that would have been addressed during the building plan review and resolved prior to construction. The type of facility was selected for practical reasons. This does not validate the additional height of the structure, and these <coughs> factors do not meet the criteria for granting a variance as set forth in the zoning ordinance. The appeal has not demonstrated that the site conditions dictated the excessive height. Absent extraneating circumstances, approval would grant special privileges to this property. Second one, the height is reasonable and not significant. Staff's response, the appellant asserts that there are several agriculture structures throughout the Ofer community that are of a similar size and height. However, no specific structures or properties were identified. The eight foot, two inch difference between the horse arena cover that meets the high standards and the subject horse arena cover in noticeable visual difference from neighboring properties in the vicinity. According to comments received from neighbors, the glow from the translucent material is more significant than the previous arena lights without shielding. The arena cover is highly visible, is above the tree line, and is located close to Wise Road. Number three, the design of the structure provides benefits. Staff's response. The choice of the prefabricated structure, it was a cost benefit to the property owner, is not considered essential to the construction of an arena cover. No geotechnical reports have been submitted to the county to confirm the presence of rocks in the subgrade requiring this type of facility. The arena cover likely reduces glare compared to previous pole lights, but the translucent fabric does produce a glow that is visible to properties in the vicinity. Although the type of material was deemed essential to this project, the material type, even with the benefits in regard to light spillover, does not validate the need for the variance. Four, relocation or modification of the structure is cost prohibitive. That's response. The variance application was submitted to correct an existing zoning violation, and staff acknowledges that there would be financial implications to the property owner if they were to remove, modify, or relocate the arena cover. The variance requested is not created by zoning regulation, but arises from an action or design of the appellant to keep an over height structure. The action and cost to correct the violation is not something that is of consideration when making variance findings. 
five, findings can be made to justify the granting of the variance. So we'll go through each of these findings uh, and provide our response. Uh, the first finding that we typically make in staff reports for variances is there are special circumstances applicable to the property, including size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings, and because of such circumstances, the strict application of the chapter would deprive the property of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the vicinity and other th under the same zoning. Staff's response, the Placer County Zoning Ordinance has specific findings, lo location, shape, size, surrounding, or topography that must be made when granting a variance. The criteria is set forth in California Government Code Section 65906 and is listed in Section 176100 of the Zoning Ordinance. The subject site is indistinguishable from adjacent properties. There are no special circumstances that prevents the applicant from complying with the height restrictions. The applicant's stated special circumstances include not being aware that the ag building was in the farm zone needed a building permit, not being aware of the height standard, the height standard, the height cost of the high cost of modifying the existing Rania and none of these classify as special circumstances in the realms of variances. Next finding is the variance authorized does not constitute a grant of special privileges inconsistent with limitations upon other properties in the vicinity and in the same zone district. Our response, the development challenges presented by the appellant are not unique to the property, but are present throughout the Ofer area. Many properties in close proximity to the subject property have agriculture structures in compliance with regulations of the zoning ordinance. The property owner is not deprived of rights afforded to other property owners in the farm district, farm zone district. The arena cover has been constructed on the lowest and flattest portion of the property. However, the slope of the site, less than 5%, was found by the Planning Commission not to be a circum special circumstance or site feature that requires a 44-foot, 2-inch structure. C, the variance does not authorize a use that is not otherwise allowed in the zoning a district. Staff's response. Uh, we agree. The horse arena cover is considered a residential accessory structure and is allowed in the farm 4.6 acre minimum district. Uh, granting of the requested variance would not establish a prohibited use. Uh, D, the granting of the variance does not under these circumstances and conditions applied to this particular case adversely affect the public health or safety, is not materially de detrimental to the public welfare nor injurious to nearby property improvements. Staff's response, whether a variance would be contrary to the public interest depends on the impacts that it would have on the surrounding area. The arena structure is highly visible. Commenters have noticed the arena is large, bright, and out of place, and it blocks or obscures vistas and views. It is unknown if the arena as constructed would diminish or impair property values. The existing arena has been show, shown to be contrary to public interest as it has been subject to complaints from neighbors. While the appellant states the arena cover has reduced nighttime lighting impacts, public commenters have noted that the arena creates new light and glare and degrades views. E, the variance is consistent with the Placer County General Plan and any applicable community plans or specific plan. The requested variance would not authorize a youth use otherwise allowed in the Placer County General Plan or OFER General Plan. The proposed variance would comply with the General Plan and OFER General Plan goals and policies relating to agriculture uses and agriculture structures. General Plan and OFER General Plan policies encourage continued and where possible increased agriculture activities on land suited for agriculture uses. Plan policies also require that new development be designed to preserve and maintain the rural character and quality of the county. This is implemented through the zoning ordinance which the uh, arena cover is not in compliance with. The variance is a, the minimum departure from the requirements of the zoning ordinance necessary to grant relief for the applicant. Staff's response, 
The maximum building height allowed in the farm, farm district is 36 feet, and the appellant decided to build an unpermitted arena cover that exceeds the maximum height provision. The appellant would be eligible to apply for administrative approval to construct a 39-foot, 6-inch tall arena, and taking that into consideration, the Zoning Administrator and Planning Commission still determined that the appellant's requested variance of 4 feet 8 inches, that's over the 39 feet 6 inches, that could be administratively be approved, was not the minimum departure from the requirements of the zoning ordinance necessarily to grant relief to the appellant. So summary, compliance with the zoning ordinance would not prevent improvements of the property in a manner consistent with other properties in the area, including the ability to construct a lighted horse arena up to 36 feet in height. The issue before the board is not created by a zoning regulation, but arises from an action of the property owner. The expense incurred in replacing or modifying the improvement is a self-created hardship. The hardship results from the action of the appellant, not from the property itself, and is not a justification for a variance. The appellant has justified the location of the arena structure, but it has not provided adequate justification as to why the arena cover could be constructed in a way that meets 36 feet height limit or provided evidence of special circumstances on the site that would justify the variance. The variance would adversely affect the order, convenience, and general welfare of the neighborhood for the following reasons. One, detached accessory structures do comply with uh, height requirements. Two, the location of the arena is highly visible. Three, it is in close proximity to neighboring residents. And four, the over height structure would not be compatible with the order and uniformity of the neighborhood. So uh, staff is recommending denial. So denial of a variance is statutorily exempt from environmental review pursuant to provisions of section 15270 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines and section 183610G of the Placer County review ordinance, projects with which are disapproved. Therefore, staff's recommendation, uphold the Planning Commission's decision to deny the variance request and order conformance or removal of the non-conforming structure subject to any applicable permits within 100 days of this decision, subject to findings found in the staff report. I'm available for any questions. Thanks, Bennett. Um, Jim. Oh, no. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I have um, a question <clears throat> with regards to the um, there's an administrative approval process that could have expanded the heights by five feet or 10% of what is provided for correct that's correct and just so the, that would be typically the zoning administrator uh, so that's a staff level review Mm -hmm. uh, so it's um, administrative removal. So the staff will prepare you know, a report. If they recommend approval, I'll send it to the planning director and he'll sign it off all internally. So, so no, no hearing or anything associated with that. Yeah, thanks, Bennett. So the, then my question probably kind of council is, uh, could then uh, neighbors appeal that determination and would it roll through the process to the planning commission, I suspect, and then potentially up to the board of suits? subsequent to that okay yes any decision by the planning director could be appealed uh, and then it would go to the planning commission if that was appealed then it would go to the board got it thanks uh any other questions or comments cindy still being new to this i get to play that card for a little while longer anyway um we the appeal the denial was received let's see the appeal was received on November 13th, 2020. I'm just looking at the time frame from when this started to where we are today. It's been a long time. Is that typical of, of these decisions? I mean, uh, each decision is kind of unique based on you know the merits of the property and the availability. Uh, I believe the appellant had some scheduling conflicts, so uh, that drew it out a little bit longer. Okay. from November 12th but in the meantime today's... you know the people that have complained are are still faced with this issue for seven eight months from the time of that okay 
Um, and then my second question is on light limitations. Um, so lighting is allowed all night long. Are there certain limitations on that lighting uh, for these types of facilities? Uh, so, so for generally speaking in the, the farm district, in the, the zone district, in the Ofer area, uh, they're not subject to design review. Um, we do have some policies in the, um, the Ofer or the Plaster County General Plan, um, and I'll, I'll read that for you right now. The county shall discourage the use of outdoor lighting that shines unnecessarily into adjacent properties or into the night sky. And that's uh, under goal 10.9. And that's, that's basically for a um, agriculture structure in a, a farm zone that doesn't have a design review uh, component. Uh, that is the extent of the uh, regulations we have on the lights. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne. Yes. Um, I wanted to note that I was looking at the timeline as, as well, and it looks like the first complaint was filed in, on February 26th, but the um, appellants didn't file for a variance until May. That was three months later. Do have any idea? I'm sure you may not know, but I'm just curious as to why it took them three months to apply for a variance. And, and then on top of the, uh, the lighting issue, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but that they would have had to apply for a permit to do the lighting, the electrical, at which time I think they would have been given some guidance on what kind of lighting is required. Um, being that we're kind of all inundated with sport and athletic fields, everybody that lives around sport and athletic fields are very sensitive to the lighting issues. So now, as well as parking lots. So as everybody's had to come with these specific lights that just aim downwards and don't let any light escape from up above or, or to the sides. And um, the pictures of this, and, and we did drive by, and, and the lights, even though they may be LEDs, they, they have like a white lampshade on it. So there's no, nothing limiting the light from, from flowing, coming out of the lampshade. I'll call it a lampshade for lack of a better thing, but it was white. And so I, I know lighting probably maybe not an issue here, but if it is, you know, light pollution is everybody's favorite term that goes out into the night sky and, and um, offends the neighbors. I, I did think it glowed in the dark. Thank you. Um, Bonnie, then Jim. I have a question about the design. And so uh, for agricultural uses, the county doesn't have any specifics about what designs can and cannot be used for structure. Is that correct? That is correct. So uh, there's the height limitation, but the, the material and the design of the building is not at the county's discretion, it's at the applicant's discretion. Just the height variance is the concern That's that correct. we have any jurisdiction over. Yeah, we do not have any review process. Okay, so that. that same type of structure could still be built at 36 feet, the required height, and we'd still have no say. Correct, you could have an identical structure, just 36 feet, and it would be allowed. Okay, thank you. The, the issue I have is that it seems like the vendor, ClearSpan, if I went down to buy a structure like that, there would be a, re a request about whether the jurisdiction involved had a height limitation. I don't know if that question was asked. I don't know if the vendor has that kind of information for each jurisdiction. It also seems to me that the contractor uh, would, since probably does work throughout other counties, would have an idea that there would be a height limitation. And then, of course, the property owner had no idea. So I don't know how that all happened uh, without knowing about the height limitation. And so I don't know who can explain that. I don't expect you to do that, but there seems to be a disconnect there from uh, what the required or the allowed use is, height is, and what ended up being put up. I would refer to the, the applicant, yeah, when sure. they're, during their presentation, they yeah. might can address that. There'll be plenty of time for follow-up questions, also based on testimony, but so, so that with the board, we're good with questions. Thanks, Bennett. 
Okay, so our procedure is to provide the uh, appellant in this case um, uh, equal opportunity to provide time and testimony to the to the board. So um, we'll give them 15 minutes also, and then we'll open it up to the public for for any and all other comments. Chairman Wygant, members of the board, George Phillips here on behalf of the Matrangas and um, the appellants here. Um, normally, when I'm standing before you, I'm saying I'm so glad to be here and uh, it's taken a long time to get here because it's a, some project of some kind. But, um, you know, this is, this is a different circumstance. And unfortunately, we're all here to talk about this uh, situation that we have and um, to walk through what occurred here, what didn't occur here, and, and the whys as to what, what those issues were. So um, I'll hopefully, in my comments, I will address some of the questions that have been answered. Uh, asked already by the board members, and also on um, the timing of this. Uh, part of this is my fault uh, because of dates that fell when I was either gone or had conflict. So we uh, were earlier in April, then later in April and now June. So it's taken a, a while. But to um, just provide the board with some background uh, on the circumstances we're dealing with, uh, the Matrangas bought the property in November of 2019. The purpose of buying it was obviously to live on the property, but also to um, operate a horse training facility. So that was their intent from the beginning. The property has uh, historically had an arena. It was a horse rescue uh, facility, and they had the uh, uh, outdoor arena, no cover. Um, for the exercising of those animals, and it was lighted, uh, pole lights uh, that were operated at, at night. And we have photos of that in the staff materials in terms of what that looked like previously. There was also an existing round pen uncovered, and there was a horse stable. Uh, as was mentioned by Bennett in his presentation, all of these facilities existed on the property at this specific location. It's the flattest the lowest portion of the property, and it actually goes up significantly as you head north. And I'll get into some of those unique features uh, later in the conversation. Uh, so immediately upon acquiring the property, uh, Mr. Matranga came up to the county, had conversations with the building department. And um, as I work through this history, it's, um, there is no intention on our part to be pointing fingers. This is unfortunately an imperfect process and sometimes um, things don't get communicated as well as they, they might. But at any rate, uh, that first conversation with the county, there was discussion about putting a cover over the existing arena and there was also discussion about a shop equipment building that Mr. Matranga wanted to build. In that conversation, what he recalls being told is that there was no building requirement for the cover, and there was no mention any, of any height limitation. There was discussion more about the building that was required, and that um, he needed to get verification from the Ag Commissioner that his parcel was 10 acres, in which case he fell into the agricultural building category, and he would have a different building permit cost, fewer inspections, fewer requirements for Ag buildings. He went to the Agricultural Commissioner, got verification of his 10-acre parcel, even though it's 9.8, and um, came back and started the building process, the building permit process for that first building. He subsequently um, received a building permit for another barn that is further north on the property on the back end, and then also he covered the round pen, under, then on finding out that he needed a permit for that and obtained a permit for the cover of the round pen. After that meeting with, with the building department staff and his understanding that he did not need a building permit, nor was there a height limitation, he went about ordering this type of a structure. And I have some information in the handouts for all of you to walk through with that. But they are a pre-engineered, prefabricated structure so that the dimensions of the arena itself drove the height of the structure. So I'm going to hand out my first 
piece of information. This is from ClearSpan, the manufacturer. And you'll see it's pre-engineered. There's also a picture on the second page of the uh, So the first page just tells you they're pre-engineered. The second page, uh, the first page also shows you in 100 foot widths. The width of the existing are arena was 99 feet, four inches. Uh, therefore, you needed 100, per 100 feet to cover the width. That dictated its height because it's specifically engineered for that. The second page you'll see is just a, uh, an example. The Gamages is just a family name of a, a customer of ClearSpan who erected one of these facilities, but you'll see that what this looks like from the inside, um, and then also the fact that they have pre-existing 100 feet long, and that's a picture of one that's 100 feet wide rather than that long. Um, so as a result of ordering that pre-engineered structure, it arrives and it's 44 feet 2 inches tall to cover that width. Um, the the next issue that came up was um, the, or has come up since the complaint, is the concern about the color, the concern about the lighting. The issue that we get into there, the uniqueness of this property absolutely comes into play at that point because these existing facilities being right where they were located on this property was in close proximity to Wise Road and in the view shed of the two primary concerned neighbors. Um, that's where that cover was going to go. That's where the arena was. And if you think about a 36 foot tall, goes to Supervisor Gore's question, a 36 foot tall structure of the same type would have to been, it would have had to be special engineered, but it could have been constructed by clear span. They could have manufactured, it would have been a custom structure, white and lighted we would have the exact reasons why we're here today is the concern of the neighbors. But as also has been stated by staff, there wouldn't be any issues to discuss because a white cover of this type lighted at this location is allowed under county code. So there would have been no conversation about the aesthetics of this structure. And it goes absolutely to the uniqueness of the circumstances we have here. Um, so, again, going through what Mr. Matranga understood to be the requirements, um, the, the arena was completed, the notice of violation came in, and um, he reached out to me shortly thereafter through a common um, colleague, and uh, it took a while to actually assemble the variance request, which was another part of the, the delay and what took a while. Um, he had to raise his hand and say help. <laughs> so um, that, that goes to the, the timing there. The um, other issues of kind of the imperfect nature of the process is um, the board is all too familiar with variance, variances that you get to see on appeal um, on a not irregular basis. Uh, and I think many of those have to do with how imperfect the process can be and how information is disseminated, what applicants understand, what they walk away understanding from a conversation or what they might be able to find online. You recently had um, a variance appeal not long ago uh, with the, for the Crowley family, a similar circumstance with a building and a setback issue. Um, I'm just going to hand out an exhibit that is the um, website for the Ag Commissioner. And the top, the top page you see is um, how it appeared on August 7th, 2020. And the first paragraph under agricultural buildings, it talks about the exemption from requirements, and it's a, a short statement. If you turn the page to how it read in June of 2021, I think probably as a direct result of some of these more recent variance issues, you see that language has been added to make sure it's, it's clearer that 
even though there is an exemption for an agricultural building, there may be a building permit requirements or setback requirements. The only reason we're pointing this out again is because this is, this is improving communications that's making clearer to the public what the requirements are, begin, again, because you are being faced, you as a county, Placer County, is facing some of these circumstances where um, an applicant may have misunderstood or, or was not told something and it ended up being a, an issue of a concern. So given the fact that we have the situation we do where we have concerned neighbors, we understand why, um, and at the same time, um, the ability to propose some things to reduce that impact to those neighbors, we can do that only through the approval of a variance. If the board denies this appeal, denies the variance, then this structure would have to be disassembled, taken away, and a new cover constructed. That cover, as I mentioned earlier in my comments, could be 36 feet high, white, and lighted just as it is today. And so what our suggestion is, is the vehicle here for the county to soften the impact of this cover to the neighbors is actually to grant the variance and condition it. And to that end, I have a couple of other <laughs> handouts. I'm going to keep Megan running here. <laughs> So the, the first handout is just, again, where we're itemizing for the board what would be the ramifications of a denial of the variance for the Matrangas to take down this facility and, cons and have a new custom constructed cover from Clearspan. Um, you see the number there would be 432,000. The original uh, structure was the 318. The 400, we just uh, had conversations with Clearspan yesterday, got a more accurate number on the replacement because of the customization and re engineering of a special structure that's 36 feet tall. Um, the other items is that we have at the bottom of the page is what we're proposing as um, a way to reduce the impacts to the neighbors of the cover. The first is uh, to um, restrict the lighting uh, from, uh, so it's not on after 7.30 at night, it's only on on weekdays, and it's only from April to October when we have, you know, the, the uh, sun sets at an earlier hour. Um, the other would be to actually lower the lights to try to create more dead space or uh, higher up in the structure. And then we're also suggesting um, replacing the existing cover. We have some additional colors here for you to look at. And the idea here, obviously the white is the existing cover. The brown or beige color, green and the gray trying to get to something that's a little more earth tone. That would control, uh, control better the, the spillover light that was referenced earlier. And um, there's also a version in the other handout that I provided to you. The middle photo image is, um, if you went with the darker green, um, we probably would be suggesting that it'd be a two-tone, that the, it, there would be white at the very top just so it's light and reduces the need to turn on lights, uh, would allow more sunlight in. Um, but that would be our suggestion as to the light part of this. Uh, again, we're trying to find a vehicle by which there is responsiveness to the neighbors. Um, 
And I, I hope I mentioned also the tree planting that was also on that list I handed out. So trying to soften that appearance as, as best we can. Um, with that, I know that there's others that would like to address the board. I would um, request uh, the ability to come up afterwards and perhaps make some closing comments, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Yeah, th thanks, George. Um, just, and just for protocol purposes, the um, board always provides opportunity to clarify on either side any um, potential correction or interpretations of what might be factual. So um, we'll do that. And then uh, questions of Mr. Phillips this time. Jim. Did the Planning Commission have this information? They did not. They did not. Thank you. Cindy. Hi, George. Um, Cindy. Did, have you met with the um, neighbors regarding your proposal? We have not. Mr. Matranga did have a conversation with the neighbor to the north, um, requested uh, or asked if he was willing to meet on it, and the gentleman responded that he was not. So, um, but that was the one conversation okay. that was had. Thank you. And the, George, I have a couple of questions, I think. Um, just want to be clear, just trying to grapple with all of this, um, uh, but noting that a variance request, the, the standard for that is that there are unusual attributes about a particular piece of property, trying to weigh that against uh, the reality that uh, if the building was somewhat lower, uh, it may still cause as many um, concerns that it does now almost, uh, but, uh, but it wouldn't have required any, uh, any exceptional approval process. So just want to try to absorb all these details. So the lights, um, are they, we spent, all of us here, it's been a lot of time hearing about, uh, as Suzanne mentioned, night lights and lights that not pollute the sky. Is there any control now on the existing lights in the facilities? Do they have any shield that points that uh, light downward? You mentioned lowering them. Is there any mechanism now that tries to, I drive by this thing almost every day. And in the evening, uh, when it's lit up, it's very bright. Um, yeah. So is there, is there anything on the lights currently? They, they do have a cone structure. Um, it's, I think it's even mentioned in the staff report where it's supposed to be directing it down. It, that uh, cone, for lack of a better term, is silver, uh, which actually may not help on the spillover issue. We explored the lowering. Uh, there could be exploration of perhaps changing out that cone to something darker, elongating it perhaps so it shoots more downward. Um, we could certainly explore something like that. Uh, but the thought, the immediate thought was lowering it. Um, and if I could just real quickly help the board with some of the other things we've tried to f explore here, we, tr we uh, tried to find out if if the cover could be painted? And the answer was no, no painter would paint it or stand by the painting of it. We looked at lowering it, actually cutting off the legs and lowering it, but then you change the engineering and they won't stand by the structure. So we've, we tried to look through uh, several of these. That one could be explored to, to, uh, in, in more detail to see if we could in fact modify that direction down of, uh, directing down of more light. So I'm assuming there are other vendors, other manufacturers of these kinds of facilities, but in, in the cut sheet that you gave us, uh, a couple of pieces of paper, but clear span is the manufacturer. Uh, so it looks like they had these buildings in, I heard your comments about the prior footprint for the arena, and I used to drive by that also. Uh, but it was 100 foot wide, and I can understand the desire to keep that, uh, if possible. Um, but um, it says that they have these buildings in 65, 73, and 100 foot widths. And I don't know if the height would have been proportional to the changes. Uh, in other words, if you bought a 73 foot uh, wide facility, it would have compromised the arena size somewhat. But if it was proportional, the building height would have been 32 feet. 
um, and in compliance with our height requirements, it still would have been a big building. Um, so did, did, do you know any, you, you talked about the engineering of this particular facility and potentially dropping the height, those kinds of options. Do you know if these other sizes were considered or reviewed in, in a perfect world? There would have been good communication about all that, but, but do you have any we background? Did, we did not explore the cost if we were actually to reduce the width. Mm -hmm. um, the staff, and staff pointed out in the, in the, in the staff report, the different widths would have allowed the, the lower height. Um, but again, that's part of the, so what, oh, I, I was gonna say that's part of the unique circumstances that we had a 100 foot wide arena. Um, certainly as an approach to reducing the cost of replacement, but I'm assuming it's still well in excess of, I mean, it's, it's gonna be very significant cost wise. Um, perhaps it's not 318,000, but it's, significant figures. In fact, even the new, I should add that even a new cover is in the neighborhood of 80,000 plus um, with clear span. Uh, and it just reminds me of uh, Supervisor Holmes' question about the manufacturer and the contractor. Um, there were conversations about that uh, after this came up and clear span is out of Connecticut. Um, and uh, they're just responding to orders and specifications. The contractor has um, erected these all over the Western United States, including other locations in California, and they're used to a mixed bag of some jurisdictions not requiring a permit. So in this circumstance, the conversation went from Mr. Matranga to the contractor, the county says no permits required, contractor says okay, they don't have a light that goes off, um, because uh, again, they run into it elsewhere, and the facility was erected. But there, we did run that trail down um, to get more information on on how that all came to be. Well, and or you know, the frustrating thing with these kinds of things is that you know they're difficult for us, obviously. But um, in a perfect world, there would have been healthy communication back and forth, and if in this vendor, it was known that you couldn't go the particular height that came with this particular product, which was 100 feet wide, then at least the business perspective could have reviewed whether or not a 73 foot wide horse arena would have been acceptable or not, and we may not be here, but I'm just trying to drill down to all of those questions to, to get a handle on the decision that we have, so. Well, I appreciate the, the question because, I mean, that really is the center of, you know, the, the issue or the controversy here because had that meeting at the county gone differently and Mr. Matranga had a, a better understanding, um, there would be a 36-foot tall building that looks very similar to or identical to what it does today. The, um, the, the fact that you know, we're, we're going through this process is really a consequence of you know, that not happening. And um, that's why we're trying to find altern alternative means of, of softening the impact. Yeah, thanks. Suzanne. Yes, I have a, just a couple of questions. I, I on the, uh, the website here, I'm just curious about the confusion because it says owners of parcels of 10 acres or greater may apply for an agriculture exempt building permit, but the, your client's acreage was only 9.8. So my question is, do they fulfill the 10 acre or greater in order to go forward with this? And then it does say that they, are, they, may, they may apply for an agricultural exempt building permit. So if they wanted to be exempt, why didn't they apply for the exempt building permit? They, uh, Mr. Petranga did go to the Ag Commissioner, and I have two forms so that were filled out for the Ag Commissioner, um, where they, this Ag Commissioner signed off on the parcel being 10 acres. Okay, and, uh, that's good, that's good. And uh, again, he was under the understanding, and talking to the Ag Commissioner, it was, a, it was the building permit for the shop building and these other outbuildings, not the arena cover, because he understood he didn't need a permit for that from the building department. But it, 
it says right here, please note that agricultural buildings still require approval of a building permit and remain subject to applicable county zoning requirements. I mean, that to me is nothing confusing about that requirement. But I think that's, I mean, that's, that's part of the imperfection in the communications, so the I think. They were building was this first okay, page. so. That's how it was revised. The top page is what they saw. And then after we had a hearing last year, the Ag Commission, it, it went to the second page and they changed what was on the website. So my question might be for the Ag Commissioner. <laughs> Who happens to be here? <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Yeah. Josh Hunsinger, Placer County Agricultural Hi, Commissioner. After the Crowley thing, the web page didn't get changed. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if, I, if I may just sure. add a few points of clarification. Okay. So the Agricultural Commissioner's role in the agricultural exempt building permit process is to do one thing and one thing only, and that is verify the agricultural use of the building. So in the past 10 plus years ago, there was a lot of abuse of the system, a lot of people wanting to benefit from that exemption, building mother-in-law units and other types of things that were clearly not agricultural buildings, calling them ag buildings because they knew that there was a significant benefit to doing so in the way of permit fees, permit process, et cetera. And so at that point, the building division requested my involvement in vetting the use of those buildings and saying this is an agricultural use, this is not. And so at that point, approximately 10 years ago, we got, my office got involved in that. I still to this day personally uh, do handle each of these applications with very few exceptions. Um, I do not verify the acreage. Um, and Mr. Matrenga's application said 10 acres on them. That is not really my role. The application form, which you have, has not changed between, you know, over a number of years. The website we did after the Crowley hearing, uh, take a look at that and realize that there was some real room for improvement, just to clarify up front some things on the website. But the actual application form, which clearly states that it's 10 acres and above for the exemption, clearly says the application review goes through planning, building, environmental health, et cetera. None of that has changed. The applicant has all that information on the attestation form that they sign uh, through my office. Okay. Thanks, Josh. You Thank you, Josh. You're welcome. I think just one last clarification before I sit down. Um, and that is really about, uh, there's a one comment in the staff report that I think factually um, I would call into question and then some of the correspondence in opposition uh, to this uh, the and Bennett made it part uh, was part of his presentation part of the findings was you know that the activity of the owner here was essentially intentional and and you know and then there's comments in the this the uh, opposition where um, talks about risk that the that Mr. Matranga took this on and took this risk and I I really think we, we need to recognize what really occurred here we had someone who came to the counter had a conversation with county staff walked away from that understanding he had certain requirements on some structures and no requirement on another no one in their right mind would go and have that conversation thinking that they still may need a, a permit for that cover and take the risk of spending over three hundred thousand dollars to erect that cover thinking that in fact it could be unlawful so i think that um, we really do have an honest mistake here from a conversation that took place with with staff so i just want to clarify that again we're we're not pointing any fingers that um, at the process other than it is imperfect at times and we have a circumstance here that is a product of that imperfection. Chip, do you have? Yeah, have, has the owner or have you reached out to the uh, neighbors to see if there are any interest in doing something of this nature uh, as far as 
painting the structure or the top or lowering the lights? Uh, we, we, well, we can't paint the structure, but we have uh, yeah, no, we no. have not had that conversation relative to the colors. We could have additional conversations, but to date, no, we have not. Again, that's where one request, Smetranka had a conversation with the norm, one neighbor to the north. There was not an interest to meet. I think it would be in your best interest to have that conversation with the neighbors. Uh, just if, the, if they'll meet with us, yes, Pardon? I agree. If they would meet with us, yeah. Yes. Just the gray uh, looks like a uh, industrial building. The tan is just yucky, <laughs> <laughs> but the green might work. And so I don't know if it's if there's interest, any interest, to, any ability to reach out to those folks to see if there would be some kind of a, a, a agreement to change the top, change the cover, and lower the lights. And if, if in fact, that's the desire of the board, we could also have conversations about the, the light fixtures themselves. Well, they need to understand that if they do lower it to 36 feet, they're going to have the same light problem. Exactly. I mean, that's, yeah. we think, the inescapable. Yeah. So I think it'd be worthwhile to reach out to community members and see what they feel. Thank you. Okay, now we'll open it up to the public so anyone and everyone can come up and uh, testify. Um, just uh, tell us your name for the record, please. Robert. Susan. Can I still ask two other questions? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't see your light. But before that. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, before that. I'm Supervisor sorry. Jones has My, a question or comment. Um, I have one one question for you. Uh, did your client apply for a permit to do the lighting electrical? No, no, we don't believe there's a requirement to do that for this structure. Oh, okay. And then I have a question for EJ. <laughs> Hi, EJ. After briefing with you, I hope you can help us about the, the counter staff. So if someone comes to the, to the counter and inquires about, you know, building some things on the, on the farm there and, and uh, barns and, and arenas and such, although an ag building may not require a building permit, didn't you say they would require a building plan? You either require a building plan or a building permit? So I think either way they require they required a permit. It's a it's when it's ag exempt, it's an ag exempt building permit. So when they come to the front counter, my understanding is if it's an agricultural building, they're immediately sent over to our agricultural commissioner's office, and that's where the commissioner determines the use of the property. They're given a form. The form is what you have a copy have of and been talking about. I don't have a copy of that <clears throat> form. Do you have a copy of that form? We don't. Josh has that <laughs> form, With me. but but on that form, the and uh, Mr. Phillips had a copy of that form that Mr. Matranga signed, uh, basically acknowledges what the requirements are, the exempt status, and that you also need to check with the other departments of the county, environmental health, planning, building, for any other permits. So the form itself has not changed. That's that's pretty clear. Okay, so it is on that form that they sign that does say to check into all those other. Right, but I believe that form was done after the fact, after it was already in code compliance. Okay, and and could you tell me do 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 builders or home by homeowners or whoever do they have to apply for a permit when they want to do lighting and electrical? I would assume that's required by the UBC, the Uniform Building Code. Yep. <laughs> okay, thanks. Maybe Karen, could you clarify that specifically to you guys? Because so we have a planning department essentially Cedra, and then we have a building department. But mm -hmm. what kinds of? I'm mean, curious as to if I'm going to build an agricultural building, and I go through the agricultural building process. I know because I represent a lot of that district that the fees are less expensive, mm -hmm. and and hopefully the review is commensurate with that. But what level of requirement would there be for a permit for the electrical uh, or what interface would be driven by the applicant with the building department for inspections and I think that's what Suzanne's getting at well I, I'm not unfortunately I'm not the building inspector so I can't say whether these lights would require an electrical permit 
but I do know that if a building permit's required, it's run through the uh, building inspector, and if there's a, a requirement for the electrical, that's when it would be caught. Unfortunately, our building <laughs> official could not be here today. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, anyone from the public who'd like to address the board, please come forward and state your name. Someone's coming. My name is Janelle Cosentino. Um, I am a parent to a, a young daughter who rides at the facility that is in question here. Um, I, I think it's really important to bring up the intention of that building structure. Kelly and Gary, they own horses. They, they actually ride a different type of discipline than is even really necessary for the use specific to that arena. But they erected that structure specifically to benefit a whole barn of young riders that are, are just starting out. Um, and it is ultimately to help them in the months of winter when there's pouring down rain, when otherwise they, they would not be able to ride, um, when it's 105 degrees outside and they would otherwise not be able to ride, which excludes several months of the year here. We have rain in the winter and we have terrible heat in the summer. So that structure allows the kids to continue their training year round. And it really is imperative to the process of their um, competitive horsemanship, which everyone at that barn rides competitively. So the year round process is necessary. Kelly and Gary did not construct that structure for selfish use. They built it for the kids. And they built it because they love to come and watch the kids ride. And it was from a place from their heart, totally. Um, the lights keep coming up as a, um, a very specific reason why the neighbors are offended by the building. And I, I personally find it really interesting because the last class, even in the winter, ends at 6 p.m. or 6.30 p.m. And the lights go off. And no one uses that facility again until the morning. So I am not sure when the neighbors are finding this glowing light to be so disturbing at 6.30 p.m. It's not at 10 o'clock at night. It's not late when everyone would want, you know, darkness. And, and it's very peaceful by 7 p.m. Everything at that entire barn is shut down and everyone has gone home. And Gary and Kelly, again, don't use that facility for their discipline of horse riding, so they're not down there past 6.30 p.m. either. I just want it to be specified from our behalf that the intention of that facility is not to, to stick it to the neighbors. We don't care what they think, you know, it's, it is what it is. It's, this, this works as an amazing opportunity for the kids to ride year round and, and how can we make that happen for them? Look, here's this already prefabricated structure. We can make this happen, we can make it work. And um, it, was, it was something that they did truly from their heart to help the program. So I will leave that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, these are all kids that ride there. You can wave at us. Hello, my name is Christina Vermette, and I too am a parent of some writers. Um, at the barn that we're talking about. Uh, we're actually a family that has three horses boarded with Gary and Kelly, and uh, we find them to be incredibly warm and passionate people. Um, you know, they constructed this after meeting our trainer, um, promising this ability, like Jen said, to have our kids ride year round. I have one daughter who rides extremely competitively, is trying to go places with her horse riding career. And I think that, uh, sorry, what Kelly and Gary have done is really wonderful. And I just don't think that they would do anything intentionally. Um, and 
you know, Mr. Phillips did say that there was a miscommunication, and I truly believe that. So, sorry, my husband's not here to laugh at me, and he totally would because I get emotional all the time. Um, but really, they're just beautiful people, and I just want to stand up for them and say that they wouldn't have done anything intentionally. So, Jen said everything else perfectly, so I'm going to leave it at that, too. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wish to address the board on this item? Hi, my name is Burr Ellis. Uh, I live up above Gary so I can see the barn and it doesn't bother me. But what bothers me is I just got through about a year and a half ago building a barn. When you go through the process to do an ag barn and it was 300 feet by 60 feet, they do not ever ask you how tall it's gonna be. They don't even ask how big. All they ask is to show a plot plan of the property where the barn's gonna sit and show the setback from the street. And so when you call for inspection, all the inspector does, he comes out to the property, he gets his tape measure out, and he measures from center line to the, where the barn's marked, and as long as I got the clearance, in other words, for the setback, that's all it required. No more inspections, nothing. However, it is an ag barn, which means there's no water, no electricity, no cement floors. We store hay. But it, it kind of bothers me because I could have put a barn up like that. I would have put the sides up 18 feet above the ground, and we would have could have stacked it. And you can put a lot of hay in one, but they're too darn expensive. But what happens? I mean, it would kill me if, I, if you told me I had to lower it down to the 44 feet. Uh, I just think something needs to be done or somebody needs to ask what measurements you're doing. And that's about all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the uh, board on this item? Yeah. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Shelly Henson. I'm actually a neighbor and I'm here representing not only my family, but neighbors. Um, they didn't want to have the same old thing being brought up and emotions and all that kind of stuff. So I was asked to come and to meet with you guys. Um, nothing has been um, um, addressed about the Matrongas doing something to be mean or anything like that or not wanting the children to ride. That has nothing to do with this structure. There I have seen many horse arenas and they are not 44 feet tall, and they're not white tents, okay? When people come out and they say, oh, the Hindenburg, oh, you're next to the Hindenburg, oh, you're next to the Gray Fog Bank, um, wow, how can you handle looking at that every day? We have no problem with the kids out there riding. We think that's great. But I've seen lots of metal buildings where it won't let the light come through the top, um, it can have the aprons down far enough to where I'm going to actually probably need longer than three minutes because I'm representing quite a few people too. But um, <clears throat> a metal building, the, the average size of an arena, the height is usually 18 to 20 feet. Okay? <laughs> when you can park a 737 in this building, that's a joke. The horses can jump maybe five to six feet. Okay? Um, it's just too big. But I'm going to get on to more of what I wrote for the speech. That was just to get started. But this is the third time over the past year that we've had to come in here and deal with this or over Zoom. And um, during this due process, we've heard denial from the appeal from the principal planning commissioner. He listened to everyone, addressed all the concerns, and painstakingly went through the codes very justly, fairly, and lawfully. We heard the denial with a unanimous vote from the Planning Commission. We have seen the maneuvering. We've heard the blame. We've heard the framing of hardship. We've seen the hiring of attorneys to try to push this through. And we've seen lots of delays. 
Um, it's taken over 22 years to get my property to look like it does today. It used to be a trashy, ugly property. It literally, the former owners removed trash, hundreds and hundreds of barrels off our property. Um, metal, bob wire, all mixed in with the dirt, just trash everywhere. And that was with one person's doing to do that. Yet it's taken years for us to do something about it. The thing though, it wasn't that bad. It didn't affect everybody else. It affected the few neighbors and it affected the landowner because it was only, things weren't even higher than 10 feet tall. The grass would actually glow, grow in between them. But it's different when you have a massive building. It's massive. And it's 44 feet tall. Remember the horses? I don't, I've never seen horses jump higher than this. But, you know, let's, let's get a, an idea of this height and how massive. 22 feet long, 100 feet wide. It isn't hidden in the grass for only the owners and a few neighbors to endure. In two weeks, the views for the neighbors, myself, the views of the rolling hills, the buttes, the coastal range and natural settings and landscapes, years of planting were rudely taken away in two weeks. The anger people expel that who have seen this, they're like, why hasn't this come down yet? How did the county approve this? We've lived out here forever. You can't go to the county and not get a permit. And we know that it's not 10 acres. And we know you have to get a permit for it to be exempt also. You know that if you lived out here long enough. And you would be crazy to build something <laughs> that big and that expensive. But that's not our fault. That's not our fault. We didn't choose to put this in. And before, when the lights were up, I don't think there were any written complaints in about it. So the big complaint is the structure and the height. It's more than that. And um, for you supervisors, you are the last line of defense, basically. If you vote for this, you will personally be responsible for a new horrible precedent for our rural community. This is a huge wake up moment in time and it's time to put into code and stop these huge blights from being put up in our community. They completely change the landscape and they may be cheaper, quicker to build, but at what cost? Really, what cost that we have to sit there and deal with this? Causing glare, night sky pollution and blocking and removing, removal and covering up of natural settings. There is nothing natural about this tent it took 17 years for my trees to grow to the current height. There's no way close, they are no way close to covering and hiding this tent, ever. They'll never be that tall. Remember, in two weeks, one person's decision, one person's calculated risk to pass the county and build and then ask for forgiveness later. Only after numerous written complaints was anything filed this is a forced blight on our community, and I'm asking you to deny the appeal. I'm not happy that I've had to do this, but I absolutely had no option. I've lived here 52 years, and this is my duty to stand up for my home and my community and my family and all the other people that live around me. I do want the Matrangas to know that there is no problem with the kids being there. Actually, it's enjoyable. But if you'll look on the sheet that I have, that I've given you, that has a picture of the, to scale, the plane, all that, there is a picture of what a normal arena or looks like with the metal, the sides, and the light won't be going to people's properties. So still looking at this clear span thing, I think it should be stopped it needs to be stopped for the county and it needs to be the code just because it's not in the code right now doesn't mean it shouldn't be and that's all i have to say thank you thank you is there anyone else who'd like to address the board anyone on zoom okay um george would you like to clarify any factual issues a couple things yes just real quickly um in response to Ms. Hansen's comments, under, understand her 
thoughts and opinions on this uh, and respect them. The, the, a couple of clarifications, though, the, the uh, Planning Commission was not unanimous. It was a split vote. It was 6-1, uh, actually 5-1-1. One, one. Um, and then also um, George Rosasco, the zoning administrator, made a very relevant comment as part of his um, review of, of this issue um, by saying that the type of the structure and the lighting is irrelevant to the discussion. And um, so I understand the concern about the size of the building, um, the impact of showing airplane inside of it, uh, showing other buildings that are lower, different materials. The, the reality of it is, though, there are no requirements that the county has to require those types of buildings versus any other type of structure. So the height is, is really the only, only issue. Um, and though there is one photo I wanted to hand out, just again for comparison purposes. This is from the Delaney's property, which is across the, the uh, Wise Road. But, in that um, the bottom photo on this page that you see is um, a photo that was in the Delaney's materials to the, to the board. Um, the photo on top was a photo taken by the Matrangas when they met with the Delaney's in February of, of 2020. You can see the same pond in the uh, background in the top photo and the arena structure is in that top photo but the photo this on the bottom was the one that was submitted by the Delaney's uh, clearly they're emphasizing a point uh, and um, I'm sure zooming in a bit but it's it's perspective um, I'm not making light of the, the Hansen's concerns or situations. They are 325 feet away from this structure. Um, their grade is about 30 feet above the floor, but so they are looking out at the structure. Um, the Delaney is over a quarter mile from the structure, and um, just for everyone's reference point, it's a quarter mile from the curb cut to pull into the domes to the intersection of Fulweiler and Highway 49. Um, so I, I get back to where we were originally. We're here because of the aesthetics, and the aesthetics aren't an issue. <laughs> um, the circumstances are that you know, the, the height is an issue, and not the type of structure, not the way it's lit. And again, so we would um, reiterate our request of uh, approving the uh, appeal. If there is a concern about further discussion about color and lighting issue, uh, if, it's, if that's an interest of the board, we're, we're happy to do that. But um, again, we, uh, we are trying to make a, a better situation out of the existing one, and uh, there's been mistakes all the way around on this one. So we, uh, we apologize for those that were on our end. But um, at any rate, that's our request. Any additional questions, we're happy to answer them. Suzanne. Yes. Um, we received a copy of the application from the Ag Commissioner. And in light of the stuff that was put on this application, I don't really think it's a height issue that we have here. I think it's really more of a compliance issue because Right off the bat, it says agricultural buildings uh, do not require a building permit when they are, and it says located on any property of 10 or more acres. So the applicant put down that it is 10 acres. So which leads me to question, maybe they should have said 9.8 and then got the Ag Commissioner to say, well, 9.8 is close enough, we'll consider it 10 acres kind of a thing. Okay, and, and then in order for that, you have to, besides being uh, 10 acres or more, it says, and when such property and buildings are primarily used for agricultural purposes. It defines here what agricultural exempt buildings are. They are exempt from the building permit fee if it is still, 
it is still subject to fees for processing and separate electrical and mechanical fees as applicable per the current adopted building fee schedule. So that's pretty clear. I mean, you might be exempt from the building permit, but you're not exempt from everything. And if there was no inquiry as to what they were not exempt from, then it kind of questions me. It also includes, does your building include any of the following? Check all that apply right here. And it says any electrical, but the box wasn't checked. And then um, in the description of your operation, he does say horse training, and, but it says the buildings we are applying for, uh, the additional buildings are for our personal five horses. Okay, but that is not, that's from what we're hearing, you, um, you, tr you, allow, you train riders and that sort of thing. So if you go down through the, um, the rest of the form, what it says is I, the property owner, read, read and understand the above excerpt from the county code concerning agricultural buildings. I also understand that an agricultural building is a structure designed and constructed to house farm implements, hay, grain, poultry, livestock, and other horticultural products. Um, the structure will not be a place of human habitation, um, a place of employment, but it says, nor shall it be a place used by the public. So I'm kind of starting to wonder if an agricultural building, is that where you store your hay, like the gentleman over there who could use a taller roof to stack his hay higher, you know, um, or where you, you house your horses when you, you know, when you lease spaces out to house horses. But it says it shall not be used by the public. Exemption from the permit requirements shall not be deemed to grant authorization for any work to be done in any manner in violation of the provisions of the code or any other laws or ordinances of this jurisdiction. So um, in addition, it's noted that the complete scope of work is going to be a prefab metal building, uh, barn and live for livestock. It says again, barn livestock. But it doesn't say anywhere on here about, an, it says that the arena, somewhere I read it, it says that the arena is existing, but it doesn't actually say anywhere on this application that you're going to build a cover on the arena. Yeah. So without that knowledge, the county can't come out and tell you that there are requirements, that there are code requirements. Yeah. Hi, Su Josh. Supervisor Jones, I just want to clarify that the application form that was provided to you uh, the Matrangas uh, completed three different application forms in 2020. The one that you have is the October application for a different metal building. Um, I didn't, I unfortunately grabbed the wrong one this morning when I headed down here. And so the metal building and the specific justification for that metal building on page one are not relevant to this this building. So I apologize for that. The application form and the information on the application form you cited is the same, but the fact that it's a metal building on this form and the specific five horses for personal okay. use, those two points I just okay. want to clarify are not relevant. Then let me ask Josh. So when they did fill out this for the um, arena covering, yeah. did they say that it was not going to be for public use? Yes, they sign that on every single form, and I emphasize that with each applicant. Um, that is part of what they're attesting to, is they acknowledge that it is not for public use, and we do, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and, go through those acknowledgments. And did they uh, check the box that says any electrical? I, I would have to go back and look. I apologize. I don't okay. know that. But at any rate, if, if that was not made known to you, because it says right here, and they signed it, that it, they're still subject to other fees. Yeah. And, uh, and they can't use uh, an, an arena to, to, um, for public use. Yeah, specific to the building I mean, the or the electrical. the agricultural building yeah. is for housing animals or... It's products. a storage use for agricultural things, yes. Right. Josh. Yeah, Supervisor Jones, my only, my only comment on that is I think that um, part of the, the miscue here starts at that point of, after following the first meeting with the building department as to what permits were required and what, which weren't. 
And so I think that Mr. Matranga having conversations w w following that meeting, understanding he needed permits for this one structure, the, the arena cover, not needing a permit is part of that conundrum and mix up. Well, let me just say one thing. I, you know, this is a terrible thing to have to rule on and I feel really bad. I feel for all your writers because it's going to cause a huge problem. But compliance is compliance and in a situation like this, if we don't follow through with compliance, I mean, everybody's going to be out there building the same things and then coming back and saying, oh, I misunderstood what you said and then ask us to forgive them and not follow any of our codes and our regulations and our building requirements. If, if, if I might. Um, you can, you can. The, the only, the only uh, response that I would have is that I, I understand your comment. I think what we're seeing in, even in the, the Ag Commissioner's website is trying to make corrections, improve communications because you're having these misunderstandings. It's, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping that what has come across from our comments today is that there are honest mistakes that are made. So it's, it, I understand compliance being the issue, but part of the reflection on an item like this is procedurally, how does the county improve the system so someone going to the counter, Im information on websites, handout information is as accurate as possible. But again, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of an imperfect process um, where mistakes can be made, uh, understanding compliance, but sometimes you have true hardship where, where there's 100% uh, compliance expected and you've got a 50% uh, efficient or effective process or where, it could, where there could be improvements. out here that are writing, this is no reflection on your ability um, to ride and we want you to be able to do that. I, I do think this is really challenging for us as a precedent. And I know probably at your age you're smarter than I was, but precedents are dangerous for us. And when we allow people to um, go above and beyond our rules, and then that impacts others for forever, right? I mean, the neighbors are gonna have to be looking at something that uh, is much taller for a very long time. So. Um, we went through this with the trap club <laughs> on another structure in which um, the variance was we denied and and had to go through that structure also and and so it's in a very short period of time that I think I've had three of these in front of us and so I take um, the testimony George that you've provided us on on problems with communication we've got to clarify that if there's any mistakes here uh, I don't know that there were I mean that's one person's word against another as to what was said at the counter um, but this really is a challenge for me to accept that we should just allow someone to um, be that much taller than our own height guidelines because then why wouldn't everyone else do that? So I would tend to uphold um, the previous findings from the Planning Commission and the Zoning Administrator. Jim. Yeah, I tried to raise the issue about uh, changing the colors of the, of the arena cover, but that's not, our, that's not what we're here for because that's an aesthetical thing. And so, again, uh, the issue of precedent uh, is, concerns me. And we are seeing a lot more uh, people coming in uh, for ranching purposes in the in the rural areas, and I think that we really need to hold fast to what the conditions are and not allow uh, a precedent to be set with this. So I would be in favor of the denial. Bonnie. Thank you. I agree. This is really challenging, um, and. Um, when I heard from the neighbors about the project, I saw the concern of an ugly, um, especially glowing, especially at night, right? A, a very large structure glowing at night. Um, nobody wants to look at that. Um, and the challenge here, as I see it, is somebody put up a structure, mistakes were made, we need to clarify as a county, our height limitations and we've got to be, do a better job of informing our neighbors and residents about what our requirements are 
Um, but if we take this structure down, uh, the applicant could still put up a same type of structure because we have no design no design requirements at 36 feet and with with a 10 percent variance 39 and a half feet uh, still the same white ugly structure and and I agree that a uh, some of the other examples Shelley that you shared that are out along Wise Road and off of McCourtney Road much nicer uh, but I think that those are steel you may know Supervisor Wygant steel or they might even be wood um, those are much nicer but I would guess a lot more expensive to build um, and I don't know if that's the case or not I am seeing some head shaking I'm, I'm guessing if you are going to have to build something out of steel it's going to cost you a lot of money and the reason the applicant went with this was because it was cost effective met his needs um, so that's my concern is that the, ultimately the applicant will tear it down just put up something that still is less expensive um, and not address the concerns of the neighbors which I would certainly want to see a different color uh, structure cover trees along wise road to uh, hide the view over time uh, a, a reduction in the the lights or maybe some decisions about what time the lights have to go off so that it is not uh, part of being out in the country is to sit outside and enjoy the beauty um, when you know you're you're done with your work day and enjoy it um, so I, I am torn because I'm concerned the applicant will just go ahead and build what he wants um, without any changes Um, Suzanne. Yes, I just wanted to add one other thing. Is I mean, it would be nice if we could ask them to be good neighbors, you know, and consider a covering that would be pleasing, aesthetically pleasing and all, but really the only thing we can ask is for compliance. That's all we can ask. So. Can I say something too? I uh, just want to see the kids not be able to ride. The ride. Public. Yeah. <laughs> Public comment is closed, thank you. Well, then I will comment on that. Is It has nothing to do with denying the kids writing. It, it may cause them a delay if they have to change the cover on it. It may cause them a delay, but we won't be denying them writing. You can come back, you can ride. Perhaps you can ride in an area that's not under the cover, but it's all about compliance. Well, so I'll just add my comments before, we, it sounds like we're headed in a particular direction, but um, there's a large horse training facility, interestingly, on Wise Road, uh, way at the westerly end of it, um, but it's a wooden barn structure predominantly. And the zoning could be as large as 80 acre, but it's at least 20 acre minimum, so easier to have that facility fit into that landscape, if you will, and that's, you know, interestingly, it's a difficult one. One, because it's already up and operating, so those are more difficult, but two, um, you know, for lack of 10 to 20 percent height difference, uh, we wouldn't even have a reason for being here. Um, but I agree that the preponderance of what uh, must direct us is complying or not. And there's just, I think maybe we want to have a little bit more of a discussion with staff as it relates to our I'm reading. Uh, I'd actually like to see a copy of the actual application that was used but again, filled out after the fact, so it makes it more difficult. But it's clear that if there was no electricity in the building, there would be no lights and it wouldn't glow like it does at night. So it'd be less obvious. It's still a large light uh, structure. But, um, and then the part about public use is pretty black and white. That's, that's um, but, but I think maybe some education on the board's part, maybe some modification of our zoning text and some other things that anticipate more of these kinds of uses. Because on one hand, um, for someone who has lived in this kind of a setting virtually all my life, I want to see more horse facilities and more horse training facilities and uh, more kids being exposed to, to those kinds of things. But, uh, but I think we're kind of between a rock and a hard place here. And I think uh, I agree with um, Supervisor Jones that really the driving 
question here is compliance. So if somebody has a motion in that regard, we can. Mr. Chair, I move staff's recommendation to uphold the Planning Commission's decision to deny the variance request and order conformance or removal of the non-conforming structure subject to any applicable permits within 180 days of this decision, subject to the findings found in the staff report. And for clarification, that also included an actual denial of the appeal. Yes, and the actual denial of the appeal. Is there a second? Second. Uh, motion home, second. Gustafson, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll now take up our 345 timed item, uh, which is East Plaster Threshold and Screening Criteria for Vehicle Miles Traveled. Um, Stephanie, I saw us. Oh, there she is. Thought, thought you were, yes, please. Oh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and executive team. I'm Crystal Jacobson, Deputy Director of the Community Development Resource Agency in Tahoe, and with me is Stephanie Holloway, Senior Engineer with the Transportation Planning Division of Public Works. The item before you this afternoon um, has been a joint community development and uh, DPW work effort, so we are here together to present to you recommendations on a vehicle miles traveled, otherwise known as VMT. Uh, threshold and screening criteria for our East uh, Placer County area, which would, does include uh, Donner Summit. So, um, oops. Um, just to kind of outline the presentation, we're going to run through a brief refresher on the legislative uh, intent of Senate Bill 743, which is related to VMT, uh, discuss thresholds and screening criteria recommendations for the assessment of environmental impacts under the California Environmental Equality Act, or CEQA, uh, for projects uh, that come forward in uh, East Placer County area. We'll give you a high-level overview of the uh, TRPA, um, what's called, excuse me, Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, otherwise known as TRPA, uh, Project Impact Assessment Framework, which we are happy to say was adopted by the TRPA Governing Board on April 28th. Uh, and then we'll discuss tools for cal the calculation of VMT um, and potential mitigation, which can be applied to projects. Um, Go. By way of background, the county's efforts to establish a VMT threshold started back in late 2019. Um, CEDRA and DPW met early with uh, project applicants and uh, technical pra practitioners in February of 2020 uh, to seek input and feedback on uh, VMT for East Placer. Uh, we also engaged other stakeholders, uh, such as Caltrans, uh, various local agencies, including counties, the County of El Dorado, Nevada, Santa Clara, uh, San Diego and is and also some cities and towns uh, such as the town of Truckee, Roseville and Sacramento and this was really in an effort uh, to identify best practices and currently supported recommendations around VMT um, which could really fit the landscape of Placer including the East Placer region. So implementation of SB 743 under CEQA began roughly one year ago on July uh, 2020, July 1st 2020 so that's when projects began to have to analyze their VMT impacts. In December 2020, your board then adopted uh, thresholds, a screening criteria and guidance on VMT for use in CEQA review for projects in Western Placer. And if you remember at that time, uh, staff asked your board to delay adoption um, for the East Placer region and for the Tahoe Basin uh, because we were coordinating with uh, the TRPA on a VMT threshold or standard uh, for specific project level requirements that, that was ongoing. So we were currently coordinating with them on, the, on a threshold there. So we are happy to say again that the TRPA Governing Board did adopt amendments to the regional VMT uh, threshold under Article 7 of the Bi-State Compact that was done in late April. Um, this for us, for staff, was an exciting milestone in terms of um, implementation of the county's Tahoe Basin Area Plan, really the investment that we want to see in the town centers in the basin, and uh, really moving redevelopment projects forward uh, in the Tahoe Basin area. 
Uh, TRP's adopted framework uh, is called, again, their Project Impact Assessment. It will be discussed today and is directly linked to the CEQA requirements um, under SB 743. So just to touch on the legislative intent of SB 43 really quick, uh, it was signed into law in 2013. The legislation requires lead agencies to shift their CEQA analysis from level of service to VMT. So instead of analyzing or focusing the analysis on the con traffic congestion, uh, it's focusing the analysis on the trips that are generated, generated by a project. Um, the legislative intent uh, is threefold. One, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions along with the state's goals on that. Um, to develop multimodal transportation networks, including active transportation, so more focus on biking and walking. And to encourage a diversity of land uses through streamlined infill development. So the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, OPR, has updated the CEQA guidelines to reflect the change in methodology. Um, it has also issued a technical advisory on this topic. Um, this guidance uh, really serves as a roadmap uh, for local agencies, or lead agencies, excuse me, an establishment um, of the rules that govern uh, project assessment of VMT uh, impacts. However, uh, lead agencies also have the discretion to establish their own uh, thresholds and screening criteria, which is why we're before your board today for the East, East Placer uh, threshold. So, um, Looking at the big picture here in, in Tahoe, um, again, your board did adopt VMT thresholds and screening criteria for the western portion, uh, shown here in the yellow area um, on this map. Um, that was in late uh, 2020. For East Placer, so for um, this portion up in here, um, there was an awareness of the need to really um, look at a separate evaluation, uh, and this is due to the uh, predominantly recreational and leisure travel um, destinations that we have up in Tahoe. So I think we all know that uh, recreation, there's a big recreational draw in terms of trips uh, that come to the Tahoe region. So additionally, uh, with the implementation of 743, project development in the Tahoe Basin portion of East Placer was suddenly really subject to overlapping environmental uh, review standards and analysis. So this portion right here in the basin. Uh, we're subject to TRPA code of ordinance um, standards in terms of VMT analysis, and then also Placer County CEQA threshold compliance. So uh, projects that would come in were really required to look at two different thresholds and analyze impacts uh, to both of those. Uh, so really, because of that, and due to the unique travel pattern, patterns and need for environmental uh, sensitivity uh, in the basin, we did work closely with the TRPA uh, to align their framework and ours, um, and the idea was to minimize the need for two different studies and potentially two different conclusions on VMT uh, where we could. So with that, Stephanie's going to walk you through both the uh, TRPA framework that has been adopted um, and then talk about CEQA recommendations uh, to illustrate this alignment and to kind of point out where they, where they differ. So I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie to conclude the presentation. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Crystal. Great tee up. Uh, nothing like a technical topic at the end of a long day. So <laughs> I'll uh, be happy if you guys can hang with me on this and I'll try to distill it down. What gives you the impression it was long? <laughs> <laughs> so good afternoon. Stephanie Holloway again with the Department of Public Works. Uh, I'm going to, as Crystal mentioned, walk you through some of the technical details and um, I was instrumental in, in, in working with TRPA and um, coming up with a what we hope is an alignment in the framework. So um, orientate myself here. So this slide is really um, meant to, to, to show you and, and to illustrate TRPA's mission on their project impact assessment, as Crystal mentioned. This is the um, framework that they are they will use to identify impacts at the project level under the TRPA uh, code of ordinances. So their mission um, to provide a transparent process um, to evaluate VMT, uh, really trying to look for opportunities for streamlining for simple and small projects, and then also for those more complex projects, providing um, you know a, a guidance and a path forward on that. Uh, their goals uh, to incentivize development of low v development in low VMT areas like our town centers, uh, re reducing greenhouse gas emissions, promoting mobility, 
and then ultimately um, reducing reliance on the personal automobile. So just to highlight here, really, the all, you know their goals were really um, in alignment with with the legislative intent of 743 as well. So uh, we were in lockstep there. So talking about our goals for CEQA, um, you know, over the last year, as you know, we've been working to really assess OPR's technical advisory, as Crystal mentioned, and figuring out how that applies uh, within, within Placer County. Um, and I think this effort really was, uh, as Crystal mentioned, just a unique effort to, um, you know, look at our, what I'll call our non-urbanizing uh, area of the county and, and recognizing the recreational travel, uh, which was different from Western County. Um, you, you know, and I think just to kind of highlight on our goals here, and you saw this in, in December, uh, we did recognize that there may be some instances where we would want to recommend something slightly different from OPR. Um, and so we established this list of goals um, for the effort to really, um, you know, help align us and help keep us directed, but also to kind of help us uh, provide some substantial evidence and support. Uh, around anything that looked and feels a little different from where OPR was recommending. So our goals uh, to comply with, comply with the law, um, to allow for planned growth, um, provide economic benefit, and then uh, ultimately to try to keep it simple. So into the details here, this is a slide that shows you the metrics. Uh, a metric is, is basically our measure, uh, how we measure VMT. Um, that was the first uh, step in, in defining uh, this framework. Uh, this shows just really how the, the metrics are calculated by land use. Um, this uh, metric table was also adopted again uh, by the governing board at TRPA back in April and is our recommendation for your board today. Generally, uh, residential and tourist accommodation land uses would be measured using what we call an efficiency metric. So a VMT per residence, a VMT per capita. Um, it is uh, differing here depending on the land use. And then for commercial and recreation and transportation, you'll see our uh, metric recommendation is a total VMT. So moving on to the, the thresholds, and again, a threshold or a standard of significance as, as TRPA uh, uses is really a, a new metrical mat maximum value of VMT. So if your project generates a VMT that is at or below, you can be considered to be less than significant. Um, above that threshold, then the, the project would be considered to be significant, and we would look for feasible mitigation to be applied. So that is the basis of the threshold. Um, you know, these standards of significance and thresholds were developed, you know, hours of consultation and discussions with TRPA. Um, but but uh, like I mentioned, are really in alignment with where OPR uh, was hoping to the state to go. Uh, you will recognize some of the, the thresholds here. They're a little different for Tahoe, but um, they are in general alignment with where California uh, was seeking. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our, our screening criteria. Uh, some of our screening criteria uh, for this area was really developed through stakeholder input. So again, just to focus on residential tourist accommodation, and I'll bring in public service here. Uh, the threshold recommendation is 15% below the average for Eastern Placer. Um, and if you remember for Western Placer, uh, we did recommend a similar threshold. Uh, again, the average was for our Western Placer travel. This is for our Eastern Placer uh, travel characteristics. Um, the commercial, recreational, and transportation uh, elements and projects uh, would need to limit their VMT in order to um, find that they are less than significant to a no net increase. Uh, I will also point out here that uh, you know, much of our development in Tahoe is redevelopment. Um, and so the, the measure or the analysis that's performed for the redevelopment is really focused on that net change, uh, the, the net, net difference uh, between an existing project and a proposed project. So just to highlight that. Um, and then one more thing, just to kind of highlight uh, the land uses and the projects that we typically see in Tahoe um, are not uni uh, unilateral. They, they typically have more than one land use. And so we'll see what we call a mixed product or a mixed use product um, come through. Uh, OPR does recommend that we analyze each component of that mixed use separately uh, and in conformance with the recommendations of the thresholds. So, 
just to kind of point that out. There, there are some nuances there, and I won't get into that by the, at the end of the day here, but just to kind of highlight the, the mixed use product that we typically, or that we're seeing more and more of in the basin. So I will launch into some screening criteria, and this is, uh, this is kind of a, an interesting area of the framework because this is where we start to diverge just slightly from the TRPA recommendation. So um, although I've talked about the measure and the limit, um, that, that really is the foundation of our, our framework. We do um, recommend a set of screening criteria, which really is uh, projects and a level of development that, that we have built substantial evidence around that allows us to make a finding of less than significant. So these are um, projects that you know, are either small in nature or they um, are intuitive, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through that. But these, these will be projects when they come through um, our process, we would evaluate them against the screening criteria first to determine whether they are you know, um, less than significant. If they are less than significant through that, um, they wouldn't need any further analysis. So this is kind of an important piece of that first decision that we make um, in the CEQA world. Um, so let me just say that this is, uh, on, your on the screen here is really the, the TRBA um, adopted screening criteria. So they are incentivizing housing, deed restricted, affordable, moderate, and achievable. This is housing um, components of their existing code. Um, they're also looking to screen out uh, projects in, again, like I said, low VMT generating areas. So these would be projects like in our town centers or a half mile buffer outside of those town centers. Um, they have a, what we call a small project screen of, um, that allows for up to a, a project which would generate up to 1300 VMT in those areas. For a project outside of those town centers, there's a, there's a lesser allowance for screening, um, a lesser allowance for VMT. So again, trying to promote um, development within those uh, town centers. Um, active transportation, transit, and projects within area plans that have um, been analyzed through the area plan are also part of that screening component under TRPA. And I'll just mention the, the highlighting on this screen. This is, this is an important nuance between um, the way TRPA calculates VMT and the way um, we're required by the state to calculate VMT. And I'll just explain this because it'll make sense on the next slide. So um, VMT is a basic calculation. It's the, the amount of trips that are generated by a project times the distance that those trips travel. So those two components make up our VMT calculation. Um, for, for TRPA purposes, they, um, they include travel in the basin and travel up to the basin boundary. So once that trip leaves the basin boundary, we basically stop counting uh, the mileage associated with that. Um, under CEQA, we are required to count the full length of the trip. So if that project starts in the basin, leaves the basin and goes to Reno or Sacramento, we calculate the full length of that travel. So you'll see the numbers are a little different here, and I just wanted to highlight that that's the reason, um, is because the calculation is just slightly different. Um, the definition of the trip is slightly different. So. All right, so um, this is where, again, where we bring in uh, the Placer County recommendation before you today on screening. It's in general alignment, again, with TRPA. But um, you know, in the, in the wake of some additional research, some technical discussions, um, also a desire to meet some of our specific uh, CEQA goals around 743, we'd like to recommend expansion of the, the TRPA screening criteria, and I'll walk through that. Um, so some key focus areas here, again, we are incentivizing and, and promoting um, housing. Um, we do have a little different definition for the housing. We are looking to screen out below market rate housing as well as workforce housing. And again, this will apply within the basin and areas of Eastern Placer outside the basin. Um, for projects in uh, the low VMT generating areas, um, Again, you'll see, um, you'll see our, our calculation there is a little different from TRPA. We are um, using a calculation of 1425 for our VMT. That's our small project screen. 
And then thirdly, um, OPR does recommend um, or allow for screening of locally serving projects. Um, this is something that your board did adopt for, for Western County. We'd like to apply that for Eastern County as well uh, with a size limitation of 20,000 square feet um, with the exception of up to 40,000 square feet for things like grocery stores or medical uses uh, and government centers. And then lastly, the addition here of seasonal recreation uh, and recreational amenities, recognizing that there's uh, many seasonal recreational opportunities that don't span the course of the year. Um, so there be obvious VMT um, is, is a, a, a lesser than annual um, impact. And so uh, we'd like to um, promote and support screening those, uh, those seasonal part-time uses and then also uh, recreational amenities. These would be things like, um, like a skating rink at a ski resort. So really um, identifying that the, the fact that this amenity isn't necessarily the draw for the, the visitor. Um, those visitors are typically already in the region or even within the, the local area um, and, and, and not a, a large VMT generator themselves. So moving outside the basin, I've talked a, little, a lot about TRPA so far, but just wanted to highlight that the thresholds, um, screening criteria and metrics that we've outlined today do apply outside uh, to the areas of Eastern Placer outside the boundary. Um, I will highlight though that there are a limited number of tools in that area. Um, the, this area of Eastern Placer is covered by the um, Western Placer travel demand model, um, as well as the SACOG model. But the land use that's uh, in that model as a baseline um, is not as robust as we would need it to be to do a project level evaluation. So we, um, we do have some options. And I think the first question that we would ask a project when they came through the door is, do you meet the screening criteria? Uh, if they do, then, then we'd make a finding of less than significant. Um, if not, there are still two um, possible options. One would be uh, a qualitative evaluation there are some data sources through our big data or our cell phone data sources that we can uh, investigate and, and research that, to use for a qualitative evaluation. Um, and then also, um, we do still have a, 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 sorry, that was a quantitative evaluation, a qualitative um, a market rate or some other kind of market study that we can use to support uh, the findings on VMT. All right, so that brings me uh, to mitigation. Uh, you know, as you know, mitigation in, uh, for VMT in the county is challenging. Um, you can see from this slide, sorry, I've got some animation here. Um, you can uh, see from this slide really the most effective VMT um, mitigation strategy that we have is the diversification of land use. And as Crystal opened with, you know, we, um, took on that charge with the Tahoe Basin Area Plan in 2017, really trying to um, promote um, land use and development within those town centers. Um, and so we're, we're kind of talking about careful uh, land use planning at this point, as well as uh, you know, a suite of transportation alternatives that are they're shown here on the screen. And the intent of this screen is really just to kind of prom and, uh, highlight and promote um, you know, a cooperative framework with a, with a project applicant. Um, first and foremost, we would, we would look to them to try to provide uh, mitigation where feasible. And that's, those are the, the um, mitigation um, tools for the, for the project site on the left side of this slide. Um, but again, just, just to highlight that you know, the VMT benefit that we get out of that project specific um, mitigation is, is small. Um, and so we're really, I think, wanting to promote a partnership of regional strategies for reducing the VMT. And that's you know, expanding transit, providing micro transit, providing other, uh, other levers and tools like paid parking where we can really uh, make a, a regional difference on VMT. So that brings me to the schedule here um, with your board's consideration and hopeful support. We, um, the Eastern Plaster frame, Framework would go into effect immediately. And you can see um, next week TRPA's framework um, will have passed its 60-day review period, hopefully. 
and then be implemented on the 28th. Over the next couple of weeks, we will be um, exploring, further exploring some mitigation strategies and, and uh, like I said, building that partnership and, and toolbox, um, looking for additional analysis guidance and staff training. And then I'll close by just saying, you know, this VMT is, is an, uh, a new metric, a new um, threshold, a new standard that we have statewide. Uh, so it's obviously an evolving topic, and so we um, will be keeping our eye on it, monitoring, and bringing any uh, necessary adjustments to your board. And with that, I will ask that you first take action to find uh, the uh, project is exempt or the action is exempt from CEQA, and then uh, secondly, adopt a resolution and establish uh, CEQA, VMT, vehicle miles traveled, thresholds and screening criteria for Eastern Placer, and the associated amendments to our existing transportation study guidelines. With that, I'll see if you have any questions. Thanks, Stephanie. You're welcome. Uh, Suzanne, then Cindy. <coughs> um, on your slide mitigation, mm -hmm. I noticed that on the project site options, it says limit parking supply. Seems a little counterintuitive as to what we're doing up in the Tahoe Basin, isn't it? <laughs> Yes. We're the, trying to improve parking supply. <laughs> so the parking question is, um, is a pretty robust discussion in, in this region right now. Uh, and I think it really boils down to, um, you know, build it and they will come, right? Build, build more parking and, and facilitate the use of that vehicle. So I think, I think the intent here is really kind of to start to, to ask the question that if, if parking is limited, do people use or are they more incentivized to use alternative transportation? Uh, so that's really the, the parking um, discussion. So the, the limit parking requirements does come out of a uh, state resource on greenhouse gas um, reduction. Um, the CAPCOA, I think you probably heard that term. I, so the CAPCOA. Well, yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, the, um, not only up in Tahoe where we're talking about how parking is at a premium, but also places like um, Hidden Falls where we have you know the areas where you can park and and the thing is is the people are going to come anyway and then they're going to go in search of where else they can park you know whether it's down side streets in front of somebody's house in their driveway whatever so i mean it's an it's an idealistic thing but whether it actually accomplishes anything or not that's that's a whole other topic cindy thanks uh, Crystal and Stephanie, I appreciate the presentation. No matter how many times I go through it, I come up with more questions. Sure. So, um, I, I, I don't know if it's just late in the day, but I'll try to figure <laughs> this out. So, our screening criteria is tougher than TRPAs on average daily trips, or more restrictive. So, the small project screen is that? Yeah, the reference? small project screen is down at 110 versus TRPAs at 200. That, that is very true. Uh, good but catch. our VMT <laughs> is higher than their VMT. Yeah, and, I and again. I understand why our VMT needs to be higher, but how does a developer or a project proponent figure out their VMT? <laughs> right? True, yeah. So, so basically a project developer would come in with a, a land use project. Um, that land use project would have a trip generation, right? Um, they could then use this trip generation, that they, the average daily trips for, um, t for TRPA to determine whether they're screened out on our TRPA's threshold. They also can use that trip count um, to evaluate whether they are screened out under CEQA. And those numbers are different. The 110 comes strict, straight from California, um, uh, the technical advisory of OPR. Um, TRPA has chosen a, a larger number. Um, we, we decided to stay consistent with where, uh, where OPR was. Um, now, if you take that 110 and you apply a longer trip length, 110 times the longer trip length, you get to the 1425. Uh, again, it's substantially longer. That yeah. Help you. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I just can find, you know, in the past, for the county's perspective, it's usually been TRPA has been the more restrictive. So we will take heat here when we can't screen our small projects out 
in certain areas because now it's the county's rule that is um, more restrictive than the TRPA's rule. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, we're going by the state standards. TRPA has negotiated something else with the AG and the state of Nevada and come up with a different standard. So I just want to point that out to the board. The other thing um, that... Can, can I just yeah. clarify, though? Yeah. But we're required to meet the state standard, correct? So that's why our yeah, we'll county's requirements would end up being higher is because we're required to adopt the state standard. Yeah, I mean, I'll maybe look to Karen to, to back me up on this. Uh, I, I don't think we're required. Those are recommendations that come out of OPR. Um, isn't, like, isn't it much like um, if you can't put together a project and this particular issue exceeds the acceptable standards and you have to do mitigation that accommodates for that so there's a cost to, um, right yeah. so so which brings me to my next point for the board um, and Crystal and, and Stephanie know I've been talking about this for a while Placer County invests two million dollars of discretionary general fund into our TART system for transit and this year with our micro mass transit and some of our other efforts in bike trails, we far exceed anywhere else in the basin, uh, in the Tahoe Basin, of what we're doing to mitigate traffic. I want to use that to leverage and bank for our projects. I don't think that our projects, each and every one, can do anything. We have to approach this regionally, and this amount of discretionary funding we're investing needs to credit us back something to get our town centers because no matter what, everybody loosened up everything in 2012, we still don't have a town center project on the ground. So we're hopeful and we keep trying and we keep doing more to try to get there. Um, but, and we have some great applicants maybe coming through now, but I still live in a community that's deteriorating. The sidewalks, the curbs, the, I mean, the, the infrastructure's old now. I mean, when we built the sidewalks, we thought we were, you know, <laughs> really going to change downtown and and it did for a little bit now it's gone downhill so um, that's you know I hope that's what we can negotiate and work on is a package of that we're going to continue to invest in transportation solutions with this additional money we're getting from TBID that the businesses are assessing themselves now somehow we buy credits for that and then we're going to have to figure out how we distribute those credits and what's fair um, but it we've got to find a way because otherwise we will get nowhere with with reinvestment and Kings Beach Center is right there from what I understand and zero VMT how do you meet that right um, well, so in some of those areas and then one more point <laughs> Nobody comes to stay in our hotels or eat in our restaurants or go to our bike shops. They come to see Lake Tahoe. And I get so hard, it's so frustrating to me to see how much we try to regulate the businesses when they're there to try to serve the people that are coming. And to your point, they are parking everywhere. This weekend, throughout my neighborhood, I mean, it was, it was like uh, Disneyland, right? And, and it was that way last summer and it will get worse this summer. Um, but I, I look at it and I go, Nevada plates, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it, wherever you go, the parking is a, is a mess. And we don't have adequate parking. We've cut off other parking. Now we've turned a campground into more parking for the boat ramp at, in Lake Forest area. I'll give you that tour, the other, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, and, and I understand the strategy the state has, but unless we invest in some regionalized parking lots that serve our micro mass transit, people can't leave their car in San Francisco and get to Tahoe to, to stay out of their car because there is no inter-regional system. So we're, we're, you know, anyway. So yep. enough of my preaching at 510 on a, a long, long, long day. I had but, no idea it was 510. <laughs> Well, it is, because I've been watching it, because I, I, yeah, anyway. And actually, building on those two comments, I, uh, one, I want to compliment you, too, for the work that you've done on this. Um, Absolutely. And I've been around so long that the, the, the last big uh, new CEQA thing that I lived through was uh, climate change gas emissions. And 
so, so I think two things. One is, as some real examples hit the ground here in Placer County for us, uh, one, look for innovative solutions, which I think you have put a lot of time and thought into in the first place, but it's hard for us to get our head around all of this. You guys have studied it exhaustively, and you've got the educational backgrounds to probably help with all of that. But um, so, so bring forward to us examples and walk us through when these new projects come forward, how your heads got from here to there. And, uh, and, and, so, and then secondly, look for elegant solutions. And the best one that I can think of that relates to greenhouse gas emissions at this time of day after this particular hearing today at, at my age um, is uh, Bickford Ranch project when it came forward for reconsideration um, prior in its first approval iteration it had air quality daily emissions such that there was a range of reasons for that but uh, an analysis by air pollution control district determined that it uh, did not require making findings of overriding consideration because it had electric cars and it planted a bunch of trees and a bunch of innovative different things. And so then the project comes forward again and that was a standard that was in that environmental review and at first it caused quite a brouhaha with air pollution and our planning because they couldn't get that reconciled. But Tom Kristoff was um, uh, director of air pollution at that time and he had done a lot of work with one of his experts out there uh, with regards to uh, forest management and climate change emissions <laughs> that can be achieved as a result of forest treatment and actually was able to put in place in that project a mitigation measure that he was comfortable enough arguing uh, fulfilled the prior CEQA threshold and I think it was removing 75,000 pounds of bone dry tons from local forest and taking that uh, for treatment to a um, air quality facility like uh, Rio Bravo. So thinking out of the box, you know, to, frankly, um, whether or not that was a perfect interpretation of the state law would be probably resolved in litigation, you know, and we do get sued a lot under sequel lawsuits. Uh, but still, I think the point of all of that is to think out of the box, try to find creative solutions for us. Um, the work that Tom had done uh, set a standard in the state and is now actually being used by the state, ARB. So those are the kinds of ways that I think we'll be able to find those win-wins that, uh, on one hand, tell us not to build any more parking lots, while at the same time we're trying to get people up to Lake Tahoe, maximize visitation, maximize the economy of all of that without uh, actually over using our transportation resources and minimizing the negative impacts of all of that. Well, so. I just wish we could charge the VMT to the areas that they're fleeing from yeah. to get to the mountains, <laughs> yeah. right? Because if they were charged with having to deal with that, maybe we'd have real solutions to interregional travel. The problem right? with that is that it makes sense. It's critical oh, thinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but the issue before us today sorry. is... <laughs> sorry we can't solve that today. But, um, but it's but an I interesting, do. I think it's an interesting point um, supervisor to make a connection of an offset I think is kind of where you're headed with the, the GHG discussion right uh, and what supervisor Gustafson brought up about taking credit um, mm -hmm. you know what we put on the ground for the, the regional solutions to transportation that our VMT reduction um, capable uh, you know it, it's essentially an offset or a credit program so um, so definitely looking into into that in more detail and at the end of the day VMT still makes my head spin <laughs> And we know what we're trying to accomplish. We know what the good policy is, particularly here in Placer County and for the environment. We get all that. Um, sometimes, frankly, the state doesn't make it very easy for us. So, uh, But with creativity and some really good thinking and some out-of-the-box work, I think we can have some win-wins and, and maybe set a standard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're being asked to adopt a resolution. <laughs> and to uh, find the action exempt under CEQA guidelines. So. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll make the motion to, uh, that we find the establishment of thresholds and screening criteria for East Class are exempt under CEQA guidelines. All those, those sections as so written <laughs> and adopt a resolution to establish CEQA vehicle miles. I'll, I'll oh. Sorry, um, motion, Gustafson. Can I second. do them both in one action? 
Okay. Uh, Jones, and we will ask if there's anybody from the public that would like to address this item. And there is none. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being the end of the day. You're welcome. <laughs> Mind boggling us. The latest time item I've ever discussed earlier because <laughs> there's no way if I had not been briefed. <laughs> and with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>